The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Recording by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 75 A Signed Statement. Noirtier was prepared to receive them, dressed in black and installed in his armchair. When the three persons he expected had entered, he looked at the door, which his valet immediately closed. "'Listen,' whispered Villefort to Valentine, who could not conceal her joy. "'If Monsieur Noirtier wishes to communicate anything which would delay your marriage, I forbid you to understand him.' Valentine blushed but did not answer. Villefort approaching Noirtier. "'Here is Monsieur Franz Depinay,' said he. "'You requested to see him. We have all wished for this interview, and I trust it will convince you how ill-formed are your objections to Valentine's marriage.' Noirtier answered only by a look which made Villefort's blood run cold. He motioned to Valentine to approach. In a moment, Thanks to her habit of conversing with her grandfather, she understood that he asked for a key. Then his eye was fixed on the drawer of a small chest between the windows. She opened the drawer and found a key, and, understanding that was what he wanted, again watched his eyes, which turned toward an old secretary which had been neglected for many years, and was supposed to contain nothing but useless documents. "'Shall I open the secretary?' asked Valentine. "'Yes,' said the old man. "'And the drawers?' "'Yes.' "'Those at the side?' "'No.' "'The middle one?' "'Yes.' Valentine opened it and drew out a bundle of papers. "'Is that what you wish for?' asked she. "'No.' She took successively all the other papers out till the drawer was empty. "'But there are no more,' said she. Noirtier's eye was fixed on the dictionary. "'Yes, I understand, grandfather,' said the young girl. He pointed to each letter of the alphabet. At the letter S the old man stopped her. She opened and found the word secret. "'Ah, is there a secret spring?' said Valentine. Yes, said Noirtier. And who knows it? Noirtier looked at the door where the servant had gone out. Barois, said she. Yes. Shall I call him? Yes. Valentine went to the door and called Barois. Villefort's impatience during this scene made the perspiration roll from his forehead, and Franz was stupefied. The old servant came. Bawa, said Valentine, my grandfather has told me to open that drawer in the secretary, but there is a secret spring in it, which you know. Will you open it? Bawa looked at the old man. Obey, said Noitier's intelligent eye. Bawa touched a spring. The false bottom came out, and they saw a bundle of papers tied with a black string. "'Is that what you wish for?' said Barois. "'Yes.' "'Shall I give these papers to Monsieur de Villefort?' "'No.' "'To Mademoiselle Valentine?' "'No.' "'To Monsieur Franz Depinay?' "'Yes.' Franz, astonished, advanced a step. "'To me, sir?' he said. "'Yes.' Franz took them from Barois, and casting a glance at the cover, read, "'To be given, after my death, to General Durand, who shall bequeath the packet to his son, with an injunction to preserve it as containing an important document.' "'Well, sir,' asked Franz, "'what do you wish me to do with this paper?' "'To preserve it and seal it up as it is, doubtless,' said the procureur. "'No,' replied Noitier eagerly. 
"'Do you wish him to read it?' said Valentine. "'Yes,' replied the old man. "'You understand, Baron, my grandfather wishes you to read this paper,' said Valentine. "'Then let us sit down,' said Villefort impatiently, "'for it will take some time.' "'Sit down,' said the old man. Villefort took a chair, but Valentine remained standing by her father's side, and frowns before him, holding the mysterious paper in his hand. "'Read,' said the old man. Franz untied it, and in the midst of the most profound silence, read, "'Extract from the report of a meeting of the Bonapartist Club in the Rue Saint-Jacques, held February 5th, 1815.' Franz stopped. "'February 5th, 1815,' said he. "'It is the day my father was murdered.' Valentine and Villefort were dumb. The eyes of the old man alone seemed to say clearly, "'Go on.' "'But it was on leaving this club,' said he. "'My father disappeared.' Noitier's eye continued to say, "'Read.' He resumed. The undersigned, Louis-Jacques Beaurepaire, lieutenant-colonel of artillery, Etienne du Champy, general of brigade, and Claude La Chapal, keeper of woods and forests, declare that on the 4th of February a letter arrived from the island of Elba, recommending to the kindness and the confidence of the Bonapartist Club, General Flavian de Quenel, who, having served the Emperor from 1804 to 1814, was supposed to be devoted to the interests of the Napoleon dynasty, notwithstanding the title of baron which Louis the Eighteenth had just granted to him with his estate of Epinay. A note was in consequence addressed to General de Quenel, begging him to be present at the meeting next day, the fifth. The note indicated neither the street nor the number of the house where the meeting was to be held. It bore no signature but it announced to the general that someone would call for him if he would be ready at nine o'clock. The meetings were always held from that time till midnight. At nine o'clock the president of the club presented himself. The general was ready. The president informed him that one of the conditions of his introduction was that he should be eternally ignorant of the place of the meeting, and that he would allow his eyes to be bandaged swearing that he would not endeavor to take off the bandage. General de Quinel accepted the condition, and promised on his honor not to seek to discover the road they took. The general's carriage was ready, but the president told him it was impossible for him to use it, since it was useless to blindfold the master if the coachman knew through what streets he went. "'What must be done, then?' asked the general. I have my carriage here, said the President. Have you, then, so much confidence in your servant that you can entrust him with a secret you will not allow me to know? Our coachman is a member of the club, said the President. We shall be driven by a state councillor. Then we run another risk, said the General, laughing, that of being upset. We insert this joke to prove that the general was not in the least compelled to attend the meeting, but that he came willingly. When they were seated in the carriage, the president reminded the general of his promise to allow his eyes to be bandaged, to which he made no opposition. On the road, the president thought he saw the general make an attempt to remove the handkerchief, and reminded him of his oath. "'Sure enough,' said the general." The carriage stopped at an alley leading out of the Rue Saint-Jacques. The general alighted, leaning on the arm of the president, of whose dignity he was not aware, considering him simply as a member of the club. They went through the alley, mounted a flight of stairs, and entered the assembly room. The deliberations had already begun. The members, apprised of the sort of presentation which was to be made that evening, were all in attendance. When in the middle of the room, the general was invited to remove his bandage. He did so immediately, and was surprised to see so many well-known faces in a society of whose existence he had till then been ignorant. They questioned him as to his sentiments, 
but he contented himself with answering that the letters from the island of Elba ought to have informed them. Franz interrupted himself by saying, "'My father was a royalist. They need not have asked his sentiments, which were well known.' "'And hence,' said Villefort, "'arose my affection for your father, my dear Monsieur Franz. Opinions held in common are a ready bond of union.' "'Read again,' said the old man. Franz continued. The President then sought to make him speak more explicitly but M. de Quesnel replied that he wished first to know what they wanted with him. He was then informed of the contents of the letter from the island of Elba, in which he was recommended to the club as a man who would be likely to advance the interests of their party. One paragraph spoke of the return of Bonaparte, and promised another letter and further details on the arrival of the pharaoh belonging to the shipbuilder Morel of Marseilles, whose captain was entirely devoted to the emperor. During all this time, the general, on whom they thought to have relied as on a brother, manifested evidently signs of discontent and repugnance. When the reading was finished, he remained silent, with knitted brows. "'Well,' asked the president, "'what do you say to this letter, general?' "'I say that it is too soon after declaring myself for Louis the Eighteenth to break my vow in behalf of the ex-emperor. This answer was too clear to permit of any mistake as to his sentiments. General, said the President, we acknowledge no King Louis the Eighteenth, or an ex-emperor, but His Majesty, the Emperor and King, driven from France, which is his kingdom, by violence and treason. Excuse me, gentlemen, said the General, you may not acknowledge Louis the Eighteenth, but I do, as he has made me a baron and a field marshal, and I shall never forget that for these two titles I am indebted to his happy return to France. Sir, said the President, rising with gravity, be careful what you say. Your words clearly show us that they are deceived concerning you in the island of Elba, and have deceived us. The communication has been made to you in consequence of the confidence placed in you, and which does you honor. Now we discover our error. A title and promotion attach you to the government we wish to overturn. We will not constrain you to help us. We enroll no one against his conscience. But we will compel you to act generously, even if you are not disposed to do so. You would call acting generously knowing your conspiracy and not informing against you. That is what I should call becoming your accomplice. You see, I am more candid than you." "'Ah, my father,' said Franz, interrupting himself, "'I understand now why they murdered him.' Valentine could not help casting one glance towards the young man, whose filial enthusiasm it was delightful to behold. Villefort walked to and fro behind them. Noirtier watched the expression of each one, and preserved his dignified and commanding attitude. Franz returned to the manuscript, and continued. "'Sir,' said the President, "'you have been invited to join this assembly. You were not forced here. It was proposed to you to come blindfolded. You accepted. When you complied with this twofold request, you well knew we did not wish to secure the throne of Louis the Eighteenth, or we should not take so much care to avoid the vigilance of the police. It would be conceding too much to allow you to put on a mask to aid you in the discovery of our secret, and then to remove it that you may ruin those who have confided in you. No, no, you must first say if you declare yourself for the king of a day who now reigns, or for His Majesty the Emperor. "'I am a royalist,' replied the general. "'I have taken the oath of allegiance to Louis the Eighteenth, and I will adhere to it.' These words were followed by a general murmur, and it was evident that several of the members were discussing the propriety of making the general repent of his rashness. The President again arose, and having imposed silence, said, 
Sir, you are too serious and too sensible a man not to understand the consequences of our present situation, and your candor has already dictated to us the conditions which remain for us to offer you. The general, putting his hand on his sword, exclaimed, If you talk of honor, do not begin by disavowing its laws, and impose nothing by violence. And you, sir continued the President, with a calmness still more terrible than the General's anger. "'I advise you not to touch your sword.' The General looked around him with a slight uneasiness. However, he did not yield. But, calling up all his fortitude, said, "'I will not swear.' "'Then you must die,' replied the President calmly. Monsieur Depinay became very pale. He looked round him a second time. Several members of the club were whispering, and getting their arms from under their cloaks. "'General,' said the President, "'do not alarm yourself. You are among men of honour, who will use every means to convince you before resorting to the last extremity. But, as you have said, you are among conspirators. You are in possession of our secret, and you must restore it to us.' A significant silence followed these words, and, as the general did not reply, "'Close the doors,' said the President to the doorkeeper. The same deadly silence succeeded these words. Then the general advanced, making a violent effort to control his feelings. "'I have a son,' he said, "'and I ought to think of him finding myself among assassins.' "'General,' said the chief of the assembly. One man may insult fifty. It is the privilege of weakness. But he does wrong to use his privilege. Follow my advice. Swear and do not insult. The general, again daunted by the superiority of the chief, hesitated a moment, then advancing to the president's desk. What is the form? said he. It is this. I swear by my honor not to reveal to any one what I have seen and heard on the 5th of February, 1815, between nine and ten o'clock in the evening, and I plead guilty of death should I ever violate this oath. The general appeared to be affected by a nervous tremor, which prevented his answering for some moments. Then, overcoming his manifest repugnance, he pronounced the required oath but in so low a tone as to be scarcely audible to the majority of the members, who insisted on his repeating it clearly and distinctly, which he did. "'Now am I at liberty to retire?' said the general. The president rose, appointed three members to accompany him, and got into the carriage with the general after bandaging his eyes. One of these three members was the coachman who had driven them there. The other members silently dispersed. "'Now am I at liberty to retire?' said the general. The President rose, appointed three members to accompany him, and got into the carriage with the general after bandaging his eyes. One of those three members was the coachman who had driven them there. The other members silently dispersed. "'Where do you wish to be taken?' asked the President. "'Anywhere out of your presence,' replied Monsieur Depinay. "'Beware, sir,' replied the President. "'You are no longer in the assembly, and have only to do with individuals. Do not insult them unless you wish to be held responsible.' But instead of listening, Monsieur Depinay went on. "'You are still as brave in your carriage as in your assembly, because you are still four against one.' The President stopped the coach. They were at that part of the Quai d'Orme where the steps led down to the river. "'Why do you stop here?' asked Depinay. "'Because, sir,' said the President, "'you have insulted a man, and that man will not go one step farther without demanding honourable reparation.' "'Another method of assassination,' said the General, shrugging his shoulders. "'Make no noise, sir.' unless you wish me to consider you as one of the men of whom you spoke just now as cowards, who take their weakness for a shield. You are alone. One alone shall answer you. 
You have a sword by your side. I have one in my cane. You have no witness. One of these gentlemen will serve you. Now, if you please, remove your bandage." The general tore the handkerchief from his eyes. "'At last,' said he, "'I shall know with whom I have to do.' They opened the door and the four men alighted. Franz again interrupted himself and wiped the cold drops from his brow. There was something awful in hearing the son read aloud in trembling pallor these details of his father's death which had hitherto been a mystery. Valentine clasped her hands as if in prayer. Noatier looked at Villefort with an almost sublime expression of contempt and pride. Franz continued. It was, as we said, the 5th of February. For three days the mercury had been five or six degrees below freezing, and the steps were covered with ice. The general was stout and tall. The President offered him the side of the railing to assist him in getting down. The two witnesses followed. It was a dark night. The ground from the steps to the river was covered with snow and hoar-frost. The water of the river looked black and deep. One of the seconds went for a lantern in a coal-barge near, and by its light they examined the weapons. The President's sword, which was simply, as he had said, one he carried in his cane, was five inches shorter than the general's, and had no guard. The general proposed to cast lots for the swords, but the President said it was he who had given the provocation, and when he had given it, he had supposed each would use his own arms. The witnesses endeavored to insist, but the President bade them be silent. The lantern was placed on the ground, the two adversaries took their stations, and the duel began. The light made the two swords appear like flashes of lightning. As for the men, they were scarcely perceptible, the darkness was so great. General Depenay passed for one of the best swordsmen in the army, but he was pressed so closely in the onset that he missed his aim and fell. The witnesses thought he was dead but his adversary, who knew he had not struck him, offered him the assistance of his hand to rise. The circumstance irritated, instead of calming the general, and he rushed on his adversary. But his opponent did not allow his guard to be broken. He received him on his sword, and three times the general drew back on finding himself too closely engaged, and then returned to the charge. At the third he fell again. They thought he slipped, as at first, and the witnesses, seeing he did not move, approached and endeavored to raise him, but the one who passed his arm around the body found it was moistened with blood. The general, who had almost fainted, revived. Ah, said he, they have sent me some fencing-master to fight with me. The president, without answering, approached the witnesses who held the lantern and, raising his sleeve, showed him two wounds he had received in his arm. Then, opening his coat, and unbuttoning his waistcoat, displayed his side, pierced with a third wound. Still he had not even uttered a sigh. General Depenay died five minutes after. Franz read these last words in a voice so choked that they were hardly audible, and then stopped passing his hand over his eyes as if to dispel a cloud. But after a moment's silence he continued. The President went up the steps, after pushing his sword into his cane. A track of blood on the snow marked his course. He had scarcely arrived at the top when he heard a heavy splash in the water. It was the General's body, which the witnesses had just thrown into the river after ascertaining that he was dead. The general fell, then, in a loyal duel, and not in ambush, as might have been reported. In proof of this, we have signed this paper to establish the truth of the facts, lest the moment should arrive when either of the actors in this terrible scene should be accused of premeditated murder or of infringement of the laws of honor. Signed, Beaurepaire, Deschamps, and Le Charpal. When Franz had finished reading this account, so dreadful for a son, 
when Valentine, pale with emotion, had wiped away a tear, when Villefort, trembling and crouching in a corner, had endeavoured to lessen the storm by supplicating glances at the implacable old man. "'Sir,' said Depanay to Noitier, "'since you are well acquainted with all these details, which are attested by honourable signatures, since you appear to take some interest in me, although you have only manifested it hitherto by causing me sorrow, refuse me not one final satisfaction. Tell me the name of the president of the club, that I may at least know who killed my father." Villefort mechanically felt for the handle of the door. Valentine, who understood sooner than any one her grandfather's answer, and who had often seen two scars upon his right arm, drew back a few steps. Mademoiselle, said Franz, turning towards Valentine, unite your efforts with mine to find out the name of the man who made me an orphan at two years of age. Valentine remained dumb and motionless. Hold, sir, said Villefort, do not prolong this dreadful scene. The names have been purposely concealed. My father himself does not know who this president was, and if he knows, he cannot tell you. Proper names are not in the dictionary. Oh, misery! cried Franz. The only hope which sustained me and enabled me to read to the end was that knowing at least the name of him who killed my father. Sir, sir, cried he, turning to Noitier, do what you can, make me understand in some way. Yes, replied Noitier. Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, cried Franz. Your grandfather says he can indicate the person. Help me. Lend me your assistance." Noitier looked at the dictionary. Franz took it with a nervous trembling, and repeated the letters of the alphabet successively until he came to M. At that letter the old man signified, Yes. M, repeated Franz. The young man's finger glided over the words, but at each one Noitier answered by a negative sign. Valentine hid her head between her hands. At length Franz arrived at the word, Myself. Yes. You! cried Franz, whose hair stood on end. You! Monsieur Noitier, you killed my father? Yes, replied Noitier, fixing a majestic look on the young man. Franz fell powerless on a chair. Villefort opened the door and escaped, for the idea had entered his mind to stifle the little remaining life in the heart of this terrible old man. End of chapter 75「Chapter 76 of The Count of Monte Cristo » Read by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 76 Progress of Cavalcanti the Younger. Meanwhile, Monsieur Cavalcanti, the elder, had returned to his service. Not in the army of His Majesty, the Emperor of Austria, but at the gaming-table of the Baths of Lucca, of which he was one of the most assiduous courtiers. He had spent every farthing that had been allowed for his journey, as a reward for the majestic and solemn manner in which he had maintained his assumed character of father. Monsieur Andrea, at his departure, inherited all the papers which proved that he had indeed the honour of being the son of the Marquis Bartolomeo and the Marchioness Oliva Corsinari. He was now fairly launched in that Parisian society, which gives such ready access to foreigners, and treats them, not as they really are, but as they wish to be considered. Besides, what is required of a young man in Paris? to speak its language tolerably, to make a good appearance, to be a good gamester, and to pay in cash. 
they are certainly less particular with a foreigner than with a Frenchman. Andrea had, then, in a fortnight, attained a very fair position. He was called Count, he was said to possess fifty thousand lira per annum, and his father's immense riches, buried in the quarries of Saravezza, were a constant theme. A learned man, before whom the last circumstance was mentioned as a fact, declared he had seen the quarries in question, which gave great weight to assertions hitherto somewhat doubtful, but which now assumed the garb of reality. Such was the state of society in Paris at the period we bring before our readers, when Monte Cristo went one evening to pay Monsieur Danglars a visit. Monsieur Danglars was out, but the Count was asked to go and see the Baroness, and he accepted the invitation. It was never without a nervous shudder, since the dinner at Autuy and the events which followed it, that Madame Danglars heard Monte Cristo's name announced. If he had not come, the painful sensation became most intense. If, on the contrary, he appeared, his noble countenance, his brilliant eyes, his amiability, his polite attention even towards Madame Danglars, soon dispelled every impression of fear. It appeared impossible to the Baroness that a man of such delightfully pleasing manners should entertain evil designs against her. Besides, the most corrupt minds only suspect evil when it would answer some interested end. Useless injury is repugnant to every mind. When Monte Cristo entered the boudoir, to which we have already once introduced our readers, and where the Baroness was examining some drawings, which her daughter passed to her after having looked at them with Monsieur Cavalcanti, his presence soon produced its usual effect and it was with smiles that the baroness received the count, although she had been a little disconcerted at the announcement of his name. The latter took in the whole scene at a glance. The baroness was partially reclining on a sofa. Eugenie sat near her, and Cavalcanti was standing. Cavalcanti, dressed in black, like one of Goethe's heroes, with varnished shoes and white, silk open-worked stockings, passed a white and tolerably nice-looking hand through his light hair, and so displayed a sparkling diamond, that in spite of Monte Cristo's advice, the vain young man had been unable to resist putting on his little finger. This movement was accompanied by killing glances at Mademoiselle Danglars, and by sighs launched in that same direction. Mademoiselle Danglars was still the same, cold, beautiful, and satirical. Not one of these glances, nor one sigh, was lost on her. They might have been said to fall on the shield of Minerva, which some philosophers assert protected sometimes the breast of Sappho. Eugenie bowed coldly to the Count, and availed herself of the first moment when the conversation became earnest to escape to her study whence, very soon, two cheerful and noisy voices being heard, in connection with occasional notes of the piano, assured Monte Cristo that Mademoiselle Danglars preferred to his society, and to that of Monsieur Cavalcanti, the company of Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly, her singing-teacher. It was then, especially while conversing with Madame Danglars, and apparently absorbed by the charm of the conversation, that the Count noticed M. Andrea Cavalcanti's solicitude, his manner of listening to the music at the door he dared not pass, and of manifesting his admiration. The banker soon returned. His first look was certainly directed towards Monte Cristo, but the second was for Andrea. As for his wife, he bowed to her, as some husbands do to their wives, but in a way that bachelors will never comprehend, until a very extensive code is published on conjugal life. "'Have not the ladies invited you to join them at the piano?' said Danglars to Andrea. "'Alas, no, sir,' replied Andrea, with a sigh still more remarkable than the former ones. Danglars immediately advanced towards the door and opened it. The two ladies were seen seated on the same chair at the piano, 
accompanying themselves, each with one hand, a fancy to which they had accustomed themselves and performed admirably. Mademoiselle d'Armely, whom they then perceived through the open doorway, formed with Eugenie one of the tableaux vivants of which the Germans are so fond. She was somewhat beautiful and exquisitely formed, a little fairy-like figure with large curls falling down her neck, which was rather too long, as Perugino sometimes makes his virgins, and her eyes dull from fatigue. She was said to have a weak chest, and, like Antonia in the Cremona Violin, she would die one day while singing. Monte Cristo cast one rapid and curious glance round this sanctum. It was the first time he had ever seen Mademoiselle d'Armilly, of whom he had heard much. "'Well,' said the banker to his daughter, "'are we then all to be excluded?' He then led the young man into the study, and either by chance or maneuver the door was partially closed after Andrea, so that from the place where they sat neither the Count nor the Baroness could see anything. But as the banker had accompanied Andrea, Madame Danglars appeared to take no notice of it. The Count soon heard Andrea's voice, singing a Corsican song accompanied by the piano. While the Count smiled at hearing this song, which made him lose sight of Andrea in the recollection of Benedetto, Madame Danglars was boasting to Monte Cristo of her husband's strength of mind, who, that very morning, had lost three or four hundred thousand francs by a failure at Milan. The praise was well deserved, for had not the Count heard it from the Baroness, or by one of those means by which he knew everything, the baron's countenance would have not led him to suspect it. Hmm, thought Monte Cristo. He begins to conceal his losses a month since he boasted of them. Then aloud, Oh, madame, Monsieur Danglars is so skilful, he will soon regain at the bourse what he loses elsewhere. I see that you participate in a prevalent error, said Madame Danglars. "'What is it?' said Monte Cristo. "'That Monsieur Danglars speculates, whereas he never does.' "'Truly, madame, I recollect Monsieur de Bray told me. Apropos, what has become of him? I have seen nothing of him the last three or four days.' "'Nor I,' said Madame Danglars. "'But you began a sentence, sir, and did not finish.' "'Which?' Monsieur de Bray had told you. Ah, yes, he told me it was you who sacrificed to the demon of speculation. I was once very fond of it, but I do not indulge now. Then you are wrong, madame. Fortune is precarious, and if I were a woman and fate had made me a banker's wife, Whatever might be my confidence in my husband's good fortune, still in speculation, you know, there is a great risk. Well, I would secure for myself a fortune independent of him, even if I acquired it by placing my interests in hands unknown to him. Madame Danglars blushed, in spite of all her efforts. Stay, said Monte Cristo, as though he had not observed her confusion. I have heard of a lucky hit that was made yesterday on the Neapolitan bonds. I have none, nor have I ever possessed any. But really, we have talked long enough of money, Count. We are like two stockbrokers. Have you heard how fate is persecuting the poor Villeforts? What has happened? said the Count, simulating total ignorance. You know, the Marquis of saint Meran died a few days after he had set out on his journey to Paris, and the Marchioness a few days after her arrival. Yes, said Monte Cristo, I have heard that. But, as Claudius said to Hamlet, it is the law of nature. Their fathers died before them, and they mourn their loss. They will die before their children, who will in turn grieve for them. But that is not all. Not all? No, they were going to marry their daughter. 
to Monsieur Franz Depinay. Is it broken off? Yesterday morning, it appears. Franz declined the honor. Indeed! And is the reason known? No. How extraordinary! And how does Monsieur de Villefort bear it? As usual, like a philosopher. Danglars returned at this moment alone. Well, said the baroness, do you leave Monsieur Cavalcanti with your daughter? And Mademoiselle d'Armilly, said the banker, do you consider her no one? Then, turning to Monte Cristo, he said, Prince Cavalcanti is a charming young man, is he not? But is he really a prince? I will not answer for it, said Monte Cristo. His father was introduced to me as a marquis, so he ought to be a count, but I do not think he has much claim to that title. Why, said the banker, if he is a prince, he is wrong not to maintain his rank. I do not like any one to deny his origin. Oh, you are a thorough democrat, said Monte Cristo, smiling. But do you see to what you are exposing yourself? said the baroness. If perchance Monsieur de Morcerf came, he would find Monsieur Cavalcanti in that room, where he, the betrothed of Eugenie, has never been admitted. You may well say, perchance, replied the banker, for he comes so seldom, it would seem only chance that brings him. But should he come and find that young man with your daughter, he might be displeased. He, you are mistaken. Monsieur Albert would not do us the honor to be jealous. He does not like Eugenie sufficiently. Besides, I care not for his displeasure. Still, situated as we are, Yes, do you know how we are situated? At his mother's ball he danced once with Eugenie and Monsieur Cavalcanti three times, and he took no notice of it. The valet announced Vicomte Albert de Morcerf. The baroness rose hastily and was going into the study when Danglars stopped her. Let her alone, said he. She looked at him in amazement. Monte Cristo appeared to be unconscious of what passed. Albert entered, looking very handsome and in high spirits. He bowed politely to the baroness, familiarly to Danglars, and affectionately to Monte Cristo. Then, turning to the baroness, "'May I ask how Mademoiselle Danglars is?' said he. "'She is quite well,' replied Danglars quickly. She is at the piano with Monsieur Cavalcanti. Albert retained his calm and indifferent manner. He might feel perhaps annoyed, but he knew Monte Cristo's eye was on him. Monsieur Cavalcanti has a fine tenor voice, said he, and Mademoiselle Eugenie a splendid soprano. And then she plays the piano like Thalberg. The concert must be a delightful one. They suit each other remarkably well, said Danglars. Albert appeared not to notice this remark, which was, however, so rude that Madame Danglars blushed. I, too, said the young man, am a musician. At least my masters used to tell me so. But it is strange that my voice never would suit any other, and a soprano less than any. Danglars smiled and seemed to say, it is of no consequence. Then, hoping doubtless to effect his purpose, he said, The prince and my daughter were universally admired yesterday. You were not of the party, Monsieur de Morcerf. What prince? asked Albert. Prince Cavalcanti, said Danglars, who persisted in giving the young man that title. Pardon me, said Albert, I was not aware that he was a prince. And Prince Cavalcanti sang with Mademoiselle Eugenie yesterday. It must have been charming indeed. I regret not having heard them. But I was unable to accept your invitation, having promised to accompany my mother to a German concert given by the Baroness of Chateau Renaud. 
This was followed by rather an awkward silence. "'May I also be allowed,' said Morcerf, "'to pay my respects to Mademoiselle Danglars?' "'Wait a moment,' said the banker, stopping the young man. "'Do you hear that delightful cavatina? Ta-ta-ta, ti-ta-ti-ta-ti-ta, it is charming. Let them finish. One moment. Bravo, bravi, brava! The banker was enthusiastic in his applause. Indeed, said Albert, it is exquisite. It is impossible to understand the music of his country better than Prince Cavalcanti does. You said Prince, did you not? But he can easily become one, if he is not one already. It is no uncommon thing in Italy. But to return to the charming musicians, you should give us a treat, Danglar. Without telling them there is a stranger, ask them to sing one more song. It is so delightful to hear music in the distance, when the musicians are unrestrained by observation." Danglars was quite annoyed by the young man's indifference. He took Monte Cristo aside. "'What do you think of our lover?' said he. "'He appears cool. But then your word is given.' "'Yes. Doubtless I have promised to give my daughter to a man who loves her, but not to one who does not. See him there, cold as marble, and proud like his father. If he were rich, if he had Cavalcanti's fortune, that might be pardoned. Ma foi, I haven't consulted my daughter, but if she has good taste. Oh, said Monte Cristo, my fondness may blind me, but I assure you I consider Morcerf a charming young man who will render your daughter happy, and will sooner or later attain a certain amount of distinction, and his father's position is good." Hmm, said Danglars. Why do you doubt? The past, that obscurity on the past. But that does not affect the sun. Very true. Now I beg of you, don't go off your head. It's a month now that you have been thinking of this marriage, and you must see that it throws some responsibility on me, for it was at my house you met this young Cavalcanti, whom I do not really know at all. But I do. Have you made inquiry? Is there any need of that? Does not his appearance speak for him? And he is very rich. I am not so sure of that. And yet you said he had money. Fifty thousand lira, a mere trifle. He is well educated. Hmm, said Monte Cristo in his turn. He is a musician. So are all Italians. Come, Count, you do not do that young man justice. Well, I acknowledge it annoys me, knowing your connection with the Morcerf family, to see him throw himself in the way. Danglars burst out laughing. "'What a Puritan you are!' said he. "'That happens every day. "'But you cannot break it off in this way. "'The more serfs are depending on this union.' "'Indeed.' "'Positively. "'Then let them explain themselves. "'You should give the father a hint. "'You are so intimate with the family.' "'I? "'Where the devil did you find out that?' At their ball it was apparent enough. Why, did not the Countess, the proud Mercedes, the disdainful Catalan, who will scarcely open her lips to her oldest acquaintances, take your arm, lead you into the garden, into the private walks, and remain there for half an hour? "'Ah, Baron, Baron,' said Albert, "'you are not listening. What barbarism in a megalomaniac like you!' "'Oh, don't worry about me, Sir Mocker,' said Danglars. Then, turning to the Count, he said, "'But will you undertake to speak to the father?' "'Willingly, if you wish it.' "'But let it be done explicitly and positively. If he demands my daughter, let him fix the day. Declare his conditions. In short, let us either understand each other or quarrel. You understand. No more delay.' "'Yes, sir, I will give my attention to the subject.' 
I do not say that I await with pleasure his decision, but I do await it. A banker must, you know, be a slave to his promise." And Danglar sighed, as M. Cavalcanti had done half an hour before. "'Bravi! Bravo! Brava!' cried Morcerf, parodying the banker as the selection came to an end. Danglar began to look suspiciously at Morcerf when someone came and whispered a few words to him. "'I shall return,' said the banker to Monte Cristo. "'Wait for me. I shall perhaps have something to say to you.' And he went out. The baroness took advantage of her husband's absence to push open the door of her daughter's study, and Monsieur Andrea, who was sitting before the piano with Mademoiselle Eugenie, started up like a jack-in-the-box. Albert bowed with a smile to Mademoiselle Danglars, who did not appear in the least disturbed, and returned his bow with her usual coolness. Cavalcanti was evidently embarrassed. He bowed to Morcerf, who replied with the most impertinent look possible. Then Albert launched out in praise of Mademoiselle Danglars's voice, and, on his regret, after what he had just heard, that he had been unable to be present the previous evening. Cavalcanti, being left alone, turned to Monte Cristo. Come, said Madame Danglars, leave music and compliments. Let us go and take tea. Come, Louise, said Mademoiselle Danglars to her friend. They passed into the next drawing-room, where tea was prepared. Just as they were beginning, in the English fashion, to leave the spoons in their cups, the door again opened, and Danglars entered, visibly agitated. Monte Cristo observed it particularly, and by a look asked the banker for an explanation. "'I have just received my courier from Greece,' said Danglars. "'And yes,' said the Count, "'that was the reason of your running away from us?' "'Yes.' "'How is King Otho getting on?' asked Elbert in the most sprightly tone. Danglars cast another suspicious look towards him without answering and Monte Cristo turned away to conceal the expression of pity which passed over his features, but which was gone in a moment. "'We shall go together, shall we not?' said Albert to the Count. "'If you like,' replied the latter. Albert could not understand the banker's look, and turning to Monte Cristo, who understood it perfectly, "'Did you see,' said he, "'how he looked at me?' "'Yes,' said the Count. "'But did you think there was anything particular in his look?' "'Indeed I did. And what does he mean by his news from Greece?' "'How can I tell you? Because I imagine you have correspondents in that country.' Monte Cristo smiled significantly. "'Stop,' said Albert. "'Here he comes. I shall compliment Mademoiselle Danglars on her cameo, while the father talks to you.' "'If you compliment her at all, let it be on her voice, at least,' said Monte Cristo. "'No, every one would do that.' "'My dear Viscount, you are dreadfully impertinent.' Albert advanced towards Eugenie, smiling. Meanwhile, Danglars, stooping to Monte Cristo's ear, "'Your advice was excellent,' said he. There is a whole history connected with the names Fernand and Yanina. Indeed, said Monte Cristo. Yes, I will tell you all, but take away the young man. I cannot endure his presence. He is going with me. Shall I send the father to you? Immediately. Very well. The Count made a sign to Albert, and they bowed to the ladies and took their leave. Albert perfectly indifferent to Mademoiselle Danglars's contempt, Monte Cristo reiterating his advice to Madame Danglars on the prudence a banker's wife should exercise in providing for the future. Monsieur Cavalcanti remained master of the field. End of chapter 76《Of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Recording by Mark Nelson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. 
The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 77 Haiti. Scarcely had the Count's horses cleared the angle of the boulevard than Albert, turning towards the Count, burst into a loud fit of laughter. Much too loud, in fact, not to give the idea of its being rather forced and unnatural. Well, said he, I will ask you the same question which Charles the Ninth put to Catherine de Medici after the massacre of St. Bartholomew. How have I played my little part? To what do you allude? asked Monte Cristo. To the installation of my rival at Monsieur Danglars. What rival? Ma foi, what rival? Why, your protege, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti. Ah, uh, no joking, Viscount, if you please. I do not patronize Monsieur Andrea, at least not as concerns Monsieur Danglars. And you would be to blame for not assisting him, if the young man really needed your help in that quarter, but, happily for me, he can dispense with it. What? Do you think he is paying his addresses? I am certain of it. His languishing looks and modulated tones when addressing Mademoiselle Danglars fully proclaim his intentions. He aspires to the hand of the proud Eugenie. What does that signify, so long as they favor your suit? But it is not the case, my dear Count. On the contrary, I am repulsed on all sides. What? It is so, indeed. Mademoiselle Eugenie scarcely answers me, and Mademoiselle de Armely, her confidant, does not speak to me at all. But the father has the greatest regard possible for you, said Monte Cristo. He? Oh, no! He has plunged a thousand daggers into my heart, tragedy weapons, I own, which, instead of wounding, sheath their points in their own handles, but daggers which he nevertheless believed to be real and deadly. Jealousy indicates affection. True, but I am not jealous. He is. Of whom? Of Debray? No, of you. Of me? I will engage to say that before a week is past, the door will be closed against me. You are mistaken, my dear Viscount. Prove it to me. Do you wish me to do so? Yes. Well, I am charged with the commission of endeavouring to induce the Comte de Morcerf to make some definite arrangement with the Baron. By whom are you charged? By the Baron himself. Oh, said Albert, with all the cajolery of which he was capable, you surely will not do that, my dear Count. Certainly I shall, Albert, as I have promised to do it. Well, said Albert with a sigh, it seems you are determined to marry me. I am determined to try and be on good terms with everybody, at all events, said Monte Cristo. But, apropos of Debray, how is it that I have not seen him lately at the Baron's house? There has been some misunderstanding. What, with the baroness? No, with the baron. Has he perceived anything? Ah, that is a good joke. Do you think he suspects? said Monte Cristo, with charming artlessness. Where have you come from, my dear Count? said Albert. From Congo, if you will. It must be farther off than even that. But what do I know of your Parisian husbands? Oh, my dear Count, husbands are pretty much the same everywhere. An individual husband of any country is a pretty fair specimen of the whole race. But then, what can have led to the quarrel between Danglars and Debray? They seem to understand each other so well, said Monte Cristo, with renewed energy. Ah! Now you are trying to penetrate into the mysteries of Isis, in which I am not initiated. When Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti has become one of the family, you can ask him that question. The carriage stopped. Here we are, said Monte Cristo. It is only half-past ten o'clock. Come in. 
Certainly, I will. My carriage shall take you back. No, thank you. I have given orders for my coupe to follow me. There it is, then, said Monte Cristo, as he stepped out of the carriage. They both went into the house. The drawing-room was lighted up. They went in there. You will make tea for us, Baptastine, said the Count. Baptastine left the room without waiting to answer, and in two seconds reappeared, bringing on a waiter all that his master had ordered, ready prepared, and appearing to have sprung from the ground, like the repast which we read of in fairy tales. "'Really, my dear Count,' said Morcerf, "'what I admire in you is not so much your riches, for perhaps there are people even wealthier than yourself, nor is it only your wit, for Bormoche might have possessed as much, but it is your manner of being served, without questions, in a moment, in a second. It is as if they guessed what you wanted by your manner of ringing, and made a point of keeping everything you could possibly desire in constant readiness. What you say is perhaps true, they know my habits. For instance, you shall see. How do you wish to occupy yourself during tea-time? Ma foi, I should like to smoke. Monte Cristo took the gong and struck it once. In about the space of a second a private door opened, and Ali appeared, bringing two shabooks filled with excellent latakia. It is quite wonderful, said Albert. Oh, no, it is as simple as possible, replied Monte Cristo. Ali knows I generally smoke while I am taking my tea or coffee. He has heard that I ordered tea, and he also knows that I brought you home with me. When I summoned him, he naturally guessed the reason of my doing so, and, as he comes from a country where hospitality is especially manifested through the medium of smoking, he naturally concludes that we shall smoke in company, and therefore brings two shabooks instead of one. And now the mystery is solved. Certainly you give a most commonplace air to your explanation, but it is not the less true that you— Ah, but what do I hear? And Morcerf inclined his head towards the door, through which sounds seemed to issue resembling those of a guitar. Ma foi, my dear Viscount, you are fated to hear music this evening. You have only escaped from Mademoiselle Danglars' piano to be attacked by Hades Guzla. Hady, what an adorable name! Are there then really women who bear the name of Hady anywhere but in Byron's poems? Certainly there are. Hady is a very uncommon name in France, but is common enough in Albania and Epirus. It is as if you said, for example, chastity, modesty, innocence. It is a kind of baptismal name, as you Parisians call it. Oh, that is charming, said Albert. How I should like to hear my countrywomen called Mademoiselle Goodness, Mademoiselle Silence, Mademoiselle Christian Charity. Only think, then, if Mademoiselle Danglars, instead of being called Claire Marie Eugenie, had been named Mademoiselle Chastity Modesty Innocence Danglar. What a fine effect that would have produced on the announcement of her marriage! Hush! said the Count. Do not joke in so loud a tone. Haiti may hear you, perhaps. And do you think she would be angry? No, certainly not, said the Count, with a haughty expression. She is very amiable, then, is she not? said Albert. It is not to be called amiability. It is her duty. A slave does not dictate to a master. Come, you are joking yourself now. Are there any more slaves to be had who bear this beautiful name? Undoubtedly. Really, Count, you do nothing and have nothing like other people. The slave of the Count of Monte Cristo. Why, it is a rank of itself in France, and from the way in which you lavish money, it is a place that must be worth a hundred thousand francs a year. A hundred thousand francs? The poor girl originally possessed much more than that. 
she was born to treasures in comparison with which those recorded in the Thousand and One Nights would seem but poverty. She must be a princess, then. You are right, and she is one of the greatest in her country, too. I thought so. But how did it happen that such a great princess became a slave? How was it that Dionysius the tyrant became a schoolmaster? The fortune of war, my dear Viscount, the caprice of fortune. That is the way in which these things are to be accounted for. And is her name a secret? As regards the generality of mankind, it is, but not for you, my dear Viscount, who are one of my most intimate friends, and on whose silence I feel I may rely, if I consider it necessary to enjoin it, may I not do so? Certainly, on my word of honour. You know the history of the Pasha of Yanina, do you not? Of Ali Tepelini? Oh, yes, it was in his service that my father made his fortune. True, I had forgotten that. Well, what is Haiti to Ali Tepelini? Merely his daughter. What? The daughter of Ali Pasha? Of Ali Pasha and the beautiful Vasiliki. And your slave. Ma foi, yes. But how did she become so? Why, simply from the circumstance of my having bought her one day, as I was passing through the market at Constantinople. Wonderful! Really, my dear Count, you seem to throw a sort of magic influence over all in which you are concerned. When I listen to you, existence no longer seems reality, but a waking dream. Now, I am perhaps going to make an imprudent and thoughtless request, but, say on, but since you go out with Haiti, and sometimes even take her to the opera, well, I think I may venture to ask you this favor. You may venture to ask me anything. Well, then, my dear Count, present me to your princess. I will do so, but on two conditions. I accept them at once. The first is that you will never tell anyone that I have granted the interview. Very well, said Albert, extending his hand. I swear I will not. The second is that you will not tell her that your father ever served hers. I give you my oath that I will not. Enough, Viscount. You will remember those two vows, will you not? But I know you to be a man of honor. The Count again struck the gong. Ali reappeared. Tell Haiti, said he, that I will take coffee with her, and give her to understand that I desire permission to present one of my friends to her. Ali bowed and left the room. Now understand me, said the Count. No direct questions, my dear Morcerf. If you wish to know anything, tell me, and I will ask her. Agreed. Ali reappeared for the third time, and drew back the tapestried hanging which concealed the door to signify to his master and Albert that they were at liberty to pass on. Let us go in, said Monte Cristo. Albert passed his hand through his hair and curled his moustache, then, having satisfied himself as to his personal appearance, followed the Count into the room, the latter having previously resumed his hat and gloves. Ali was stationed as a kind of advanced guard, and the door was kept by three French attendants, commanded by Mirtho. Haiti was awaiting her visitors in the first room of her apartments, which was the drawing-room. Her large eyes were dilated with surprise and expectation, for it was the first time that any man, except Monte Cristo, had been accorded an entrance into her presence. She was sitting on a sofa placed in an angle of the room, with her legs crossed under her in the eastern fashion, and seemed to have made for herself, as it were, a kind of nest in the rich Indian silks which enveloped her. Near her was the instrument on which she had just been playing. It was elegantly fashioned and worthy of its mistress. On perceiving Monte Cristo, she arose and welcomed him with a smile peculiar to herself, 
expressive at once of the most implicit obedience and also of the deepest love. Monte Cristo advanced towards her and extended his hand, which she, as usual, raised to her lips. Albert had proceeded no farther than the door, where he remained rooted to the spot, being completely fascinated by the sight of such surpassing beauty, beheld as it was for the first time, and of which an inhabitant of more northern climes could form no adequate idea. "'Whom do you bring?' asked the young girl, in Romaic, of Monte Cristo. "'Is it a friend, a brother, a simple acquaintance, or an enemy?' "'A friend,' said Monte Cristo, in the same language. "'What is his name?' "'Count Albert. It is the same man whom I rescued from the hands of the banditti at Rome.' "'In what language would you like me to converse with him?' Monte Cristo turned to Albert. "'Do you know modern Greek?' asked he. "'Alas, no,' said Albert, "'nor even ancient Greek, my dear Count.' Never had Homer or Plato a more unworthy scholar than myself. Then, said Haiti, proving by her remark that she had quite understood Monte Cristo's question and Albert's answer, then I will speak either in French or Italian if my lord so wills it. Monte Cristo reflected one instant. You will speak in Italian, said he. Then, turning towards Albert, it is a pity you do not understand either ancient or modern Greek, both of which Haiti speaks so fluently. The poor child will be obliged to talk to you in Italian, which will give you but a very false idea of her powers of conversation. The Count made a sign to Haiti to address his visitor. Sir, she said to Mercerf, you are most welcome as the friend of my lord and master. This was said in excellent Tuscan and with that soft Roman accent which makes the language of Dante as sonorous as that of Homer. Then, turning to Ali, she directed him to bring coffee and pipes, and when he had left the room to execute the orders of his young mistress, she beckoned Albert to approach nearer to her. Monte Cristo and Morcerf drew their seats towards a small table, on which were arranged music, drawings, and vases of flowers. Ali then entered bringing coffee and chibouks. As to Monsieur Baptistine, this portion of the building was interdicted to him. Albert refused the pipe which the Nubian offered him. "'Oh, take it, take it,' said the Count. "'Haiti is almost as civilized as a Parisian. The smell of Aunt Havana is disagreeable to her, but the tobacco of the East is a most delicious perfume, you know.' Ali left the room. The cups of coffee were all prepared, with the addition of sugar, which had been brought for Albert. Monte Cristo and Haiti took the beverage in the original Arabian manner, that is to say, without sugar. Haiti took the porcelain cup in her little slender fingers and conveyed it to her mouth with all the innocent artlessness of a child when eating or drinking something which it likes. At this moment two women entered, bringing salvers filled with ices and sherbet, which they placed on two small tables appropriated to that purpose. "'My dear host, and you, signora,' said Albert, in Italian, "'excuse my apparent stupidity. I am quite bewildered, and it is natural that it should be so. Here I am in the heart of Paris. But a moment ago I heard the rumbling of the omnibuses and the tinkling of the bells of the lemonade sellers, and now I feel as if I were suddenly transported to the East, not such as I have seen it, but such as my dreams have painted it. Oh, Signora, if I could but speak Greek, your conversation, added to the fairy scene which surrounds me, would furnish an evening of such delight as it would be impossible for me ever to forget. "'I speak sufficient Italian to enable me to converse with you, sir,' said Haiti quietly, "'and if you like what is Eastern, I will do my best to secure the gratification of your tastes while you are here.' "'On what subject shall I converse with her?' said Albert in a low tone to Monte Cristo. 
just what you please. You may speak of her country and of her youthful reminiscences, or, if you like it better, you can talk of Rome, Naples, or Florence. Oh, said Albert, it is of no use to be in the company of a Greek if one converses just in the same style as with a Parisian. Let me speak to her of the East. Do so, then, for of all themes which you could choose, that would be the most agreeable to her taste. Albert turned towards Haydi. "'At what age did you leave Greece, Signora?' asked he. "'I left it when I was but five years old,' replied Haydi. "'And have you any recollections of your country?' "'When I shut my eyes and think, I seem to see it all again. The mind can see as well as the body. The body forgets sometimes, but the mind never forgets.' And how far back into the past do your recollections extend? I could scarcely walk when my mother, who was called Vasiliki, which means royal, said the young girl, tossing her head proudly, took me by the hand, and after putting in our purse all the money we possessed, we went out, both covered with veils, to solicit alms for the prisoners, saying, He who giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. Then, when our purse was full, we returned to the palace, and without saying a word to my father, we sent it to the convent, where it was divided amongst the prisoners. "'And how old were you at that time?' "'I was three years old,' said Haiti. "'Then you remember everything that went on about you from the time when you were three years old?' said Albert. "'Everything.' "'Count,' said Albert in a low tone to Monte Cristo, "'Do allow the signora to tell me something of her history. You prohibited my mentioning my father's name to her, but perhaps she will allude to him of her own accord in the course of her recital, and you have no idea how delighted I should be to hear our name pronounced by such beautiful lips.' Monte Cristo turned to Haiti and with an expression of countenance which commanded her to pay the most implicit attention to his words, he said in Greek, "'Tell the fate of your father, but neither the name of the traitor nor the treason.' Haiti sighed deeply, and a shade of sadness clouded her beautiful brow. "'What are you saying to her?' said Morcerf, in an undertone. I again reminded her that you were a friend, and that she need not conceal anything from you. Then, said Albert, this pious pilgrimage in behalf of the prisoners was your first remembrance. What is the next? Oh, then I remember as if it were but yesterday, sitting under the shade of some sycamore trees, on the borders of a lake in the waters of which the trembling foliage was reflected as in a mirror. Under the oldest and thickest of these trees, reclining on cushions, sat my father. My mother was at his feet, and I, childlike, amused myself by playing with his long white beard, which descended to his girdle, or with the diamond hilt of the scimitar attached to his girdle. Then from time to time there came to him an Albanian, who said something to which I paid no attention, but which he always answered in the same tone of voice, either kill or pardon. "'It is very strange,' said Albert, "'to hear such words proceed from the mouth of any one but an actress on the stage, and one needs constantly to be saying to oneself, "'This is no fiction, it is all reality, in order to believe it. "'And how does France appear in your eyes?' accustomed as they have been to gaze on such enchanted scenes. "'I think it is a fine country,' said Haiti. "'But I see France as it really is, because I look on it with the eyes of a woman. Whereas my own country, which I can only judge of from the impression produced on my childish mind, always seems enveloped in a vague atmosphere, which is luminous or otherwise, according as my remembrances of it are sad or joyous. "'So young,' said Albert, forgetting at the moment the Count's command that he should ask no questions of the slave herself. "'Is it possible that you could have known what suffering is, except by name?' 
Haiti turned her eyes towards Monte Cristo, who, making at the same time some imperceptible sign, murmured, Go on. Nothing is ever so firmly impressed on the mind as the memory of our early childhood, and with the exception of the two scenes I have just described to you, all my earliest reminiscences are fraught with deepest sadness. Speak, speak, signora, said Albert. I am listening with the most intense delight and interest to all you say. Haiti answered his remark with a melancholy smile. You wish me, then, to relate the history of my past sorrows, said she? I beg you to do so, replied Albert. Well, I was but four years old when one night I was suddenly awakened by my mother. We were in the palace of Yanina. She snatched me from the cushions on which I was sleeping, and, on opening my eyes, I saw hers filled with tears. She took me away without speaking. When I saw her weeping, I began to cry, too. "'Hush, child,' said she. At other times, in spite of maternal endearments or threats, I had with a child's caprice been accustomed to indulge my feelings of sorrow or anger by crying as much as I felt inclined, but on this occasion there was an intonation of such extreme terror in my mother's voice when she enjoined me to silence that I ceased crying as soon as her command was given. She bore me rapidly away. I saw then that we were descending a large staircase. Around us were all my mother's servants, carrying trunks, bags, ornaments, jewels, purses of gold, with which they were hurrying away in the greatest distraction. Behind the women came a guard of twenty men, armed with long guns and pistols, and dressed in the costume which the Greeks have assumed since they have again become a nation. You may imagine there was something startling and ominous, said Haiti, shaking her head and turning pale at the mere remembrance of the scene, in this long file of slaves and women only half aroused from sleep, or at least so they appeared to me, who was myself scarcely awake. Here and there on the walls of the staircase were reflected gigantic shadows, which trembled in the flickering light of the pine-torches till they seemed to reach the vaulted roof above. "'Quick!' said a voice at the end of the gallery. This voice made every one bow before it, resembling in its effect the wind passing over a field of wheat, by its superior strength, forcing every ear to yield obeisance. As for me, it made me tremble. This voice was that of my father. He came last, clothed in his splendid robes, and holding in his hand the carbine which your emperor presented him. He was leaning on the shoulder of his favorite, Selim, and he drove us all before him, as a shepherd would his straggling flock. "'My father,' said Haiti, raising her head, "'was that illustrious man, known in Europe under the name of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina, and before whom Turkey trembled.' Albert, without knowing why, started on hearing these words pronounced with such a haughty and dignified accent. It appeared to him as if there was something supernaturally gloomy and terrible in the expression which gleamed from the brilliant eyes of Haiti at this moment. She appeared like a pythoness evoking a spectre, as she recalled to his mind the remembrance of the fearful death of this man, to the news of which all Europe had listened with horror. Soon, said Haiti, we halted on our march, and found ourselves on the borders of a lake. My mother pressed me to her throbbing heart, and at the distance of a few paces I saw my father, who was glancing anxiously around. Four marble steps led down to the water's edge, and below them was a boat floating on the tide. From where we stood I could see in the middle of the lake a large blank mass. It was the kiosk to which we were going. This kiosk appeared to me to be at a considerable distance perhaps on account of the darkness of the night, which prevented any object from being more than partially discerned. We stepped into the boat. 
I remember well that the oars made no noise whatever in striking the water, and when I leaned over to ascertain the cause, I saw that they were muffled with the sashes of our palicares. Besides the rowers, the boat contained only the women, my father, mother, Selim, and myself. The palicares had remained on the shore of the lake, ready to cover our retreat. They were kneeling on the lowest of the marble steps, and in that manner intended making a rampart of the three others, in case of pursuit. Our bark flew before the wind. "'Why does the boat go so fast?' asked I of my mother. "'Silence, child! Hush! We are flying!' I did not understand. Why should my father fly? He, the all-powerful, he before whom others were accustomed to fly, he who had taken for his device, they hate me, then they fear me. It was, indeed, a flight which my father was trying to effect. I have been told since that the garrison of the castle of Yanana fatigued with long service. Here Haiti cast a significant glance at Monte Cristo, whose eyes had been riveted on her countenance during the whole course of her narrative. The young girl then continued, speaking slowly, like a person who is either inventing or suppressing some feature of the history which he is relating. "'You were saying, Signora,' said Albert, who was paying the most implicit attention to the recital, "'that the garrison of Yanana, fatigued with long service, had treated with the Sarasker Kurshid, who had been sent by the Sultan to gain possession of the person of my father. It was then that Ali Tepalini, after having sent to the Sultan a French officer in which he reposed great confidence, resolved to retire to the asylum which he had long before prepared for himself, and which he called Cadafidion, or the Refuge. "'And this officer,' said Albert, "'do you remember his name, Signora?' Monte Cristo exchanged a rapid glance with the young girl, which was quite unperceived by Albert. "'No,' said she, "'I do not remember it just at this moment, but if it should occur to me presently, I will tell you.' Albert was on the point of pronouncing his father's name, when Monte Cristo gently held up his finger in token of reproach. The young man recollected his promise, and was silent. It was towards this kiosk that we were rowing. A ground floor, ornamented with arabesques, bathing its terraces in the water, and another floor, looking on the lake, was all which was visible to the eye. But beneath the ground floor, stretching out into the island, was a large subterranean cavern, to which my mother, myself, and the women were conducted. In this place were together sixty thousand pouches and two hundred barrels. The pouches contained twenty-five million of money in gold, and the barrels were filled with thirty thousand pounds of gunpowder. Near the barrels stood Selim, my father's favorite, whom I mentioned to you just now. He stood watch day and night, with a lance provided with a lighted slow-match in his hand, and he had orders to blow up everything kiosk, guards, women, gold, and Ali Tepalini himself, at the first signal given by my father. I remember well that the slaves, convinced of the precarious tenure in which they held their lives, passed whole days and nights in praying, crying, and groaning. As for me, I can never forget the pale complexion and black eyes of the young soldier, and whenever the angel of death summons me to another world, I am quite sure I shall recognize Selim. I cannot tell you how long we remained in this state. At that period I did not even know what time meant. Sometimes, but very rarely, my father summoned me and my mother to the terrace of the palace. These were hours of recreation for me, as I never saw anything in the dismal cavern but the gloomy countenances of the slaves and Selim's fiery lance. My father was endeavouring to pierce with his eager looks the remotest verge of the horizon, examining attentively every black speck which appeared on the lake. 
while my mother, reclining by his side, rested her head on his shoulder, and I played at his feet, admiring everything I saw with that unsophisticated innocence of childhood, which throws a charm round objects insignificant in themselves, but which in its eyes are invested with the greatest importance. The heights of Pindus towered above us. The castle of Yanana rose white and angular from the blue waters of the lake. And the immense masses of black vegetation, which, viewed in the distance, gave the idea of lichens clinging to the rocks, were, in reality, gigantic fir-trees and myrtles. One morning my father sent for us. My mother had been crying all the night and was very wretched. We found the pasha calm, but paler than usual. "'Take courage, Vasiliki,' said he. "'Today arrives the firman of the master, and my fate will be decided. If my pardon be complete, we shall return triumphant to Yanana. If the news be inauspicious, we must fly this night.' "'But supposing our enemy should not allow us to do so?' said my mother. "'Oh, make yourself easy on that head,' said Ali, smiling. "'Selim and his flaming lance will settle that matter. "'They would be glad to see me dead, "'but they would not like themselves to die with me.' "'My mother only answered by sighs "'to consolations which she knew did not come from my father's heart.' She prepared the iced water which he was in the habit of constantly drinking, for since his sojourn at the kiosk he had been parched by the most violent fever, after which she anointed his white beard with perfumed oil and lighted his shibuk, which he sometimes smoked for hours together, quietly watching the wreaths of vapor that ascended in spiral clouds and gradually melted away in the surrounding atmosphere. Presently, he made such a sudden movement that I was paralyzed with fear. Then, without taking his eyes from the object which had first attracted his attention, he asked for his telescope. My mother gave it him, and as she did so, looked whiter than the marble against which she leaned. I saw my father's hand tremble. A boat. Two. Three, murmured my father. Four. He then arose, seizing his arms and priming his pistols. Vasiliki, said he to my mother, trembling perceptibly, the instant approaches which will decide everything. In the space of half an hour we shall know the Emperor's answer. Go into the cavern with Hadi. I will not quit you, said Vasiliki. If you die, my lord, I will die with you. Go to Selim, cried my father. I do, my lord murmured my mother, determining quietly to await the approach of death. "'Take away, Vasiliki,' said my father to the palicares. As for me, I had been forgotten in the general confusion. I ran toward Ali Tepelini. He saw me hold out my arms to him, and he stooped down and pressed my forehead with his lips. Oh, how distinctly I remember that kiss! It was the last he ever gave me and I feel as if it were still warm on my forehead. On descending, we saw through the lattice-work several boats which were gradually becoming more distinct to our view. At first they appeared like black specks, and now they looked like birds skimming the surface of the waves. During this time, in the kiosk at my father's feet, were seated twenty palicares, concealed from view by an angle of the wall, and watching with eager eyes the arrival of the boats. They were armed with their long guns, inlaid with mother-of-pearl and silver, and cartridges in great numbers were lying scattered on the floor. My father looked at his watch, and paced up and down with a countenance expressive of the greatest anguish. This was the scene which presented itself to my view as I quitted my father after that last kiss. My mother and I traversed the gloomy passage leading to the cavern. Selim was still at his post, and smiled sadly on us as we entered. We fetched our cushions from the other end of the cavern and sat down by Selim. In great dangers the devoted ones cling to each other, and, young as I was, I quite understood that some imminent danger was hanging over our heads. Albert had often heard, 
not from his father, for he never spoke on the subject, but from strangers, the description of the last moments of the vizier of Yanina. He had read different accounts of his death, but the story seemed to acquire fresh meaning from the voice and expression of the young girl, and her sympathetic accent, and the melancholy expression of her countenance at once charmed and horrified him. As to Haiti, these terrible reminiscences seemed to have overpowered her for a moment, for she ceased speaking, her head leaning on her hand like a beautiful flower bowing beneath the violence of the storm, and her eyes gazing on vacancy indicated that she was mentally contemplating the green summit of the Pindus and the blue waters of the lake of Yanana, which, like a magic mirror, seemed to reflect the sombre picture which she sketched. Monte Cristo looked at her with an indescribable expression of interest and pity. "'Go on,' said the Count in the Romaic language. Haiti looked up abruptly, as if the sonorous tones of Monte Cristo's voice had awakened her from a dream, and she resumed her narrative. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and although the day was brilliant out of doors, we were enveloped in the gloomy darkness of the cavern. One single solitary light was burning there, and it appeared like a star set in a heaven of blackness. It was Selim's flaming lance. My mother was a Christian, and she prayed. Selim repeated from time to time the sacred words, God is great. However, my mother had still some hope. As she was coming down, she thought she recognized the French officer who had been sent to Constantinople, and in whom my father placed so much confidence, for he knew that all the soldiers of the French emperor were naturally noble and generous. She advanced some steps towards the staircase, and listened. "'They are approaching,' said she. "'Perhaps they bring us peace and liberty.' "'What do you fear, Vasiliki?' said Selim, in a voice at once so gentle and yet so proud. "'If they do not bring us peace, we will give them war. If they do not bring life, we will give them death.' And he renewed the flame of his lance, with a gesture which made one think of Dionysus of Crete. But I, being only a little child, was terrified by his undaunted courage, which appeared to me both ferocious and senseless, and I recoiled with horror from the idea of the frightful death amidst fire and flames which probably awaited us. My mother experienced the same sensations, for I felt her tremble. "'Mama, mamma," said I, "'are we really to be killed?' And at the sound of my voice the slaves redoubled their cries and prayers and lamentations. My child, said Vasiliki, may God preserve you from ever wishing for that death which today you so much dread. Then, whispering to Selim, she asked what were her master's orders. If he send me his poniard, it will signify that the emperor's intentions are not favorable, and I am to set fire to the powder. If, on the contrary, he send me his ring, it will be a sign that the emperor pardons him and I am to extinguish the match and leave the magazine untouched. My friend, said my mother, when your master's orders arrive, if it is the poniard which he sends, instead of dispatching us by that horrible death which we both so much dread, you will mercifully kill us with the same poniard, will you not? Yes, Vasiliki, replied Selim tranquilly. Suddenly we heard loud cries and listening discerned that they were cries of joy. The name of the French officer who had been sent to Constantinople resounded on all sides amongst our palicares. It was evident that he had brought the answer of the Emperor, and that it was favorable. "'And you do not remember the Frenchman's name?' said Morcerf, quite ready to aid the memory of the narrator. Monte Cristo made a sign to him to be silent." I do not recollect it," said Haiti. The noise increased. Steps were heard approaching nearer and nearer. They were descending the steps leading to the cavern. Selim made ready his lance. 
Soon a figure appeared in the gray twilight at the entrance of the cave, formed by the reflection of the few rays of daylight which had found their way into this gloomy retreat. "'Who are you?' cried Selim. "'But whoever you may be, I charge you not to advance another step.' "'Long live the Emperor!' said the figure. "'He grants a full pardon to the Vizier Ali, and not only gives him his life, but restores to him his fortune and his possessions.' My mother uttered a cry of joy, and clasped me to her bosom. "'Stop,' said Selim, seeing that she was about to go out. "'You see, I have not yet received the ring.' "'True,' said my mother, and she fell on her knees, at the same time holding me up towards heaven, as if she desired, while praying to God in my behalf, to raise me actually to His presence. And for the second time Hades stopped overcome by such violent emotion that the perspiration stood upon her pale brow, and her stifled voice seemed hardly able to find utterance, so parched and dry were her throat and lips. Monte Cristo poured a little iced water into a glass, and presented it to her, saying with a mildness in which was also a shade of command, Courage. Haiti dried her eyes and continued. By this time, our eyes, habituated to the darkness, had recognized the messenger of the Pasha. It was a friend. Selim had also recognized him, but the brave young man only acknowledged one duty, which was to obey. "'In whose name do you come?' said he to him. "'I come in the name of our master, Ali Tepelini. "'If you come from Ali himself,' said Selim, "'you know what you are charged to remit to me?' Yes, said the messenger, and I bring you his ring. At these words he raised his hand above his head to show the token, but he was too far off, and there was not light enough to enable Selim, where he was standing, to distinguish and recognize the object presented to his view. I do not see what you have in your hand, said Selim. Approach, then, said the messenger or I will come nearer to you, if you prefer it." "'I will agree to neither one nor the other,' replied the young soldier. "'Place the object which I desire to see in the ray of light which shines there, and retire while I examine it.' "'Be it so,' said the envoy, and he retired, after having first deposited the token agreed on in the place pointed out to him by Selim. Oh, how our hearts palpitated! for it did indeed seem to be a ring which was placed there. But was it my father's ring? That was the question. Selim, still holding in his hand the lighted match, walked towards the opening in the cavern, and, aided by the faint light which streamed in through the mouth of the cave, picked up the token. "'It is well,' said he, kissing it. "'It is my master's ring.' and throwing the match on the ground, he trampled on it and extinguished it. The messenger uttered a cry of joy and clapped his hands. At this signal, four soldiers of the Saraskar Kurshid suddenly appeared, and Selim fell, pierced by five blows. Each man had stabbed him separately, and intoxicated by their crime, though still pale with fear, they sought all over the cavern to discover if there was any fear of fire, after which they amused themselves by rolling on the bags of gold. At this moment my mother seized me in her arms, and hurrying noiselessly along numerous turnings and windings known only to ourselves, she arrived at a private staircase of the kiosk, where was a scene of frightful tumult and confusion. The lower rooms were entirely filled with Kurshid's troops, that is to say, with our enemies. Just as my mother was on the point of pushing open a small door, we heard the voice of the Pasha sounding in a loud and threatening tone. My mother applied her eye to the crack between the boards. I, luckily, found a small opening which afforded me a view of the apartment and what was passing within. "'What do you want?' said my father to some people, who were holding a paper inscribed with characters of gold. What we want, replied one, is to communicate to you the will of His Highness. Do you see this, Furman? I do, said my father. Well, read it, 
He demands your head." My father answered with a loud laugh, which was more frightful than even threats would have been, and he had not ceased when two reports of a pistol were heard. He had fired them himself, and killed two men. The palicares, who were prostrated at my father's feet, now sprang up and fired, and the room was filled with fire and smoke. At the same instant the firing began on the other side, and the balls penetrated the boards all round us. Oh, how noble did the Grand Vizier, my father, look at that moment, in the midst of the flying bullets, his scimitar in his hand, and his face blackened with the powder of his enemies! And how he terrified them, even then, and made them fly before him! Selim, Selim, cried he, guardian of the fire, do your duty! Selim is dead, replied a voice which seemed to come from the depths of the earth, and you are lost, Ali. At the same moment an explosion was heard, and the flooring of the room in which my father was sitting was suddenly torn up and shivered to atoms. The troops were firing from underneath. Three or four palicares fell with their bodies literally ploughed with wounds. My father howled aloud plunged his fingers into the holes which the balls had made, and tore up one of the planks entire. But immediately, through this opening, twenty more shots were fired, and the flame, rushing up like fire from the center of a volcano, soon reached the tapestry, which it quickly devoured. In the midst of all this frightful tumult, and these terrific cries, two reports, fearfully distinct, followed by two shrieks more heart-rending than all froze me with terror. These two shots had mortally wounded my father, and it was he who had given utterance to these frightful cries. However, he remained standing, clinging to a window. My mother tried to force the door, that she might go and die with him, but it was fastened on the inside. All around him were lying the palicares, writhing in convulsive agonies, while two or three who were only slightly wounded were trying to escape by springing from the windows. At this crisis the whole floor suddenly gave way. My father fell on one knee, and at the same moment twenty hands were thrust forth, armed with sabres, pistols, and poniards. Twenty blows were instantaneously directed against one man, and my father disappeared in a whirlwind of fire and smoke kindled by these demons, and which had seemed like hell itself opening beneath his feet. I felt myself fall to the ground. My mother had fainted. Hades' arms fell by her side, and she uttered a deep groan, at the same time looking towards the Count, as if to ask if he were satisfied with her obedience to his commands. Monte Cristo arose and approached her, took her hand and said to her in Romaic, Calm yourself, my dear child, and take courage in remembering that there is a God who will punish traitors." "'It is a frightful story, Count,' said Albert, terrified at the paleness of Hades' countenance. "'And I reproach myself now for having been so cruel and thoughtless in my request.' "'Oh, it is nothing,' said Monte Cristo. Then, patting the young girl on the head, he continued. Haiti is very courageous, and she sometimes even finds consolation in the recital of her misfortunes. "'Because, my lord,' said Haiti eagerly, "'my miseries recall to me the remembrance of your goodness.' Albert looked at her with curiosity, for she had not yet related what he most desired to know. How she had become the slave of the Count. Haiti saw at once the same expression pervading the countenance of her two auditors she exclaimed. When my mother recovered her senses, we were before the Sarasker. Kill, said she, but spare the honor of the widow of Ali. It is not me to whom you must address yourself, said Kurshid. To whom, then? To your new master. Who and where is he? He is here. And Kurshid pointed out one who had more than any contributed to the death of my father said Haiti, in a tone of chastened anger. Then, said Albert, you became the property of this man? No, replied Haiti. 
he did not dare to keep us. So we were sold to some slave merchants who were going to Constantinople. We traversed Greece and arrived half dead at the imperial gates. They were surrounded by a crowd of people, who opened a way for us to pass, when suddenly my mother, having looked closely at an object which was attracting their attention, uttered a piercing cry and fell to the ground, pointing as she did so to a head which was placed over the gates, and beneath it which were inscribed these words, This is the head of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina. I cried bitterly and tried to raise my mother from the earth, but she was dead. I was taken to the slave market and was purchased by a rich Armenian. He caused me to be instructed, gave me masters, and when I was thirteen years of age he sold me to the Sultan Mahmud. "'Of whom I bought her,' said Monte Cristo. "'As I told you, Albert, with the emerald which formed a match to the one I had made into a box for the purpose of holding my hashish pills.' "'Oh, you are good, you are great, my lord,' said Haiti, kissing the Count's hand. "'And I am very fortunate in belonging to such a master.' Albert remained quite bewildered with all that he had seen and heard. "'Come, finish your cup of coffee,' said Monte Cristo. "'The history is ended.'" End of chapter 77This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Thomas Wells. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 78 We Hear from Yanina. If Valentine could have seen the trembling step, an agitated countenance of Franz when he quitted the chamber of M. Nortier, even she would have been constrained to pity him. Villefort had only just given utterance to a few incoherent sentences, and then retired to his study, where he received about two hours afterwards the following letter. After all the disclosures which we made this morning, M. Nortier de Villefort must see the utter impossibility of any alliance being formed between his family and that of M. Franz d'Epinay. M. d'Epinay must say that he is shocked and astonished that M. de Villefort, who appeared to be aware of all the circumstances detailed this morning, should not have anticipated him in this announcement. No one who had seen the magistrate at this moment, so thoroughly unnerved by the recent inauspicious combination of circumstances, would have supposed for an instant that he had anticipated the annoyance. Although it certainly never had occurred to him that his father would carry candor, or rather rudeness, so far as to relate such a history. And in justice to Villefort, it must be understood that M. Nortier, who never carried the opinion of his son on any subject, had always omitted to explain the affair to Villefort, so that he had all his life entertained the belief that General de Cusnel, or the Baron de Epnay, as he was alternately styled, according as the speaker wished to identify him by his own family name, or by the title which he had been conferred on him, fell the victim of assassination, and not that he was killed fairly in a duel. This harsh letter, coming as it did from a man generally so polite and respectful, struck a mortal blow at the pride of Villefort. Hardly had he read the letter when his wife entered. The sudden departure of Franz, after being summoned by M. Nortier, had so much astonished everyone that the position of Madame de Villefort, left alone with the notary and the witnesses, became every moment more embarrassing. Determined to bear it no longer, she arose and left the room, saying she would go and make some inquiries into the cause of his sudden disappearance. M. de Villefort's communications on the subject were very limited and concise. He told her, in fact, that an explanation had taken place between M. Nortier M. de Impinay and himself, and that the marriage of Valentine and Franz would consequently be broken off. This was an awkward and unpleasant thing to have to report to those who were awaiting her return in the chamber of her father-in-law. She therefore contented herself with saying that M. Nortier, having the, at the commencement of the discussion been attacked by a sort of apocalyptic fit, the affair would necessarily be de deferred for some days longer. This news, false as it was, following so singularly in the 
train of the two similar misfortunes which had so recently occurred, evidently astonished the auditors, and they retired without a word. During this time, Valentine, at once terrified and happy, after having embraced and thanked the feeble old man for thus breaking with a single blow the chain which she had been accustomed to consider as irrefragable, asked leave to retire to her own room, in order to recover her composure. Nortier looked the permission which she solicited, but instead of going to her own room, Valentine, having once gained her liberty, entered the gallery, and opening a small door at the end of it, found herself once in the garden. In the midst of all the strange events which had crowded one on the other, an indefinable sentiment of dread had taken possession of Valentine's mind. She expected every moment that she should see Morel appear, pale and trembling, to forbid the signing of the contract, like the Laird of Ravenswood and the Bride of Lammermoor. It was high time for her to make her appearance at the gate, for Maximilian had long awaited her coming. He had half guessed that it was going on when he saw Franz quit the cemetery with M. de Villefort. He followed M. de Epinay, saw him enter, afterwards go out, and then re-enter with Albert and Chateau Renaud. He no longer had any doubts as to the nature of the conference. He therefore quickly went to the gate in the clover patch, prepared to hear the result of the proceedings, and very certain that Valentine would hasten to him the first moment she should be set at liberty. He was not mistaken. Peering through the crevices of the wooden partition, he soon discovered the young girl who cast aside all her usual precautions and walked at once to the barrier. The first glance which Maximilian directed towards her entirely reassured him, and the first words she spoke made his heart bound with delight. "'We are saved!' said Valentine. "'Saved?' repeated Morel, not being able to conceive such intense happiness. "'By whom?' "'By my grandfather. Oh, Morel, pray love him for all his goodness to us.' Morel swore to love him with all his soul, and at that moment he could safely promise to do so, for he felt as though it were not enough to love him merely as a friend or even as a father. But tell me, Valentine, how has it been all effected? What strange means has he used to compass this blessed end? Valentine was on the point of relating all that had passed, but she suddenly remembered that in doing so she must reveal a terrible secret which concerned others as well as her grandfather, and she said, At some future time I will tell you all about it. But when will that be? When I am your wife. The conversation had now turned upon a topic so pleasing to Morel, that he was ready to accede to anything that Valentine thought fit to propose, and he likewise felt a piece of intelligence such as he just heard ought to be more than sufficient to content him for one day. However, he would not leave without the promise of seeing Valentine again the next night. Valentine promised all that Morel required of her, and certainly it was less difficult now for her to believe that she should marry Maximilian than it was an hour ago to assure herself that she should not marry Franz. During the time occupied by the interview we have just detailed, Madame de Villefort had gone to visit M. Nortier. The old man looked at her with that stern and forbidding expression which he was accustomed to receive her. Sir, said she, is it superfluous for me to tell you that Valentine's marriage is broken off? since it was here that the affair was concluded. Nautier's countenance remained immovable. But one thing I can tell you, of which I do not think you are aware, that is, that I have always been opposed to this marriage, and that the contract was entered into entirely without my consent or approbation. Nautier regarded his daughter-in-law with the look of a man desiring an explanation. Now that this marriage, which I know you so much disliked, is done away with, I come to you on an errand which neither M. de Villefort nor Valentine could consistently undertake. Nautier's eyes demanded the nature of her mission. I come to entreat you, sir, continued Madame de Villefort, as the only one who has the right of doing so, inasmuch as I am the only one who will receive no personal benefit from the transaction, I come to entreat you to restore, not your love, for that she is always possessed, but to restore your fortune to your granddaughter. There was a doubtful expression in Nortier's eyes. He was evidently trying to discover the motive of this proceeding, and he could not succeed in doing so. "'May I hope, sir,' said Madame de Villefort, "'that your intentions accord with my request.' Nortier made a sign that they did. "'In that case, sir,' rejoined Madame de Villefort, "'I will leave you overwhelmed with gratitude and happiness at your prompt acquiescence to my wishes.' She then bowed to M. Nortier and retired. The next day, M. Nortier sent for the notary. The first will was torn up and a second made, in which he left the whole of his fortune to Valentine, on condition that she should never be separated from him. 
It was then generally reported that Mademoiselle de Villefort, the heiress of the Marquis and Marchioness of St. Moran, had regained the good graces of her grandfather, and that she would ultimately be in possession of an income of 300,000 livres. While all the proceedings relative to the dissolution of the marriage contract were being carried out at the house of M. de Villefort, Monte Cristo had paid his visit to the Count of Montcarf, who, in order to lose no time in responding to M. Danglars' wishes, and at the same time to pay all due difference to his position in society, donned his uniform of lieutenant general, which he ornamented with all his crosses, and thus attired, ordered his finest horses, and drove to the Rue de la Sault d'Antin. Danglars was balancing his monthly accounts, and it was perhaps not the most favorable moment for finding him in his best humor. At the first sight of his old friend, Danglars assumed his majestic air, and settled himself in the easy chair. Montcarf, usually so stiff and formal, accosted the banker in an affable and smiling manner, and feeling sure that the overture he was about to make would be well received, he did not consider it necessary to adopt any maneuvers in order to gain his end, but went at once straight to the point. "'Well, Baron,' said he, here I am at last. Some time has elapsed since our plans were formed, and they are not yet as executed. Montcarf paused at these words, quietly waiting until the cloud should have dispersed which gathered on the brow of Danglars, and which he attributed to his silence. But on the contrary, to his great surprise, it grew darker and darker. To what do you allude, Monsieur? said Danglars, as if he was trying in vain to guess the possible meaning of the general's words. Ah! said Montcarf. I see you are a stickler for forms, my dear sir, and you would remind me that the ceremonial rites should not be omitted. Ma foi, I beg your pardon, but as I have one son, and it is the first time I ever thought of marrying him, I am still serving my apprenticeship, you know. Come, I will reform. And Montcarf, with a forced smile, arose, and making a low bow to M. Douglas, said, Baron, I have the honor of asking you the hand of Mademoiselle Eugenie Danglars for my son the victim Alberte de Montcalf. But Danglars, instead of receiving this address in the favorable manner which Montcalf had expected, knit his brow, and without inviting the Count, who was still standing, to take a seat, he said, Monsieur, it will be necessary to reflect before I give you an answer. To reflect, said Montcalf, more and more astonished. Have you not had enough time for reflection during the eight years which have elapsed since this marriage was first discussed between us? Count, said the banker, things are constantly occurring in the world to induce us to lay aside our most established opinions, or at all events to cause us to remodel them according to the change of circumstances, which may have placed affairs in a totally different light to that in which we first viewed them. I do not understand you, Baron, said Montcar. What I mean to say is this, sir, that during the last fortnight unforeseen circumstances have occurred. Excuse me, said Montcar. But it is a play we are acting. A play? Yes, for it is like one. Pray let us come more to the point, and endeavor thoroughly to understand each other. That is my desire. You have seen M. de Monte Cristo, have you not? I see him very often, said Danglars, drawing himself up. He is a particular friend of mine. Well, in one of your late conversations with him, you said that I appeared to be forgetful and irresolute concerning this marriage, did you not? I did say so. Well, here I am, proving at once that I am really neither the one nor the other, by entreating you to keep your promise on that score. Danglars did not answer. Have you so soon changed your mind, added Moncarf, or have you only provoked my request that you may have the pleasure of seeing me humbled? Danglars seeing that if he continued the conversation in the same tone which he had begun it, the whole thing might turn out to be his own disadvantage, turned to Montcarf and said, Count, you must doubtless be surprised at my reserve, and I assure you that it cost me much to act in such a manner towards you. But believe me when I say that imperative necessity has imposed the painful task upon me. These are all so many empty words, my dear sir, said Montcarf. They may satisfy a new acquaintance, but the Comte de Moncurf does not rank in that list, and when a man like him comes to another, recalls him to his plighted word, and this man fails to redeem the pledge, he has at least a right to exact from him good reason for so doing. Danglars was a coward, but he did not wish to appear so. He was piqued at the tone which Moncurf had just assumed. I am not without good reason for my conduct, replied the banker. What do you mean to say? I mean to say that I have good reason, 
but that is difficult to explain. You must be aware, at all events, that it is impossible for me to understand motives before they explain to me. But one thing at least is clear, which is that you decline allying yourself with my family. No, sir, said Don Glars. I merely suspend my decision. That is all. And do you really flatter yourself that I shall yield to all your caprices and quietly and humbly await the time of again being received into your good graces? Then, Count, if you will not wait, we must look upon these projects as if they had never been entertained. The Count bit his lips until blood almost started, to prevent the ebullition of anger which his proud and irritable temper scarcely allowed him to restrain. Understanding, however, that in the present state of things the laugh would decidedly be against him, he turned from the door towards which he had been directing his steps, and again confronted the banker. A cloud settled on his brow, evincing decided anxiety and uneasiness, instead of the expression of offended pride which had lately reigned there. "'My dear Danglars,' said Montcarf, "'we have been acquainted for many years, and consequently we ought to make some allowance for each other's failings. You owe me an explanation, and really it is but fair that I should know what circumstances occurred you to deprive my son of your favor. It is from no personal ill feeling towards the Viscount. That is all I can say, sir, replied Danglars, who resumed his insolent manner as soon as he perceived that Montcarf was a little softened and calmed down. And towards whom you bear his personal ill feeling, then, said Montcarf, turning pale with anger. The expression of the Count's face had not remained unperceived by the banker. He fixed on him a look of greater assurance than before, and said, You may, perhaps, be better satisfied that I should not go further into particulars. A tremor of suppressed rage shook the whole frame of the Count, and making a violent effort over himself, he said, I have a right to insist on your giving me an explanation. Is it Madame de Montcarf who has displeased you? Is it my fortune which you find insufficient? Is it because my opinions differ from yours? Nothing of the kind, sir, replied Danglars. If such had been the case, I should only have been to blame, insomuch as I was aware of all these things when I made the engagement. No. I do not seek any longer to discover the reason. I really am quite ashamed to have been the cause of your undergoing such severe self-examination. Let us drop the subject, and adopt the middle course of delay, which implies neither a rupture nor an engagement. Ma foi, there is no hurry. My daughter is only seventeen years old, and your son twenty-one. While we wait, time will be progressing. Events will succeed each other. Things which in the evening look dark and obscure appear but too clearly in the light of morning, and sometimes the utterance of one word, or the lapse of a single day, will reveal the most cruel calumnies. Calumnies, did you say, sir? cried Montcalf, turning livid with rage. Does any one dare to slander me? Monsieur, I told them that I considered it best to avoid all explanations. Then, sir, am I patiently to submit to your refusal? Yes, sir. Although I assure you, the refusal is as painful for me to give as it is for you to receive, for I had reckoned on the honor of your alliance, and the breaking off of a marriage contract always injures the lady more than the gentleman. Enough, sir, said Montcarf. We will speak no more on the subject. And clutching his gloves in anger, he left the apartment. Danglars observed that during the whole conversation, Montcarf had never once dared to ask that it was on his own account that Danglars recalled his word. That evening, he had a long conference with several friends, and M. Cavalcanti, who had remained in the drawing room with the ladies, was the last to leave the banker's house. The next morning, as soon as he awoke, Danglars asked for the newspapers. They were brought to him. He laid aside three or four, and was at last fixed upon the impartial, the paper of which the Bucamp was the chief editor. He hastily tore off the cover, opened the journal with nervous precipitation, passed contemptuously over the Paris jottings, and arriving at the miscellaneous intelligence, stopped with a malicious smile. At a paragraph headed, We hear from Yanini. Very good, observed Danglars, after having read the paragraph. Here is a little article on Colonel Ferdinand, which, if I am not mistaken, would render the explanation which the Comte de, de Moncarf required of me perfectly unnecessary. At the same moment, that is, at nine o'clock in the morning, Albert de Moncarf, dressed in a black coat buttoned up to his chin, might have been walking with a quick and agitated step in the direction of Monte Cristo's house the Champs-Élysées. When he presented himself at the gate, the porter informed him that the Count had gone out about an hour previously. Did he take Baptiste in with him? No, my lord. Call him, then. I wish to speak with him. 
The concierge went to seek the valet de chambre, and returned with him in an instant. "'My good friend,' said Albert, "'I beg pardon for my intrusion, but I was anxious to know from your own mouth if your master was really out or not.' "'He is really out, sir,' replied Baptistin. "'Out, even to me?' "'I know how happy my master always is to receive the vicomte,' said Baptistin. "'and I should therefore never think of including him in any general order. "'You are right, and now I wish to see him on an affair of great importance. "'Do you think it will be long before he comes in?' "'No, I think not, for he ordered his breakfast at ten o'clock. "'Well, I will go and take a turn in the Champs Elysees, "'and at ten o'clock I will return here. "'Meanwhile, if the Count should come in, "'will you beg him not to go out again without seeing me?' "'You may depend on my doing so, sir,' said Baptistin. Albert left the cab in which he had come, the Count's door, intending to take a turn on foot. As he was passing the Elie de Vesuves, he thought he saw the Count's horses standing at Gosset's shooting gallery. As he approached and soon recognized the coachman. "'Is the Count shooting in the gallery?' said Montcarf. "'Yes, sir,' replied the coachman. While he was speaking, Albert had heard a report of two or three pistol shots. He entered, and on his way met the waiter. "'Excuse me, my lord,' said the lad. "'But will you not have the kindness to wait a moment?' "'For what, Philip?' asked Albert, who, being a constant visitor there, did not understand this opposition to his entrance. "'Because the person who is now in the gallery prefers being alone, and never practices in the presence of any one. "'Not even before you, Philip?' "'Then who loads his pistol?' "'His servant.' "'A Nubian?' "'A Negro. "'It is he, then. "'Do you know this gentleman?' Yes, and I am come to look for him. He is a friend of mine. Oh, that is quite another thing, then. I will go immediately and inform him of your arrival. And Philip, urged by his own curiosity, entered the gallery. A second afterwards, Monte Cristo appeared on the threshold. I ask your pardon, my dear Count, said Albert, for following you here, and I must tell you that it was not the fault of your servants that I did so. I alone am to blame for this indiscretion. I went to your house, and they told me you were out, that they expected you home at ten o'clock for breakfast. I was walking about in order to pass away the time until ten o'clock, when I caught sight of your carriage and horses. What you have just said induces me to hope that you intend breakfasting with me. No, thank you, I am thinking of other things besides breakfast just now. Perhaps we may take that meal at a later hour in worse company. What on earth are you talking of? I am to fight today. For what? I am going to fight. Yes, I understand that, but what is the quarrel? People fight for all sorts of reasons, you know. I, I, I fight in the cause of honor. Ah, that is something serious. So serious that I come to beg you to render me a service. What is it? To be, be my second. That is a serious matter, and we will not discuss it here. Let us speak of nothing until we get home. Ali, bring me some water. The Count turned up his sleeves passed into the little vestibule where the gentlemen were accustomed to wash their hands after shooting. "'Come in, my lord,' said Philippe in a low tone, "'and I will show you something draw.' Morcar Morcar entered, and in place of the usual target, he saw some playing cards fixed against the wall. At a distance, Albert thought it was a complete suit, for he counted from the ace to the ten. "'Aha!' said Albert. "'I see you were preparing for a game of cards.' "'No,' said the Count. "'I was making a suit.' How? said Albert. Those are really aces and twos which you see. My shots have turned them into threes, fives, sevens, eights, nines, and tens. Albert approached. In fact, the bullets had actually pierced the cards in the exact places where the painted signs would have been otherwise occupied, the lines and distances being as regular kept as if they had been ruled with pencil. Diable, said Morcoff. What would you have, my dear Viscount? said Monte Cristo, wiping his hands on the towel which Ali had brought him. I must occupy my leisure moments in some way or another. But come, I am waiting for you. Both men enter Monte Cristo's carriage, which in the course of a few minutes deposited them safely at number 30. Monte Cristo took Albert into his study, and pointing at a seat, placed another for himself. Now, let us talk of this matter quietly, said the Count. You see, I am perfectly composed, said Albert. With whom are you going to fight? With Bucamp. One of your friends? Of course, it is always with friends that one fights. I suppose you have some cause of quarrel. I have. 
What has he done to you? There appeared in his journal last night. But wait, and read for yourself. And Albert handed over the paper to which the Count, who read as follows. A correspondent at Yanina informs us of a fact which until now had remained in ignorance. The castle which formed the protection of the town is given up to the Turks by a French officer named Fernand, in whom the Grand Vizier, Ali Tepelini, had reposed the greatest confidence. Well, said Monte Cristo, what do you see in that to annoy you? What do I see in it? Yes, what does it signify to you if the castle of Yanina was given up by a French officer? It signifies to my father, the Count of Morcarf, whose Christian name is Fernand. Did your father serve under Ali Pasha? Yes, that is to say, he fought for the independence of the Greeks, and hence arises the calumny. Oh, my dear Viscount, do talk reason. I do not desire to do otherwise. Now just tell me who the devil should know in France that the officer Ferdinand and the Count of Morcarf are one and the same person. And who cares now about Yanina, which was taken as long ago as the year 1822 or 1823? That just shows the meanness of this slander. They have allowed all this time to elapse, and then all of a sudden rake up events which have been forgotten to furnish materials for scandal. In order to tarnish the luster of our high position, I, her and I inherit my father's name, and I do not choose that the shadow of disgrace should darken it. I am going to Bicamp, in whose journal this paragraph appears, and I shall assist on his retracting the assertion before two witnesses. Bicamp will never retract. Then he must fight. No, he will not, for he will tell you what is very true, that perhaps there were fifty officers in the Greek army bearing the same name. We will fight nevertheless. I will efface the blot on my father's character. My father, who was such a brave soldier, whose career was so brilliant, oh well, he will add, we are warranted in believing that this Fernard is not the same illustrious Count of Morcarf, who also bears the same Christian name. I am determined not to be content with anything short of an entire retraction. And you intend to make him do this in the presence of two witnesses, do you? Yes. You do wrong. Which means, I suppose, that you refuse the surface which I asked of you? You know my theory regarding duels. I told you my opinion on that subject, if you remember when we were at Rome. Nevertheless, my dear Count, I found you this morning engaged in an occupation but little consistent with the notions you profess to entertain. Because, my dear fellow, you can understand one must never be eccentric. If one's lot is to cast among fools, it is necessary to study folly. I shall perhaps find myself one day called out by some harebrained scamp, which has no more real cause of quarrel with me than you have with this Buchanan. He may take me to task for some foolish trifle or another. He will bring his witnesses, or will insult me in some public place, and I am expected to kill him for all that. You admit that you would fight, then? Well, if so, why do you object to my doing so? I do not say that you ought not to fight. I only say that a duel is a serious thing, and ought not to be undertaken without due reflection. Did he reflect before he insulted my father? If he spoke hastily, and oaths that he did so, you ought to be satisfied. You admit that you would fight, then? Well, if so, why do you object to my doing so? I do not say that you ought not to fight. I only say that a duel is a serious thing, and ought not to be undertaken without due reflection. Did he reflect before he insulted my father? If he spoke hastily, and owns that he did so, you ought to be satisfied. Ah, my dear Count, you are far too indulgent, and you are far too exacting. Supposing, for instance, and do not be angry at what I'm going to say, well, supposing the assertion to be really true, a son ought not to submit to such a stain on his father's honor. Ma foi, we live in times when there is much to which we must submit. That is precisely the fault of the age. And do you undertake to reform it? Yes, as far, as far as I am personally concerned. Well, you are indeed exacting, my dear fellow. Yes, I own it. Are you quite impervious to good advice? Not when it comes from a friend. And do you account me that title? Certainly I do. Well then, before going to Bucamp with your witnesses, seek further information on the subject. From whom? From Heidi. Why? What can be the use of mixing a woman up in the affair? What can she do in it? She can declare to you, for example, that your father had no hand whatever in the defeat and death of the vizier, or if by chance he had, indeed, misfortune too. I have told you, my dear Count, that I would not for one moment admit of such a proposition. You reject this means of information, then? 
I do, most decidedly. Then let me offer one more word of advice. Do so, then, but let it be the last. You do not wish to hear it, perhaps? On the contrary, I request it. Do not take any witnesses with you when you go to Buchamp. Visit him alone. That would be contrary to all custom. Your case is not an ordinary one. And what is your reason for advising me to go alone? Because then the affair will rest between you and Bucamp. Explain yourself. I will do so. If Bucamp be disposed to retract, you ought at least give him the opportunity of doing it of his own free will. The satisfaction to you will be the same. If, on the contrary, he refuses to do so, it will then be quite time to admit two strangers into your secret. They will not be strangers. They will be friends. Ah, but the friends of today are the enemies of tomorrow. Bucamp, for instance. So you recommend, I recommend you be prudent you advise me to go alone to Bucamp. I do, and I will tell you why. When you wish to obtain such concession from a man's self-love, you must avoid even the appearance of wishing to wound it. I believe you are right. I am glad of it. Then I will go alone. Go! But you would do better still by not going at all. That is impossible. Do so, then. It will be a wiser plan than the first which you proposed. But, if in spite of all my precautions I am at last obliged to fight, Will you not be my second? My dear Viscount, said Monte Cristo gravely, you must have seen before today that at all times and all places I have been at your disposal, that the service which you have just demanded me is one which is out of my power to render you. Why? Perhaps you may know at some future period, and in the meantime I request you excuse my declining to put you in possession of my reasons. Well then, I will have France and Chateau Renaud. They will be the very men for it. Do so then. But if I do fight, you will surely not object to giving me a lesson or two in shooting and fencing. That, too, is impossible. What a singular being you are! You will not interfere in anything. You are right. That is the principle on which I wish to act. We will say no more about it, then. Goodbye, Count. Moncup Morcarf took his hat and left the room. He found his carriage at the door, and doing his utmost to restrain his anger, he went at once to find Ducamp, who was in his office. It was a gloomy, dusty-looking apartment, such as journalist offices have always been from time immemorial. The servant announced M. de Albert Moncarf. Ducamp repeated the name to himself, as though he could scarcely believe that he had heard all right, and then gave orders for him to be admitted. Albert entered. Ducamp uttered an exclamation of surprise on seeing his friend leap over and trample underfoot all the newspapers which were strewed about this word. This way, this way, my dear Albert, said he, holding out his hand to the young man. Are you out of your senses, or do you come peaceably to take this breakfast with me? Try and find a seat. There is one by that geranium, which is the only thing in the room to remind me that there are other leaves in the world besides leaves of paper. Bucamp, said Albert, is it of your journal that I came to speak? Indeed. What do you wish to say about it? I desire that a statement contained in it should be rectified. To what do you refer? But pray sit down. Thank you, said Albert, with a cold and formal bow. Will you now have the kindness to explain the nature of the statement which has displeased you? An announcement has been made which implicates the honor of a member of my family. What is it? said Bucamp, much surprised. Surely you must be mistaken. The story you sent from Yanina. Y Yanina? Yes, really you appear to be totally ignorant of the cause which brings me here. Such is really the case, I assure you, upon my honor. Baptiste, give me yesterday's paper, cried Bucamp. Here, I have brought mine with me, replied Albert. Bucamp took the paper, and read the article to which Albert pointed in an undertone. You see, it is a serious annoyance, said Morcarf, when Bucamp had finished the perusal of the paragraph. Is the officer referred to as a relation of yours, then? demanded the journalist. Yes, said Albert, blushing. Well, what do you wish me to do for you, said Bucamp, mildly. My dear Bucamp, I wish for you to contradict this statement. Bucamp looked at Albert with a benevolent expression. Come, said he, this matter will want a good deal of talking over. Retraction is always a serious thing, you know. Sit down, and I will read it again. Albert resumed his seat, and Bucamp read, with more attention than at first, the lines denounced by his friend. Well, said Albert in a determined tone, you see that your paper has insulted a member of my family, and I insist on a retraction being made. You insist? Yes, I insist. Permit me to remind you that you are not in the chamber, my dear Viscount. Nor do I wish to be there, replied the young man, rising. I repeat that I am determined to have the announcement of yesterday contradicted. You have known me long enough. 
continued Albert, biting his lips convulsively, for he saw that Bucamp's anger was beginning to rise. You have been my friend, and therefore sufficiently intimate with me to be aware that I am likely to maintain my resolution on this point. If I had been your friend, Morcerf, your present manner of speaking would almost lead me to forget that I ever bore that title. But wait a moment. Do not let us get angry, or at least not yet. You are irritated and vexed. Tell me how this Bernard is related to you. He is merely my father, said Albert. M. Ferdinand Mondego, Count of Morcarf, an old soldier who has fought in twenty battles and whose honorable scars they would denounce as badges of disgrace. Is it your father? said Bucamp. That is quite another thing. Then well can understand your indignation, my dear Albert. I will look at it again, and he read the paragraph for the third, third time, laying a stress on each word as he proceeded. But the paper nowhere identifies this man, Fernand, with your father. No, but the connection will be seen by others, and therefore I will have the article contradicted. With the words, I will, Bucamp steadily raised his eyes to Albert's countenance, and then gradually lowering them, he remained thoughtful for a few moments. You will attract this assertion, will you not, Bucamp? said Albert, with increased, though stifled anger. Yes, replied Bucamp. Immediately, said Albert when I am convinced that the statement is false. What? The thing is worth looking into, and I will take pains to investigate the matter thoroughly. But what is there to investigate, sir, said Albert, enraged beyond measure at Bucomp's last remark. If you do not believe that it is my father, say so immediately, and if, on the contrary, you believe it to be him, state your reasons for doing so. Bucomp looked at Albert with the smile which was so peculiar to him, and which in its numerous modifications served to express every varied emotion of his mind. Sir, replied he, if you should come to me with the idea of demanding satisfaction, you should have gone with, at once to the point, and not have entertained me with the idle conversation to which I have been patiently listening to for the past half hour. When I put this construction on your visit? Yes, if you will not consent to retract that infamous calumny. Wait a moment. No threats. If you please, M. Fernard Montego, victim de Moncarf, I never allow them for my enemies, and therefore shall not put up with them for my friends. You insist on my contradicting the article relating to General Fernand, an article to which, I assure you on my word of honor, I had nothing whatever to do. Yes, I insist on it, said Albert, whose mind was beginning to get bewildered with the excitement of his feelings. And if I refuse to retract, you wish to fight, do you? said Bucamp in a calm tone. Yes, replied Albert, raising his voice. Well, said Bucamp, here's my answer, my dear sir. The article was not inserted by me. I am not even aware of it. But you have, by the step you have taken, called my attention to the paragraph in question, and it will remain until it has been either contradicted or confirmed by someone who has a right to do so. Sir, said Albert, rising, I will do myself the honor of sending my seconds to you, and you will be kind enough to arrange with them the place and meeting and the weapons. Certainly, my dear sir. And this evening, if you please, or tomorrow at the latest, we will meet. No, no, I will be on the ground at the proper time, but in my opinion. I have a right to dictate the preliminaries, as it is I who has received the provocation. In my opinion, the time ought not to be yet. I know you well skilled in the management of the sword, while I am only moderately so. I know, too, that you are a good marksman, that we were about equal. I know that a duel between us two would be a serious affair, because you are brave, and I am brave also. I do not, therefore, wish to kill you, or to be killed myself without a cause. Now I am going to put a question to you, and one very much to the purpose, too. Do you insist on this retractation as so far as to kill me if I do not make it, although I have repeated more than once, and affirmed on my honor, that I was ignorant of the thing which you charge me, and although I still declare that it is impossible for me, for any one of you, to recognize the Count of Morcorf, under the name of Fernand, I maintain my original resolution. Very well, my dear sir, then I consent to cut throats with you. But I require three weeks' preparation. At the end of that time I shall come and say to you, the assertion is false, and I retract it or the assertion is true, when I shall immediately draw the sword from its sheath, or the pistols from the case, whichever you please. Three weeks, cried Albert. They will pass as slowly as three centuries, when I am at all in time suffering dishonor. Had you continued to remain on the amicable terms with me, I should have said, Patience, my friend, but you have constituted yourself my enemy. Therefore I say, What does that signify to me, sir? Well then, let it be three weeks, then, said Morcarf, but remember at the expiration of that time, no delay or subterfuge will justify you in. M. Albert de Moncarf, said Bucamp, rising in his turn, I cannot throw you out of window for three weeks, that is to say, for twenty-four days to come, nor have any right to split my skull open till that time has elapsed. Today is the twenty-ninth of August. The twenty-first of September will, therefore, be the conclusion of the term agreed on, and 
until the time arrives, and is the advice of a gentleman, which I am about to give you. Till then we will refrain from growling and barking like two dogs chained within sight of each other. When he had concluded his speech, Bucomp bowed coldly to Albert, turned his back upon them, and went to the press room. Albert vented his anger on a pile of newspapers, which he sent flying all over the office by swishing them violently with his stick, after which ebullition he departed, not, however, without walking several times to the door of the press room, as if he had half a mind to enter, while Albert was lashing the front of his carriage in the same manner that he had the newspapers which were in the innocent agents of his discomfiture, as he was crossing the barrier, he perceived Morel, who was walking with a quick step and a bright eye. He was passing the Chinese baths, and appeared to have come from the direction of the port St. Martin, and was going towards the Madeleine. Ah, said Morcarf, there goes a happy man. It so happened, Albert was not mistaken in his opinion. End of chapter 78 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Aruna Rangarajan, Nashville, Tennessee. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 79 The Lemonade. Morel was, in fact, very happy. Monsieur Noirtier had just sent for him, and he was in such haste to know the reason of his doing so that he had not stopped to take a cab, placing infinitely more dependence on his own two legs than on the four legs of a cab horse. He had therefore set off at a furious rate from Rue Meslay, and was hastening with rapid strides in the direction of the Faubourg, St. Honoré. Morel advanced with a firm, manly tread, and poor Berois followed him as he best might. Morel was only thirty-one, Berois was sixty years of age. Morel was deeply in love, and Berois was dying with heat and exertion. These two men, thus opposed in age and interests, resembled two parts of a triangle, presenting the extremes of separation, yet nevertheless possessing their point of union. This point of union was not the air and it was he who had just sent for Morel, with the request that the latter would lose no time in coming to him, a command which Morel obeyed to the letter, to the great discomfiture of Berois. On arriving at the house, Morel was not even out of breath, for love lends wings to our desires, but Berois, who had long forgotten what it was to love, was sorely fatigued by the expedition he had been constrained to use. The old servant introduced Morel by a private entrance, closed the door of the study, and soon the rustling of a dress announced the arrival of Valentine. She looked marvellously beautiful in her deep mourning dress, and Morel experienced such intense delight in gazing upon her that he felt as if he could almost have dispensed with the conversation of her grandfather. But the easy chair of the old man was heard rolling along the floor, and he soon made his appearance in the room. Noirtier acknowledged by a look of extreme kindness and benevolence the thanks which Morel lavished on him for his timely intervention on behalf of Valentine and himself, an intervention which had saved them from despair. Morel then cast on the invalid an interrogative look as to the new favour which he designed to bestow on him. Valentine was sitting at a little distance from them, timidly awaiting the moment when she should be obliged to speak. Noirtier fixed his eyes on her. "'Am I to say what you told me?' asked Valentine. Noirtier made a sign that she was to do so. "'Monsieur Morel,' said Valentine to the young man, who was regarding her with the most intense interest. "'My grandfather, Monsieur Noirtier, had a thousand things to say, which he told me three days ago, and now he has sent for you, that I may repeat them to you. I will repeat them, then.' and since he has chosen me as his interpreter, I will be faithful to the trust and will not alter a word of his intentions. Oh, I am listening with the greatest impatience, replied the young man. Speak, I beg of you. Valentine cast down her eyes. This was a good omen for Morel, for he knew that nothing but happiness could have the power of thus overcoming Valentine. My grandfather intends leaving this house, said she and Berois is looking out suitable apartments for him in another. But you, Mademoiselle de Villefort, you who are necessary to Monsieur Noirtier's happiness. I, interrupted Valentine, I shall not leave my grandfather. That is an understood thing between us. My apartment will be close to his. Now Monsieur de Villefort must either give me his consent to this plan or his refusal. 
In the first case, I shall leave directly, and in the second, I shall wait till I am of age, which will be in about ten months. Then I shall be free. I shall have an independent fortune. And, and what? demanded Morel. And with my grandfather's consent, I shall fulfill the promise which I have made you. Valentine pronounced these last few words in such a low tone that nothing but Morel's intense interest in what she was saying could have enabled him to hear them. "'Have I not explained your wishes, Grandpapa?' said Valentine, addressing Noirtier. "'Yes,' looked the old man. "'Once under my grandfather's roof, Monsieur Morel can visit me in the presence of my good and worthy protector, if we still feel that the union we contemplated will be likely to ensure our future comfort and happiness.' In that case, I shall expect Monsieur Morel to come and claim me at my own hands. But alas, I have heard it said that hearts inflamed by obstacles to their desire grew cold in time of security. I trust we shall never find it so in our experience. Oh, cried Morel, almost tempted to throw himself on his knees before Noirtier and Valentine, and to adore them as two superior beings. What have I ever done in my life to merit such unbounded happiness? Until that time, continued the young girl in a calm and self-possessed tone of voice, we will conform to circumstances and be guided by the wishes of our friends so long as those wishes do not tend finally to separate us in a word. And I repeat it, because it expresses all I wish to convey. We will wait. And I swear to make all the sacrifices which this word imposes, sir, said Morel, not only with resignation, but with cheerfulness. Therefore, continued Valentine, looking playfully at Massimilian, no more inconsiderate actions, no more rash projects, for you surely would not wish to compromise one who from this day regards herself as destined honourably and happily to bear your name. Morel looked obedience to her commands. Noirtier regarded the lovers with a look of ineffable tenderness, while Barrois, who had remained in the room in the character of a man privileged to know everything that passed, smiled on the youthful couple as he wiped the perspiration from his bald forehead. "'How hot you look, my good Barrois," said Valentine. "'Ah, I have been running very fast, mademoiselle, but I must do Monsieur Morel the justice to say that he ran still faster.' Noirtier directed their attention to a waiter, on which was placed a decanter containing lemonade and a glass. The decanter was nearly full, with the exception of a little, which had been already drunk by Monsieur Noirtier. "'Come, Berois,' said the young girl. "'Take some of this lemonade. I see you are coveting a good draught of it.' "'The fact is, mademoiselle,' said Berois, "'I am dying with thirst, and since you are so kind as to offer it me, I cannot say I should at all object to drinking your health in a glass of it. Take some, then, and come back immediately. Barois took away the waiter, and hardly was he outside the door, which in his haste he forgot to shut. Then they saw him throw back his head and empty to the very dregs of the glass which Valentine had filled. Valentine and Morel were exchanging their adieu in the presence of Noirtier when a ring was heard at the doorbell. It was the signal of a visit. Valentine looked at her watch. "'It is past noon,' said she, "'and today is Saturday. "'I dare say it is the doctor, Grandpapa.' Nautier looked his conviction that she was right in her supposition. "'He will come in here, and Monsieur Morel had better go. "'Do you not think so, Grandpapa?' "'Yes,' signed the old man. "'Berrois!' cried Valentine. "'Berrois! I am coming, mademoiselle,' replied he. Berrois will open the door for you, said Valentine, addressing Morel. And now remember one thing, Monsieur Officer, that my grandfather commands you not to take any rash or ill-advised step which would be likely to compromise our happiness. I promised him to wait, replied Morel, and I will wait. At this moment, Berrois entered. Who rang? asked Valentine. Dr. de Avrini, said Berrois, staggering as if he would fall. "'What is the matter, Berrois? said Valentine. The old man did not answer, but looked at his master with wild, staring eyes, while with his cramped hand he grasped a piece of furniture to enable him to stand upright. "'He is going to fall!' cried Morel. The rigours which had attacked Berrois gradually increased. The features of the face became quite altered, 
and the convulsive movement of the muscles appeared to indicate the approach of a most serious nervous disorder. Noirtier, seeing Barois in this pitiable condition, showed by his looks all the various emotions of sorrow and sympathy which can animate the heart of man. Barois made some steps towards his master. "'Ah, sir!' said he. "'Tell me what is the matter with me. I am suffering. I cannot see. A thousand fiery darts are piercing my brain. Ah, don't touch me, pray don't!' By this time his haggard eyes had the appearance of being ready to start from their sockets. His head fell back, and the lower extremities of the body began to stiffen. Valentine uttered a cry of horror. Morel took her in his arms as if to defend her from some unknown danger. "'Monsieur Devrini! Monsieur Devrini!' cried she in a stifled voice. "'Help! Help!' Berois turned round and with a great effort stumbled a few steps then fell at the feet of Moitier, and resting his hand on the knee of the invalid, exclaimed, My master! My good master! At this moment, Monsieur de Villefort, attracted by the noise, appeared on the threshold. Morel relaxed his hold of Valentine, and retreating to a distant corner of the room, remained half hidden behind a curtain. Pale as if he had been gazing on a serpent, he fixed his terrified eye on the agonized sufferer. Noirtier, burning with impatience and terror, was in despair at his utter inability to help his old domestic, whom he regarded more in the light of a friend than a servant. One might, by the fearful swelling of the veins on his forehead and the contraction of the muscles around the eye, trace the terrible conflict which was going on between the living energetic mind and the inanimate and helpless body. Barois, his features convulsed, his eyes suffused with blood, and his head thrown back was lying at full length, beating the floor with his hands while his legs had become so stiff that they looked as if they would break rather than bend. A slight appearance of foam was visible around the mouth, and he breathed painfully and with extreme difficulty. Villefort seemed stupefied with astonishment and remained gazing intently on the scene before him without uttering a word. He had not seen Morel. After a moment of dumb contemplation, during which his face became pale, and his hair seemed to stand on end. He sprang towards the door, crying out, Doctor! Doctor! Come instantly! Pray come! Madame! Madame! cried Valentine, calling her stepmother and running upstairs to meet her. Come quick! Quick! And bring your bottle of smelling salts with you. What is the matter? cried Madame de Villefort in a harsh and constrained tone. Oh, come! Come! "'But where is the doctor?' exclaimed Villefort. "'Where is he?' Madame de Villefort now deliberately descended the staircase. In one hand she held her handkerchief, with which she appeared to be wiping her face, and in the other a bottle of English smelling salts. Her first look on entering the room was at Noirtier, whose face, independent of the emotion which such a scene could not fail of producing, proclaimed him to be in possession of his usual health. Her second glance was at the dying man. She turned pale, and her eye passed quickly from the servant and rested on the master. "'In the name of heaven, madame,' said Villefort, "'where is the doctor? He was with you just now. You see, this is a fit of apoplexy, and he might be saved if he could but be bled.' "'Has he eaten anything lately?' asked madame de Villefort, eluding her husband's question. "'Madame,' replied Valentine, "'he has not even breakfasted.' He has been running very fast on an errand with which my grandfather charged him, and when he returned, took nothing but a glass of lemonade. Ah, said Madame de Villefort, why did he not take wine? Lemonade was a very bad thing for him. Grandpapa's bottle of lemonade was standing just by his side. Poor Berois was very thirsty and was thankful to drink anything he could find. Madame de Villefort started. Noirtier looked at her with a glance of the most profound scrutiny. "'He has such a short neck,' said she. "'Madame,' said Villefort, "'I ask, where is Monsieur Dervrini? In God's name, answer me.' "'He is with Edward, who is not quite well,' replied Madame de Villefort, no longer being able to avoid answering. Villefort rushed upstairs to fetch him. "'Take this,' said Madame de Villefort, giving her smelling bottle to Valentine. They will, no doubt, bleed him. Therefore I will retire, for I cannot endure the sight of blood. And she followed her husband upstairs. 
Morel now emerged from his hiding place, where he had remained quite unperceived. So great had been the general confusion. Go away as quick as you can, Maximilian, said Valentine, and stay till I send for you. Go! Morel looked towards Noirtier for permission to retire. The old man, who had preserved all his usual coolness, made a sign to him to do so. The young man pressed Valentine's hand to his lips and then left the house by a back staircase. At the same moment that he quitted the room, Villefort and the doctor entered by an opposite door. Barrois was now showing signs of returning consciousness. The crisis seemed past. A low moaning was heard, and he raised himself on one knee. D'Avrigny and Villefort laid him on the couch. "'What do you prescribe, doctor?' demanded Villefort. "'Give me some water and ether. You have some in the house, have you not?' Yes. Send for some oil of turpentine and tartar emetic. Villefort immediately dispatched a messenger. And now let everyone retire. Must I go too? asked Valentine timidly. Yes, mademoiselle, you especially, replied the doctor abruptly. Valentine looked at Monsieur Tavrini with astonishment, kissed her grandfather on the forehead and left the room. The doctor closed the door after her with a gloomy air. "'Look, look, doctor,' said Villefort. "'He is quite coming round again. "'I really do not think, after all, it is anything of consequence.' "'Monsieur d'Avrigny answered by a melancholy smile. "'How do you feel, Barois? asked he. "'A little better, sir. "'Will you drink some of this ether and water?' "'I will try, but don't touch me. "'Why not? "'Because I feel that if you were only to touch me with the tip of your finger, "'the fit would return.' drink. Barois took the glass and raising it to his purple lips took about half of the liquid offered to him. Where do you suffer? asked the doctor. Everywhere. I feel cramps over my whole body. Do you find any dazzling sensation before the eyes? Yes. And any noise in the ears? Frightful. When did you first feel that? Just now. Suddenly? Yes, like a clap of thunder. Did you feel nothing of it yesterday or the day before? Nothing. No drowsiness? None. What have you eaten today? I have eaten nothing. I only drank a glass of my master's lemonade. That is all. And Barois turned towards Noirtier, who, immovably fixed in his armchair, was contemplating this terrible scene without allowing a word or a movement to escape him. Where is this lemonade? asked the doctor eagerly. Downstairs, in the decanter. Where about downstairs? In the kitchen. Shall I go fetch it, doctor? inquired Villefort. No, stay here and try to make Barois drink the rest of this glass of ether and water. I will go myself and fetch the lemonade. Davrini bounded towards the door, flew down the back stairs and almost knocked down Madame de Villefort in his haste, who was herself going down to the kitchen. She cried out, but Davrini paid no attention to her possessed with but one idea. He cleared the last four steps with a bound and rushed into the kitchen, where he saw the decanter, about three parts empty and still standing on the waiter, where it had been left. He darted upon it as an eagle would seize upon its prey. Panting with loss of breath, he returned to the room he had just left. Madame de Villefort was slowly ascending the steps which led to her room. "'Is this the decanter you spoke of?' asked Davrini. Yes, doctor. Is this the same lemonade of which you partook? I believe so. What did it taste like? It had a bitter taste. The doctor poured some drops of the lemonade into the palm of his hand and put his lips to it, and after having rinsed his mouth as a man does when he is tasting wine, he spat the liquor into the fireplace. It is no doubt the same, said he. Did you drink some too, Monsieur Noirtier? Yes. And did you discover a bitter taste? Yes. Oh, doctor, cried Barois, the fit is coming on again. Oh, do something for me. The doctor flew to his patient. That emetic, Villefort, see if it is coming. Villefort sprang into the passage, exclaiming, The emetic, the emetic, is it come yet? No one answered. The most profound terror reigned throughout the house. If I had anything by means of which I could inflate the lungs, said Davrini, looking around him. Perhaps I might prevent suffocation, but there is nothing which would do, nothing. 
Oh, sir, cried Berwa, are you going to let me die without help? Oh, I am dying. Oh, save me. A pen, a pen, said the doctor. There was one lying on the table. He endeavoured to introduce it into the mouth of the patient, who, in the midst of his convulsions, was making vain attempts to warm it. But the jaws were so clinched that the pen could not pass them. This second attack was much more violent than the first, and he had slipped from the couch to the ground, where he was writhing in agony. The doctor left him in this paroxysm, knowing that he could do nothing to alleviate it, and going up to Noirtier, said abruptly, "'How do you find yourself? Well?' "'Yes. Have you any weight on the chest, or does your stomach feel light and comfortable, eh?' "'Yes. Then you feel pretty much as you generally do after you have had the dose which I am accustomed to give you every Sunday?' "'Yes. Did Berois make your lemonade?' "'Yes.' Was it you who asked him to drink some of it? No. Was it Monsieur de Villefort? No. Madame? No. It was your granddaughter then, was it not? Yes. A groan from Berois, accompanied by a yawn which seemed to crack the very jawbones, attracted the attention of Monsieur d'Avrigny. He left Monsieur Noirtier and returned to the sick man. Berois, said the doctor, can you speak? Barois muttered a few unintelligible words. "'Try and make an effort to do so, my good man,' said Davrini. Barois reopened his bloodshot eyes. "'Who made the lemonade?' "'I did. Did you bring it to your master directly? It was made?' "'No. You left it somewhere then in the meantime?' "'Yes, I left it in the pantry because I was called away.' "'Who brought it into this room then?' "'Mademoiselle Valentine.' Davrini struck his forehead with his hand. "'Gracious heaven!' exclaimed he. "'Doctor, doctor!' cried Barois, who felt another fit coming. "'Will they never bring that emetic?' asked the doctor. "'Here is a glass with one already prepared,' said Villefort, entering the room. "'Who prepared it?' "'The chemist who came here with me.' "'Drink it,' said the doctor to Barois. "'Impossible, doctor. It is too late. My throat is closing up. I am choking. Oh, my heart! Ah, my head! Oh, what agony! Shall I suffer like this long?' "'No, no, friend,' replied the doctor. "'You will soon cease to suffer.' "'Ah, I understand you,' said the unhappy man. "'My God, have mercy upon me.' And uttering a fearful cry, Berois fell back as if he had been struck by lightning. Davrini put his hands to his heart and placed a glass before his lips. "'Well,' said Villefort, "'go to the kitchen and get me some syrup of violets.' Villefort went immediately. Do not be alarmed, Monsieur Noirtier, said Davrini. I am going to take my patient into the next room to bleed him. This sort of attack is very frightful to witness. And taking Berois under the arms, he dragged him into the adjoining room. But almost immediately he returned to fetch the lemonade. Noirtier closed Lid's right eye. You want Valentine, do you not? I will tell them to send her to you. Villefort returned, and Davrini met him in the passage. Well? How is he now? asked he. Come in here, said Davrini, and he took him into the chamber where the sick man lay. Is he still in a fit? said the procurer. He is dead. Villefort drew back a few steps, and clasping his hands exclaimed with real amazement and sympathy, Dead! And so soon, too! Yes, it is very soon, said the doctor, looking at the corpse before him. But that ought not to astonish you. Monsieur and Madame de saint Mirin died as soon. People die very suddenly in your house, Monsieur de Villefort. What? cried the magistrate with an accent of horror and consternation. Are you still harping on the terrible idea? Still, sir, and I shall always do so, replied Davrini, for it has never for one instant ceased to retain possession of my mind, and that you may be quite sure I am not mistaken this time. Listen well to what I am going to say, Monsieur de Villefort. The magistrate trembled convulsively. There is a poison which destroys life almost without leaving any perceptible traces. I know it well. I have studied it in all its forms and in the effects which it produces. I recognize the presence of this poison in the case of poor Berois as well as in that of Madame de saint Marin. There is a way of detecting its presence. It restores the blue color of litmus paper reddened by an acid and it turns syrup of violets green. We have no litmus paper, 
But see, here they come with a syrup of violets. The doctor was right. Steps were heard in the passage. Monsieur Davrini opened the door and took from the hands of the chambermaid a cup which contained two or three spoonfuls of the syrup. He then carefully closed the door. Look, he said to the procurer, whose heart beat so loudly that it might almost be heard. Here is in this cup some syrup of violets, and this decanter contains the remainder of the lemonade, of which Monsieur Nautier and Barrois partook. If the lemonade be pure and inoffensive, the syrup will retain its color. If, on the contrary, the lemonade be drugged with poison, the syrup will become green. Look closely. The doctor then slowly poured some drops of the lemonade from the decanter into the cup, and in an instant a light, cloudy sediment began to form at the bottom of the cup. This sediment first took a blue shade, then from the color of sapphire it passed to that of opal, and from opal to emerald. Arrived at this last hue, it changed no more. The result of the experiment left no doubt whatever on the mind. The unfortunate Barois has been poisoned, said Davrini, and I will maintain this assertion before God and man. Villefort said nothing, but he clasped his hands, opened his haggard eyes, and overcome with his emotion, sank into a chair. End of chapter 79
I fear an attack myself after all these disasters. Oh, man, murdered D'Avergne, the most selfish of all animals, the most personal of all creatures, who believes the earth turns, the sun shines, and death strikes for him alone, an ant cursing God from the top of a blade of grass. And those who have lost their lives lost nothing? M. de saint Moran, Madame de saint Moran, M. Nautier. How? M. Nautier? Yes. Think it was the poor servant's life was coveted? No, no, like Shakespeare's Polonius, he died for another. It was Nortier the lemonade was intended for. It is Nortier, logically speaking, who drank it. The other drank it only by accident, and although Barois is dead, it was Nortier whose death was wished for. But, but why did it not kill my father? I told you one evening in the garden after Madame de saint Morin's death, because his system is accustomed to that very poison, and the dose was trifling to him which would be fatal to another, because no one knows, not even the assassin, that for the last twelve months I have given M. Nortier brucine for his paralytic affection, while the assassin is not ignorant, and for he has proved that brucine is a violent poison. Oh, have pity, have pity, murmured Villefort, wringing his hands. Follow the culprit's steps. He first kills M. de saint Moran. Oh, doctor! I would swear to it, what I heard of his systems agrees too well with what I have seen in other cases. Villefort ceased to contend. He only groaned. He first kills M. de saint Moran, repeated the doctor, then Madame de saint Moran, a double fortune to inherit. Villefort wiped the perspiration from his forehead. Listen attentively. Uh, 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 alas, stammered Villefort, I do not lose a single word. M. Nortier resumed M. d'Avigné in the same pitiless tone. M. Nortier had once made a will against you, against your family, in favor of the poor. In fact, M. Nortier is spared, because nothing is expected from him. But he has no sooner destroyed his first will and made a second, than for fear he should make a third, he is struck down. The will was made the day before yesterday, I believe. You see, there has been no time lost. Oh, mercy, M. d'Avigné! No mercy, sir! The physician has a sacred mission on earth, and to fulfill it, he begins at the source of life, and goes down to the mysterious darkness of the tomb. And when crime has been committed, and God, doubtless in anger, turns away his face, it is for the physician to bring the culprit to justice. Have mercy on my child, sir, murmured Villefort. You see, it is yourself who have first named her. You, her father. Have pity on Valentine. Listen. It is impossible. I would as willingly accuse myself, Valentine, whose heart is pure as a diamond or a lily. No pity, procurer. The crime is fragment. Mademoiselle herself picked all the medicines which were sent to M. de saint Moran, and M. de saint Moran is dead. Mademoiselle de Villefort prepared all the cooling draughts which Madame de saint Moran took, and Madame de saint Moran is dead. Mademoiselle de Villefort took from the hands of Barros, who was sent out the lemonade to which... M. Nortier had every morning, and he has escaped by a miracle. Mademoiselle de Villefort is the culprit. She is the poisoner. To you, as the king's attorney, I denounce Mademoiselle de Villefort. Do your duty. Doctor, I can resist no longer. I can no longer defend myself. I believe you, but for pity's sake, spare my life, my honor. M. de Villefort, replied the doctor with increased vehemence. There are occasions when I dispense with all foolish human circumspection. If your daughter had committed only one crime, and I saw her meditating another, I would say, warn her, punish her. Let her pass the remainder of her life in a convent, weeping and praying. If she had committed two crimes, I would say, here, M. de Villefort, is a poison that the prisoner is not acquainted with, one that has no known antidote, quick as thought, rapid as lightning, mortal as the thunderbolt. Give her that poison, recommending her soul to God, and save your honor and your life. For it is yours she aims at, and I can picture her approaching your pillow with her hypocritical smiles and her sweet exhortations. Woe to you, M. de Villefort, if you do not strike first. This is what I would say if she had only killed two persons, but she has seen three deaths, has contemplated three murdered persons, has knelt by three corpses, to the scaffold with the poisoner, to the scaffold. Do you talk of your honor? Do what I tell you, and immortality awaits you. Villefort fell upon his knees. 
Listen, said he, I have not the strength of mind you have, or rather that which you would not have. If instead of my daughter, Valentine, your daughter Madeline, were concerned, the doctor turned pale. Doctor, every son of woman is born to suffer and die. I am content to suffer and await death. Beware, said M. d'Avergne. It may come slowly. You will see it approach after having struck your father, your wife, perhaps your son. Villefort, suffocating, pressed the doctor's arm. Listen, cried he. Pity me. Help me. No, my daughter is not guilty. If you drag us both before a tribunal, I will still say, No, my daughter is not guilty. There is no crime in my house. I will not acknowledge a crime in my house. For when a crime enters a dwelling, it is like death. It does not come alone. Listen, what does it signify to you if I am murdered? Are you my friend? Are you a man? Have you a heart? No, you are a physician. Well, I will tell you not to drag my daughter before a tribunal and give her up to the executioner. The bare idea would kill me, would drive me like a magman to dig my heart out with my fingernails. And if you were aware I'm mistaken, doctor, if it were not my daughter, if I should come one day, pell as a specter, and to say to you, Assassin, you have killed my child. Hold! If that should happen, though I am a Christian, M. D. Evergnay, I should kill myself. Well, said the doctor, after a moment's silence, I will wait. Villefort looked at him as if he had doubted his words. Only, continued M. D. Avergne, with a slow and solemn tone, if any one falls ill in your house, if you feel yourself attacked, do not send for me, for I will come no more. I will consent to share this dreadful secret with you, but I will not allow shame and remorse to grow and increase in my conscience, as crime and misery will in your house. Then you abandon me, doctor? Yes, for I can follow you no farther, and I only stop at the foot of the scaffold. Some further discovery will be made, which will bring this dreadful tragedy to a close. Adieu. I entreat you, doctor. All the horrors that disturb my thoughts make your house odious and fatal. Adieu, sir. One word. One single word more, doctor. You go, leaving me in all the horror of my situation, after increasing it by what you have real revealed to me. But what will be reported of the sudden death of the poor old servant? True, said M. Evergnay. We will return. The doctor went out first, followed by M. de Villefort. The terrified servants were on the stairs and in the passage where the doctor would pass. Sir, said M. said de Avignay to Villefort, so loud that all might hear, poor Barreau has led too sedentary a life of late, accustomed formerly to ride on horseback or in the carriage to the four corners of the Europe. The monotonous walk around that armchair has killed him. His blood has thickened. He was stout, had a short, thick neck. He was attacked with apoplexy, and I was called in too late. By the way, added he in a low tone, take care to throw away that cup of syrup and violets in the ashes. The doctor, without shaking hands with Villefort, without adding a word to what he said, went out, amid the tears and lamentations of the whole household. The same evening, all Villefort's servants, who had assembled in the kitchen and had a long consultation, came to tell Madame de Villefort that they wished to leave. No entreaty, no proposition of increased wages could induce them to remain. To every argument they replied, We must go, for death is in this house. They all left, in spite of prayers and entreaties, testifying their regret to leaving so good a master and mistress, and especially Mademoiselle Valentine, so good, so kind, and so gentle. Villefort looked at Valentine as they said this. She was in tears, and, strange as it was, in spite of the emotion she felt at the sight of those tears, he looked also at Madame de Villefort, and it appeared to him as if a slight gloomy smile had passed her thin lips, like a meteor scene pass passing inauspiciously between two clouds in a stormy sky. End of chapter 80. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 81. THE ROOM OF THE RETIRED BAKER The evening of the day on which the Count of Morcerf had left Danglars' house, with feelings of shame and anger at the rejection of the projected alliance, M. Andrea Calvicanti, with curled hair, moustaches in perfect order, and white gloves which fitted admirably, had entered the courtyard of the banker's house in La Chaux d'Antin. He had not been more than ten minutes in the drawing-room, before he drew Danglars aside into the recess of a bow-window, and, after an ingenious preamble, 
related to him all his anxieties and cares since his noble father's departure. He acknowledged the extreme kindness which had been shown him by the banker's family in which he had been received as a son, and where, besides, his warmest affections had found an object on which to centre in Mademoiselle Danglars. Danglars listened with the most profound attention. He had expected this declaration for the last two or three days, and when at last it came, his eyes glistened as much as they had lowered on listening to Morcerf. He would not, however, yield immediately to the young man's request, but made a few conscientious objections. "'Are you not rather young, Monsieur Andrea, to think of marrying?' "'I think not, sir,' said Monsieur Cavalcante. "'In Italy the nobility generally marry young. Life is so uncertain that we ought to secure happiness while it is within our reach.' "'Well, sir,' said Danglars, "'in case your proposals, which do me honour, are accepted by my wife and daughter, by whom shall the preliminary arrangements be settled?' So important a negotiation should, I think, be conducted by the respective fathers of the young people. Sir, my father is a man of great foresight and prudence. Thinking that I might wish to settle in France, he left me at his departure, together with the papers establishing my identity, a letter promising, if he approved of my choice, a hundred and fifty thousand livres per annum from the day I was married. So far as I can judge, I suppose this to be a quarter of my father's revenue." I, said Danglars, have always intended giving my daughter five hundred thousand francs as her dowry. She is, besides, my sole heiress. All would then be easily arranged if the baroness and her daughter are willing. We should command an annuity of a hundred and seventy-five thousand livres. Supposing, also, I should persuade the Marquis to give me my capital, which is not likely, but still it's possible, we would place these two or three millions in your hands, whose talent might make it realize ten per cent. I never give more than four per cent, and generally only three and a half, but to my son-in-law I would give five, and we would share the profit. Very good, father-in-law, said Cavalcante, yielding to his low-born nature, which would escape sometimes, through the aristocratic gloss with which he sought to conceal it. Correcting himself immediately, he said, Excuse me, sir, hope alone almost makes me mad. What will not reality do? But, said Danglars, who on his part did not perceive how soon the conversation, which at first was disinterested, was turning to a business transaction, there is doubtless a part of your fortune your father could not refuse you. Which, said the young man, that you inherit from your mother. Truly, from my mother, Leonora Corsinari, how much may it amount to? Indeed, sir, said Andrea, I assure you I have never given this subject a thought, but I suppose it must have been at least two millions. Danglars felt as much overcome with joy as the miser who finds a lost treasure, or as the shipwrecked mariner who feels himself on solid ground, instead of in the abyss which he expected would swallow him. "'Well, sir,' said Andrea, bowing to the banker respectfully, "'may I hope?' "'You may not only hope,' said Danglars, "'but consider it a settled thing, if no obstacle arises on your part.' "'I am indeed rejoiced,' said Andrea." But, said Danglars thoughtfully, how is it that your patron, M. de Monte Cristo, did not make his proposal for you? Andrea blushed imperceptibly. I have just left the Count, sir, said he. He is doubtless a delightful man, but inconceivably peculiar in his ideas. He esteems me highly. He even told me he had not the slightest doubt that my father would give me the capital instead of the interest of my property. He has promised to use his influence to obtain it for me but he also declared that he never had taken on himself the responsibility of making proposals for another, and he never would. I must, however, do him the justice to add that he assured me if he had ever regretted the repugnance he felt to such a step it was on this occasion, because he thought the projected union would be a happy and suitable one. Besides, if he will do nothing officially, he will answer any questions you propose to him. And now, continued he, with one of his most charming smiles, Having finished talking to the father-in-law, I must address myself to the banker. And what may you have to say to him, said Danglars, laughing in his turn, that the day after to-morrow I shall have to draw upon you for about four thousand francs, but the Count, expecting my bachelor's revenue could not suffice for the coming month's outlay, has offered me a draft for twenty thousand francs. It bears his signature, as you see, which is all sufficient. Bring me a million such as that, said Danglars, I shall be well pleased, putting the draft in his pocket. Fix your own hour for to-morrow, and my cashier shall call on you with a cheque for eighty thousand francs. At ten o'clock, then, if you please, I should like it early, as I am going to the country to-morrow. Very well, at ten o'clock. 
You are still at the Hotel des Princes? Yes. The following morning, with the banker's usual punctuality, the eighty thousand francs were placed in the young man's hands as he was on the point of starting, after having left two hundred francs for Caderousse. He went out chiefly to avoid this dangerous enemy, and returned as late as possible in the evening. But scarcely had he stepped out of his carriage when the porter met him with a parcel in his hand. Sir, he said, that man has been here. What man? said Andrea carelessly, apparently forgetting him, whom he but too well recollected. Him to whom your excellency pays that little annuity. Oh, said Andrea, my father's old servant. Well, you gave him the two hundred francs I left for him. Yes, your excellency. Andrea had expressed a wish to be thus addressed. But, continued the porter, he would not take them. Andrea turned pale, but as it was dark his pallor was not perceptible. What, he would not take them? He said he with slight emotion. No, he wished to speak to your excellency. I told him you were gone out, and after some dispute he believed me, and gave me this letter, which he had brought with him already sealed. Give it me, said Andrea, and he read by the light of his carriage lamp. You know where I live. I expect you to-morrow morning at nine o'clock. Andrea examined it carefully, to ascertain if the letter had been opened, or if any indiscreet eyes had seen its contents but it was so carefully folded that no one could have read it, and the seal was perfect. "'Very well,' said he. "'Poor man, he is a worthy creature.' He left the porter to ponder on these words, not knowing which to most admire, the master or the servant. "'Take out the horses quickly, and come up to me,' said Andrea to his groom. In two seconds the young man had reached his room and burnt Caderousse's letter. The servant entered just as he had finished. "'You are about my height, Pierre,' said he. I have that honour, Your Excellency. You had a new livery yesterday? Yes, sir. I have an engagement with a pretty little girl for this evening, and I do not wish to be known. Lend me your livery till to-morrow. I may sleep, perhaps, at an inn. Pierre obeyed. Five minutes after, Andrea left the hotel, completely disguised, took a cabriolet, and ordered the driver to take him to the Cheval Rouge at Pipcas. The next morning he left that inn as he had left the Hotel des Princes without being noticed, walked down the Faubourg Saint Antoine, along the boulevard to Rue Menilmontant, and stopping at the door of the third house on the left, looked for some one of whom to make inquiry in the porter's absence. For whom are you looking, my fine fellow? asked the fruiteress on the opposite side. Monsieur Pelletin, if you please, my good woman, replied Andrea. A retired baker? asked the fruiteress. Exactly. He lives at the end of the yard, on the left, on the third story. Andrea went as she directed him, and on the third floor he found a hare's paw, which, by the hasty ringing of the bell, it was evident he pulled with considerable ill-temper. A moment after, Caderousse's face appeared at the grating in the door. "'Ah, you are punctual,' said he, as he drew back the door. "'Confound you and your punctuality,' said Andrea, throwing himself into a chair, in a manner which implied that he would rather have flung it at the head of his host. "'Come, come, my little fellow, don't be angry. See, I have thought about you. Look at the good breakfast we are going to have. Nothing but what you are fond of.' Andrea, indeed, inhaled the scent of something cooking, which was not unwelcome to him, hungry as he was. It was that mixture of fat and garlic peculiar to provincial kitchens of an inferior order, added to that of dried fish, and above all the pungent smell of musk and cloves. These odours escaped from two deep dishes which were covered and placed in a stove and from a copper pan placed in an old iron pot. In an adjoining room Andrea saw also a tolerably clean table prepared for two, two bottles of wine sealed, the one with green, the other with yellow, a supply of brandy in a decanter, and a measure of fruit in a cabbage leaf, cleverly arranged on an earthenware plate. "'What do you think of it, my little fellow?' said Caderousse. "'Aye, that smells good. You knew I used to be a famous cook. Do you recollect how you used to lick your fingers?' You were among the first who tasted any of my dishes, and I think you relished them tolerably. While speaking, Caderousse went on peeling a fresh supply of onions. But, said Andrea ill-temperedly, by my faith, if it was only to breakfast with you, that you disturbed me, I wish the devil had taken you. My boy, said Caderousse sententiously, one can talk while eating. And then, you ungrateful being, you are not pleased to see an old friend? I am weeping with joy. He was truly crying but it would have been difficult to say whether joy or the onions produced the greatest effect on the lacrimal glands of the old innkeeper of the Pont du Gard. 
"'Hold your tongue, hypocrite,' said Andrea. "'You love me.' "'Yes, I do, or the devil may take me. "'I know it is a weakness,' said Caderousse, "'but it overpowers me. "'And yet it has not prevented your sending for me "'to play me some trick.' Come, said Caderousse, wiping his large knife on his apron, if I did not like you, do you think I should endure the wretched life you lead me? Think for a moment. You have your servant's clothes on, you therefore keep a servant. I have none, and am obliged to prepare my own meals. You abuse my cookery because you dine at the table de hotel, of the Hotel de Prince, or the Café du Paris. Well, I too could keep a servant. I too could have a tilbury. I too could dine where I like, but why do I not? "'because I would not annoy my little Benedetto. "'Come, just acknowledge that I could, eh?' "'This address was accompanied by a look "'which was by no means difficult to understand. "'Well,' said Andrea, "'admitting your love, "'why do you want me to breakfast with you? "'That I may have the pleasure of seeing you, my little fellow. "'What is the use of seeing me "'after we have made all our arrangements?' "'Eh, dear friend,' said Caderousse, "'are wills ever made without codicils?' "'But you first came to breakfast, did you not? "'Well, sit down, and let us begin with these pilchards and this fresh butter, "'which I have put on some vine leaves to please you, wicked one. "'Ah, yes, you look at my room, my four straw chairs, my images, three francs each. "'But what do you expect? This is not the Hotel de Prince. "'Come, you are growing discontented, you are no longer happy, "'you, who only wish to live like a retired baker.' "'Caderousse sighed. Well, what have you to say? You have seen your dream realized. I can still say it is a dream. A retired baker, my poor Benedetto, is rich. He has an annuity. Well, you have an annuity. I have? Yes, since I bring you your two hundred francs. Caderousse shrugged his shoulders. It is humiliating, said he, thus to receive money given grudgingly, an uncertain supply which may soon fail. You see, I am obliged to economize, in case your prosperity should cease. Well, my friend, fortune is inconstant, as the chaplain of the regiment said. I know your prosperity is great, you rascal. You are to marry the daughter of Danglars. What, of Danglars? Yes, to be sure. Must I say Baron Danglars? I might as well say Count Benedetto. He was an old friend of mine, and if he had not so bad a memory, he ought to invite me to your wedding, seeing he came to mine. "'Yes, yes, to mine. Gad, he was not so proud then. He was an underclerk to the good Monsieur Morel. I have dined many times with him and the Count of Morcerf. So you see, I have some high connections, and were I to cultivate them a little, we might meet in the same drawing-rooms.' "'Come, your jealousy represents everything to you in the wrong light. That is all very fine, Benedetto mio, but I know what I am saying. Perhaps I may one day put on my best coat, and presenting myself at the great gate, introduce myself. Meanwhile, let us sit down and eat. Caderousse set the example and attacked the breakfast with good appetite, praising each dish he set before his visitor. The latter seemed to have resigned himself. He drew the corks and partook largely of the fish with the garlic and fat. Ah, mate, said Caderousse, you are getting on better terms with your old landlord. Faith, yes, replied Andrea, whose hunger prevailed over every other feeling. So you like it, you rogue? "'so much that I wonder how a man who can cook thus can complain of hard living.' "'Do you see,' said Caderousse, "'all my happiness is marred by one thought. "'What is that? "'That I am dependent on another, "'I who have always gained my own livelihood honestly. "'Do not let that disturb you. "'I have enough for two. "'No, truly. "'You may believe me if you will. "'At the end of every month I am tormented by remorse. "'Good Caderousse! "'So much so, that yesterday I would not take the two hundred francs. "'Yes, you wished to speak to me, but was it indeed remorse, tell me? "'True remorse. And besides, an idea had struck me. "'Andrea shuddered. He always did so at Caderousse ideas. "'It is miserable, do you see, always to wait till the end of the month.' "'Oh,' said Andrea philosophically, determined to watch his companion narrowly, "'does not life pass in waiting? Do I, for instance, fare better?' "'Well, I wait patiently, do I not?' "'Yes, because instead of expecting two hundred wretched francs, "'you expect five or six thousand, perhaps ten, perhaps even twelve, "'for you take care not to let anyone know the utmost. "'Down there you always had little presents and Christmas boxes "'which you tried to hide from your poor friend Caderousse. "'Fortunately he is a cunning fellow, that friend Caderousse. "'There you are beginning again to ramble, to talk again and again of the past. "'But what is the use of teasing me with going all over that again?' 
"'Ah, you are only one and twenty, and can forget the past. I am fifty, and am obliged to recollect it. But let us return to business.' Yes. I was going to say, if I were in your place, well, I would realize. How would you realize? I would ask for six months in advance, under pretense of being able to purchase a farm. Then, with my six months, I would decamp. Well, well, said Andrea, that isn't a bad idea. My dear friend, said Caderousse, eat of my bread and take my advice. You will be none the worse off, physically or morally. But, said Andrea, why do you not act on the advice you gave me? Why do you not realize a six months, a year's advance even, and retire to Brussels? Instead of living the retired baker, you might live as a bankrupt, using his privileges. That would be very good. But how the devil would you have me retire on twelve hundred francs? Ah, Caderousse, said Andrea, how covetous you are. Two months ago you were dying with hunger. The appetite grows by what it feeds on, said Caderousse, grinning and showing his teeth like a monkey laughing or a tiger growling. And, added he, biting off with his large white teeth an enormous mouthful of bread, I have formed a plan. Caderousse's plans alarmed Andrea still more than his ideas. Ideas were but the germ. The plan was reality. Let me see your plan. I dare say it is a pretty one. Why not? Who formed the plan by which we left the establishment of Eh, was it not me? And it was no bad one, I believe, since here we are. I do not say, replied Andrea, that you never make a good one, but let us see your plan. Well, pursued Caderousse, can you, without expending one sou, put me in the way of getting fifteen thousand francs? No, fifteen thousand are not enough. I cannot again become an honest man with less than thirty thousand francs. No, replied Andrea, no, I cannot. I do not think you understand me, replied Caderousse calmly. I said, without your laying out a sou. Do you want me to commit a robbery to spoil all my good fortune and yours with mine, and both of us to be dragged down there again? It would make very little difference to me, said Caderousse, if I were retaken. I am a poor creature to live alone, and sometimes pine for my old comrades, not like you, heartless creature, who would be glad never to see them again. Andrea did more than tremble this time. He turned pale. Come, Caderousse, no nonsense, said he. Don't alarm yourself, my little Benedetto, but just point out to me some means of gaining those thirty thousand francs without your assistance, and I will contrive it. Well, I'll see. I'll try to contrive some way, said Andrea. Meanwhile, you will raise my monthly allowance to five hundred francs, my little fellow. I have a fancy, and mean to get a housekeeper. Well, you should have your five hundred francs, said Andrea, but it is very hard for me, my poor Caderousse. You take advantage. Bah, said Caderousse, when you have access to countless stores. One would have said Andrea anticipated his companion's words, so did his eyes flash like lightning. But it was for but a moment. True, he replied, and my protector is very kind. That dear protector, said Caderousse, and how much does he give you monthly? Five thousand francs. As many thousands as you give me hundreds. Truly, it is only bastards who are thus fortunate. Five thousand francs per month. What the devil can you do with all that? Oh, it is no trouble to spend that, and I am like you. I want capital. Capital? Yes, I understand. Everyone would like capital. Well, and I shall get it. Who will give it to you? Your prince? Yes, my prince. But unfortunately, I must wait. You must wait for what? asked Caderousse. For his death. The death of your prince? Yes. How so? Because he has made his will in my favor. Indeed, on my honor. For how much? For five hundred thousand. Only that? It's little enough. But so it is. No, it cannot be. Are you my friend, Caderousse? Yes, in life or death. Well, I will tell you a secret. What is it? But remember, a pardieu, mute as a carp. Well, I think... Andrea stopped and looked around. You think? Do not fear. Pardieu, we are alone. I think I have discovered my father. Your true father? Yes. Not old Calvicanti? No, for he has gone again. The true one, as you say. And that father is? Well, Caderousse, it is Monte Cristo. Bah! Yes, you understand. That explains all. He cannot acknowledge me openly, it appears, but he does it through Monsieur Cavalcanti, and gives him fifty thousand francs for it. Fifty thousand francs for being your father? 
I would have done it for half that, for twenty thousand, for fifteen thousand. Why did you not think of me, ungrateful man? Did I know anything about it, when it was all done while I was down there? Ah, truly, and you say that by his will he leaves me five hundred thousand livres. Are you sure of it? He showed it me. But that is not all. There is a codicil, as I said just now. Probably. And in that codicil he acknowledges me. Oh, the good father, the brave father, the very honest father, said Caderousse, twirling a plate in the air between his two hands. Now, say if I conceal anything from you. No, and your confidence makes you honorable, in my opinion, and your princely father, he is rich. Very rich? Yes, he is that. He does not himself know the amount of his fortune. Is it possible? It is evident enough to me, who am always at his house. The other day a banker's clerk brought him fifty thousand francs in a portfolio about the size of your plate. Yesterday his banker brought him a hundred thousand francs in gold. Caderousse was filled with wonder. The young man's words sounded to him like metal, and he thought he could hear the rushing of cascades of Louis. "'And you go into that house?' cried he briskly. "'When I like.' Caderousse was thoughtful for a moment. It was easy to perceive he was revolving some unfortunate idea in his mind. Then suddenly— "'How I should like to see all that!' cried he. "'How beautiful it must be!' "'It is, in fact, magnificent,' said Andrea. "'And does he not live in the champ Elysees? "'Yes, number thirty. "'Ah,' said Caderousse, number thirty. "'Yes, a fine house, standing alone. "'Between a courtyard and a garden, you must know it.' "'Possibly, but it is not the exterior I care for, it is the interior. "'What beautiful furniture there must be in it. "'Have you ever seen the Tuileries? "'No.' Well, it surpasses that. It must be worth one's while to stoop, Andrea, when that good Monsieur Monte Cristo lets fall his purse. It is not worth while to wait for that, said Andrea. Money is plentiful in that house as fruit in an orchard. But you should take me there one day with you. How can I, on what plea? You are right, but you have made my mouth water. I must absolutely see it. I shall find a way. No nonsense, Caderousse. I will offer myself as a floor polisher. The rooms are all carpeted. Well, then, I must be contented to imagine it. That is the best plan, believe me. Try, at least, to give me an idea of what it is. How can I? Nothing is easier. Is it large? Middling. How is it arranged? Faith, I should require a pen, ink, and paper to make a plan. They are all here, said Caderousse briskly. He fetched from an old secretary a sheet of white paper and pen and ink. Here, said Caderousse, draw me all that on the paper, my boy. Andrea took the pen with an imperceptible smile and began. The house, as I said, is between the court and the garden. In this way, do you see? Andrea drew the garden, the court, and the house. High walls? Not more than eight or ten feet. That is not prudent, said Caderousse. In the court are orange trees and pots, turf and clumps of flowers. And no steel traps? No. The stables are on either side of the gate, which you see there, and Andrea continued his plan. Let us see the ground floor, said Caderousse. On the ground floor, dining room, two drawing rooms, billiard room, staircase in the hall, and a little back staircase. Windows? Magnificent windows, so beautiful, so large, that I believe a man of your size should pass through each frame. Why the devil have they any stairs with such windows? Luxury has everything. But shutters? Yes, but they are never used. That Count of Monte Cristo is an original, who loves to look at the sky even at night. And where do the servants sleep? Oh, they have a house to themselves. Picture to yourself a pretty coach house at the right hand side where the ladders are kept. Well, over that coach house are the servants' rooms, with bells corresponding with the different apartments. Ah, diable, bells did you say? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I only say that they cost a load of money to hang, and what is the use of them, I should like to know. There used to be a dog let loose in the yard at night, but it has been taken to the house at Autil. To that you went to, you know. Yes. I was saying to him only yesterday, you were imprudent, Monsieur Count, for when you go to Autil and take your servants, the house is left unprotected. Well, said he, what next? What next? Some day you will be robbed. What did he answer? He quietly said, What do I care if I am? Andrea, he has some secretary with a spring. How do you know? Yes, which catches the thief in a trap and plays a tune. 
I was told there were such at the last exhibition. He has simply a mahogany secretary, in which the key is always kept. And he is not robbed. No, his servants are all devoted to him. There ought to be some money in that secretary? There may be. No one knows what there is. And where is it? On the first floor. Sketch me the plan of that floor, as you have done of the ground floor, my boy. That is very simple. Andrea took the pen. On the first story, do you see, there is an anteroom and the drawing room. To the right of the drawing room, a library and a study. To the left, a bedroom and a dressing room. The famous secretary is in the dressing room. Is there a window in the dressing room? Two. One here and one there. Andrea sketched two windows in the room, which form an angle on the plan, and appeared as a small square added to the rectangle of the bedroom. Caderousse became thoughtful. Does he often go to Autoul? added he. Two or three times a week. Tomorrow, for instance, he is going to spend the day and night there. Are you sure of it? He has invited me to dine there. There's a life for you, said Caderousse, a town house and a country house. That is what it is to be rich. And shall you dine there? Probably. When you dine there, do you sleep there? If I like, I am at home there. Caderousse looked at the young man, as if to get the truth from the bottom of his heart. But Andrea drew a cigar-case from his pocket, took a Havana, quietly lit it, and began smoking. "'When do you want your twelve hundred francs?' said he to Caderousse. "'Now, if you have them.' Andrea took five and twenty louis from his pocket. "'Yellow boys,' said Caderousse, "'no, I thank you.' "'Oh, you despise them. On the contrary, I esteem them, but will not have them. "'You can change them, idiot. Gold is worth five sous.' Exactly, and he who changes them will follow friend Caderousse, lay his hands on him, and demand what farmers pay him their rent in gold. No nonsense, my good fellow, silver simply, round coins, with the head of some monarch or other on them. Anybody may possess a five-franc piece. But do you suppose I carry five hundred francs about with me? I should want a porter. Well, leave them with your porter. He is to be trusted. I will call for them. Today? No, tomorrow. I shall not have time today. Well, tomorrow I will leave them when I go to Autul. May I depend on it? Certainly. Because I shall secure my housekeeper on the strength of it. Now see here, will that be all, eh? And will you not torment me any more? Never. Caderousse had become so gloomy that Andrea feared he should be obliged to notice the change. He redoubled his gaiety and carelessness. How sprightly you are, said Caderousse. One would say you were already in possession of your property. No, unfortunately, but when I do obtain it, well, I shall remember old friends, I can tell you that. Yes, since you have such a good memory. What do you want? It looks as if you were trying to fleece me. Ay, what an idea! I, who am going to give you another piece of good advice. What is it? To leave behind you the diamond you have on your finger. We shall both get into trouble. You will ruin both yourself and me by your folly. How so? said Andrea. How, you put on a livery, you disguise yourself as a servant, and yet keep a diamond on your finger worth four or five thousand francs. You guess well. I know something of diamonds, I have had some. You do well to boast of it, said Andrea, who, without becoming angry as Caderousse feared, at this new extortion, quietly resigned the ring. Caderousse looked so closely at it that Andrea knew that he was examining it to see if all the edges were perfect. It is a false diamond, said Caderousse. You are joking now, replied Andrea. Do not be angry, we can try it. Caderousse went to the window, touched the glass with it, and found it would cut. Confitior, said Caderousse, putting the diamond on his little finger, I was mistaken, but those thieves of jewellers imitate so well that it is no longer worth while to rob a jeweller's shop. It is another branch of industry paralyzed. Have you finished, said Andrea, do you want anything more? Will you have my waistcoat or my hat? Make free now you have begun. No, you are, after all, a good companion. I will not detain you, and will try to cure myself of my ambition. But take care the same thing does not happen to you in selling a diamond you feared with the gold. I shall not sell it. Do not fear. Not at least until the day after tomorrow, thought the young man. Happy rogue, said Caderousse, you are going to find your servants, your horses, your carriage, and your betrothed. Yes, said Andrea. Well, I hope you will make a handsome wedding present the day you marry Mademoiselle Danglars. I have already told you it is a fancy you have taken in your head. What fortune has she? But I tell you. A million? Andrea shrugged his shoulders. 
"'Let it be a million, said Caderousse. "'You can never have so much as I wish you.' "'Thank you,' said the young man. "'Oh, I wish it you with all my heart,' added Caderousse, with his hoarse laugh. "'Stop, let me show you the way.' "'It is not worth while.' "'Yes, it is.' "'Why?' "'Because there is a little secret, a precaution I thought it desirable to take, "'one of Hurit and Fichette's locks, "'revised and improvised by one Gaspard Caderousse. "'I will manufacture you a similar one when you are a capitalist.' "'Thank you,' said Andrea. "'I will let you know a week beforehand.' They parted. Caderousse remained on the landing until he had not only seen Andrea go down the three stories, but also cross the court. Then he returned hastily, shut his door carefully, and began to study, like a clever architect, the plan Andrea had left him. "'Dear Benedetto,' said he, "'I think he will not be sorry to inherit his fortune, and he who hastens the day when he can touch his five hundred thousand will not be his worst friend.'" End of chapter 81 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer yourself, please visit www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 82 The Burglary. The day following that on which the conversation we have related took place, the Count of Monte Cristo set out for Auteuil, accompanied by Ali and several attendants, and also taking with him some horses whose qualities he was desirous of ascertaining. He was induced to undertake this journey, of which the day before he had not even thought, and which had not occurred to Andrea either, by the arrival of Bertuccio from Normandy, with intelligence respecting the house and sloop. The house was ready and the sloop which had arrived a week before lay at anchor in a small creek with her crew of six men, who had observed all the requisite formalities, and were ready again to put to sea. The Count praised Bertuccio's zeal, and ordered him to prepare for a speedy departure, as his stay in France would not be prolonged more than a month. Now, said he, I may require to go in one night from Paris to Treport. Let eight fresh horses be in readiness on the road, which will enable me to go fifty leagues in ten hours. "'Your Highness had already expressed that wish,' said Bertuccio, "'and the horses are ready. "'I have bought them, and stationed them myself at the most desirable posts, "'that is, in villages, where no one generally stops.' "'That's well,' said Monte Cristo. "'I remain here a day or two. "'Arrange accordingly.' "'As Bertuccio was leaving the room to give the requisite orders, "'Baptistin opened the door. "'He held a letter on a silver waiter. "'What are you doing here?' asked the Count, "'seeing him covered with dust.' "'I did not send for you, I think.' Baptistin, without answering, approached the Count, and presented the letter. "'Important and urgent,' said he. The Count opened the letter, and read, "'Monsieur de Monte Cristo is apprised that this night a man will enter his house in the Champs-Élysées, with the intention of carrying off some papers supposed to be in the secretary in the dressing-room. The Count's well-known courage will render unnecessary the aid of the police, whose interference might seriously affect him, who sends this advice. The Count, by any opening from the bedroom, or by concealing himself in the dressing-room, would be able to defend his property himself. Many attendants or apparent precautions would prevent the villain from the attempt, and M. de Monte Cristo would lose the opportunity of discovering an enemy whom chance has revealed to him, who now sends this warning to the Count, a warning he might not be able to send another time, if this first attempt should fail, and another be made. The Count's first idea was that this was an artifice, a gross deception to draw his attention from a minor danger, in order to expose him to a greater. He was on the point of sending the letter to the commissary of police, notwithstanding the advice of his anonymous friend, or perhaps because of that advice, when suddenly the idea occurred to him that it might be some personal enemy whom he alone should recognize, and over whom, if such were the case, he alone would gain any advantage, as Fiesco had done over the more who would have killed him. We know the Count's vigorous and daring mind, denying anything to be impossible, with that energy which marks the great man. From his past life, from his resolution to shrink from nothing, the Count had acquired an inconceivable relish for the contests in which he had engaged, sometimes against nature, that is to say against God, and sometimes against the world, that is, against the devil. 
"'They do not want my papers,' said Monte Cristo. "'They want to kill me. They are no robbers but assassins. I will not allow the prefect of police to interfere with my private affairs. I am rich enough, forsooth, to distribute his authority on this occasion.' The Count recalled Baptistin, who had left the room after delivering the letter. "'Return to Paris,' said he. "'Assemble the servants who remain there. I want all my household at Auteuil.' "'But will no one remain in the house, my lord?' asked Baptistin. "'Yes, the porter.' "'My lord will remember that the lodge is at a distance from the house.' "'Well, the house might be stripped without his hearing the least noise.' "'By whom?' "'By thieves.' You are a fool, Monsieur Baptistin. Thieves might strip the house. It would annoy me less than to be disobeyed. Baptistin bowed. You understand me, said the Count. Bring your comrades here, one and all, but let everything remain as usual. Only close the shutters of the ground floor. And those of the second floor? You know they are never closed. Go. The Count signified his intention of dining alone, and that no one but Ali should attend him. Having dined with his usual tranquillity and moderation, the Count, making a signal to Ali to follow him, went out by the side-gate, and on reaching the Bois de Boulogne turned, apparently without design towards Paris, and at twilight found himself opposite his house in the Champs-Élysées. All was dark. One solitary feeble light was burning in the porter's lodge, about forty paces distant from the house, as Baptista had said. Monte Cristo leaned against a tree, and with that scrutinizing glance which was so rarely deceived, looked up and down the avenue, examined the passers-by, and carefully looked down the neighbouring streets, to see that no one was concealed. Ten minutes passed thus, and he was convinced that no one was watching him. He hastened to the side-door with Ali, entered hurriedly, and by the servant's staircase, of which he had the key, gained his bedroom without opening or disarranging a single curtain, without even the porter having the slightest suspicion that the house, which he supposed empty, contained its chief occupant. Arrived in his bedroom, the Count motioned to Ali to stop. Then he passed into the dressing-room, which he examined. Everything appeared as usual, the precious secretary in its place, and the key in the secretary. He double-locked it, took the key, returned to the bedroom door, removed the double staple of the bolt, and went in. Meanwhile Ali had procured the arms the Count had required, namely a short carbine and a pair of double-barrelled pistols, with which as sure an aim might be taken as with a single-barrelled one. Thus armed, the Count held the lives of five men in his hands. It was about half-past nine. The Count and Ali ate in haste a crust of bread and drank a glass of Spanish wine. Then Monte Cristo slipped aside one of the movable panels which enabled him to see into the adjoining room. He had within his reach his pistols and carbine, and Ali, standing near him, held one of those small Arabian hatchets whose form has not varied since the Crusades. Through one of the windows of the bedroom, on a line with that in the dressing-room, the Count could see into the street. Two hours passed thus. It was intensely dark. Still, Ali, thanks to his wild nature, and the Count, thanks doubtless to his long confinement, could distinguish in the darkness the slightest movement of the trees. The little light in the lodge had long been extinct. It might be expected that the attack, if indeed an attack was projected, would be made from the staircase of the ground floor, and not from a window. In Monte Cristo's opinion, the villains sought his life, not his money. It would be his bedroom they would attack, and they must reach it by the back staircase or by the window in the dressing-room. The clock of the Invalides struck a quarter to twelve. The west wind bore on its moistened gusts the doleful vibration of the three strokes. As the last stroke died away, the Count thought he heard a slight noise in the dressing-room. This first sound, or rather this first grinding, was followed by a second, then a third, at the fourth the Count knew what to expect. A firm and well-practised hand was engaged in cutting the four sides of a pane of glass with a diamond. The Count felt his heart beat more rapidly. Inured as men may be to danger, forewarned as they may be of peril, they understand, by the fluttering of the heart and the shuddering of the frame, the enormous difference between a dream and a reality, between the project and the execution. However, Monte Cristo only made a sign to apprise Ali, who, understanding that danger was approaching from the other side, drew nearer to his master. Monte Cristo was eager to ascertain the strength and number of his enemies. The window whence the noise proceeded was opposite the opening by which the Count could see into the dressing-room. 
He fixed his eyes on that window. He distinguished a shadow in the darkness. Then one of the panes became quite a pane, as if a sheet of paper were stuck on the outside. Then the square cracked without falling. Through the opening an arm was passed to find the fastening, then a second, the window turned on its hinges, and a man entered. He was alone. "'That's a daring rascal,' whispered the Count. At that moment Ali touched him slightly on the shoulder. He turned. Ali pointed to the window of the room in which they were facing the street. "'I see,' said he. "'There are two of them. One does the work while the other stands guard.' He made a sign to Ali not to lose sight of the man in the street, and turned to the one in the dressing-room. The glass-cutter had entered and was feeling his way, his arms outstretched before him. At last he appeared to have made himself familiar with his surroundings. There were two doors. He bolted them both. When he drew near to the bedroom door, Monte Cristo expected that he was coming in, and raised one of his pistols. But he simply heard the sound of the bolts sliding in their copper rings. It was only a precaution. The nocturnal visitor, ignorant of the fact that the Count had removed the staples, might now think himself at home, and pursue his purpose with full security. Alone, and free to act as he wished, the man then drew from his pocket something which the Count could not discern, placed it on the stand, and then went straight to the secretary, felt the lock, and contrary to his expectation, found that the key was missing. But the glass-cutter was a prudent man who had provided for all emergencies. The Count soon heard the rattling of a bunch of skeleton keys, such as the locksmith brings when called to force a lock, and which thieves call nightingales, doubtless from the music of their nightly song when they grind against the bolt. "'Aha!' whispered Monte Cristo, with a smile of disappointment. "'He is only a thief.' But the man in the dark could not find the right key. He reached the instrument he had placed on the stand, touched a spring, and immediately a pale light, just bright enough to render objects distinct, was reflected on his hands and countenance. "'By heavens!' exclaimed Monte Cristo, starting back. "'It is—' Ali raised his hatchet. "'Don't stir,' whispered Monte Cristo, "'and put down your hatchet. We shall require no arms.' Then he added some words in a low tone, for the exclamation which surprise had drawn from the Count, faint as it been, had startled the man who remained in the pose of the old knife-grinder. It was an order the Count had just given, for immediately Ali went noiselessly, and returned, bearing a black dress and a three-cornered hat. Meanwhile Monte Cristo had rapidly taken off his greatcoat, waistcoat, and shirt, and one might distinguish by the glimmering through the open pail that he wore a pliant tunic of steel mail, of which the last in France, where daggers were no longer dreaded, was worn by King Louis the Fifteenth, who feared the dragger at his breast and whose head was cleft with a hatchet. The tunic soon disappeared under a long cassock, as did his hair under a priest's wig. The three-cornered hat, over this, effectually transformed the Count into an abbé. The man, hearing nothing more, stood erect, and while Monte Cristo was completing his disguise, had advanced straight to the secretary, whose lock was beginning to crack under his nightingale. "'Try again,' whispered the Count who depended on the secret spring, which was unknown to the picklock, clever as he might be. Try again. You have a few minutes' work there. And he advanced to the window. The man whom he had seen seated on the fence had got down, and was still pacing the street. But strange as it appeared, he cared not for those who might pass by from the avenue of the Champs-Élysées, or by the Faubourg saint honoré His attention was engrossed with what was passing at the Count's, and his only aim appeared to be to discern every movement in the dressing-room. Monte Cristo suddenly struck his finger on his forehead, and a smile passed over his lips. Then, drawing near to Ali, he whispered, "'Remain here, concealed in the dark, and whatever noise you hear, whatever passes, only come in or show yourself if I call you.' Ali bowed in a token of strict obedience. Monte Cristo then drew a lighted taper from a closet, and when the thief was deeply engaged with his lock, silently opened the door, taking care that the light should shine directly on his face. The door opened so quietly that the thief heard no sound, but to his astonishment the room was suddenly illuminated. He turned. "'Ah, good evening, my dear Monsieur Caderousse,' said Monte Cristo. "'What are you doing here at such an hour?' "'The Abbé Busoni exclaimed Caderousse, and not knowing how this strange apparition could have entered when he had bolted the door, he let fall his bunch of keys, 
and remained motionless and stupefied. The Count placed himself between Caderousse and the window, thus cutting off from the thief his only chance of retreat. "'The Abbe Boussigny,' repeated Caderousse, fixing his haggard gaze on the Count. "'Yes, undoubtedly the Abbe Boussigny himself,' replied Monte Cristo. "'And I am very glad you recognize me, dear Monsieur Caderousse. It proves you have a good memory, for it must be about ten years since we last met.' This calmness of Busoni, combined with his irony and boldness, staggered Caderousse. "'The abbé, the abbé!' murmured he, clenching his fists and his teeth chattering. "'So you would rob the Count of Monte Cristo?' continued the false abbé. "'Reverend sir,' murmured Caderousse, seeking to regain the window which the Count piteously blocked. "'Reverend sir, I don't know. Believe me, I take my oath. "'A pane of glass out?' continued the Count, a dark lantern, a bunch of false keys, a secretary half forced. It is tolerably evident. Caderousse was choking. He looked around for some corner to hide in, some way of escape. Come, come, continued the Count. I see you are still the same, an assassin. Reverend sir, since you know everything, you know it was not I, it was La Carcante, that was proved at the trial, since I was only condemned to the galleys. Is your time then expired, since I find you in a fair way to return there? No, reverend sir, I have been liberated by someone. That someone has done society a great kindness. Ah, said Caderousse, I had promised. And you are breaking your promise, interrupted Monte Cristo. Alas, yes, said Caderousse very uneasily. A bad relapse that will lead you, if I mistake not, to the Place de Grève. So much the worse, so much the worse, diavolo, as they say in my country. Reverend sir, I am impelled. Every criminal says the same thing. Poverty, pshaw, said Bosoni disdainfully. Poverty may make a man beg, steal a loaf of bread at a baker's door, but not cause him to open a secretary in a house supposed to be inhabited. And when the jeweller Johannes has just paid you count mille francs for the diamond I had given you, and you killed him to get the diamond and the money both, was that also poverty? Pardon, reverend sir, said Caderousse. You have saved my life once again. Save me again. That is but poor encouragement. Are you alone, reverend sir, or have you there soldiers ready to seize me? I am alone, said the abbe, and I will again have pity on you, and I will let you escape at the risk of fresh miseries my weakness may lead to, if you tell me the truth. "'Ah, reverend sir,' cried Caderousse, clasping his hands and drawing nearer to Monte Cristo, "'I may indeed say you are my deliverer. "'You mean to say you have been freed from confinement?' "'Yes, that is true, reverend sir. "'Who was your liberator?' "'An Englishman. "'What was his name?' "'Lord Wilmore. "'I know him. "'I shall know if you lie. "'Ah, reverend sir, I tell you the simple truth. "'Was this Englishman protecting you?' No, not me, but a young Corsican, my companion. What was this young Corsican's name? Benedetto. Is that his Christian name? He had no other. He was a foundling. Then this young man escaped with you. He did. In what way? We were working at St. Mandrier, near Toulon. Do you know St. Mandrier? I do. In the hour of rest between noon and one o'clock, galley slaves having a nap after dinner, "'We may well pity the poor fellows,' said the abbé. "'Nay,' said Caderousse, "'one can't always work. "'One is not a dog.' "'So much the better for the dogs,' said Monte Cristo. "'While the rest slept, then, "'we went away a short distance. "'We severed our fetters with a file "'the Englishman had given us, and swam away. "'And what is become of this Benedetto?' "'I don't know. "'You ought to know. "'No, in truth, we parted at high airs. "'And to give more weight to his protestation, Caderousse advanced another step towards the abbé, who remained motionless in his place, as calm as ever, and pursuing his interrogation. "'You lie,' said the abbé Boussigny, with a tone of irresistible authority. "'Reverend sir!' "'You lie. This man is still your friend, and you perhaps make use of him as your accomplice. Oh, reverend sir, since you left Toulon, what have you lived on? Answer me.' "'On what I could get.' "'You lie!' repeated the abbey a third time, and with a still more imperative tone. Caderousse, terrified, looked at the Count. "'You have lived on the money he has given you.' "'True,' said Caderousse. 
Benedetto has become the son of a great lord. How can he be the son of a great lord? A natural son. And what is that great lord's name? The Count of Monte Cristo, the very same in whose house we are. Benedetto, the Count's son, replied Monte Cristo, astonished in his turn. Well, I should think so, since the Count has found him a false father, since the Count gives him four thousand francs a month and leaves him five hundred thousand francs in his will. Ah, yes, said the factitious abbe, who began to understand. And what name does the young man bear meanwhile? Andrea Cavalcanti. Is he then that young man whom my friend the Count of Monte Cristo has received into his house, and who is going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? Exactly. And you suffer that, you wretch, you, who know his life and his crime? Why should I stand in a comrade's way? said Caderousse. You are right. It is not you who should apprise Monsieur Danglars, is it? Do not do so, reverend sir. Why not? Because you would bring us to ruin. And you think that to save such villains as you, I will become an abettor of their plot, an accomplice in their crimes? Reverend sir, said Caderousse, drawing still nearer, I will expose all. To whom? To Monsieur Danglars. By heaven, cried Caderousse, drawing from his waistcoat an open knife and striking the count in the breast, you shall disclose nothing, reverend sir. To Caderousse's great astonishment, the knife, instead of piercing the Count's breast, flew back blunted. At the same moment the Count seized with his left hand the assassin's wrist and wrung it with such strength that the knife fell from his stiffened fingers and Caderousse uttered a cry of pain. But the Count, disregarding his cry, continued to wring the bandit's wrist until his arm being dislocated, he fell first on his knees then flat on the floor. The Count then placed his foot on his head, saying, I know not what restrains me from crushing thy skull, rascal. Ah, mercy, mercy, cried Caderousse. The Count withdrew his foot. Rise, said he. Caderousse rose. What a wrist you have, reverend sir, said Caderousse, stroking his arm, all bruised by the fleshy pincers which had held it. What a rest! Silence! God gives me strength to overcome a wild beast like you. In the name of God, I act. Remember that, wretch, and to spare thee at this moment is still serving him. Oh, said Caderousse, groaning with pain, take this pen and paper and write what I dictate. I don't know how to write, reverend sir. You lie. Take this pen and write. Caderousse, awed by the superior power of the abbé, sat down and wrote, Sir, the man you are receiving at your house and to whom you intend to marry your daughter is a felon who escaped with me from confinement at Toulon. He was number 59 and I number 58. He was called Benedetto, but he is ignorant of his real name, having never known his parents. Sign it, continued the Count. But would you ruin me? If I sought your ruin, fool, I should drag you to the first guardhouse. Besides, when that note is delivered, in all probability you will have no more to fear. Sign it, then. Caderousse signed it. The address, to Monsieur the Baron d'Anglaire, banker, rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. Caderousse wrote the address. The abbé took the note. Now, said he, that suffice is begun. Which way? The way you came. You wish me to get out of that window? You got in very well. Oh, you have some design against me, reverend sir. Idiot, what design can I have? Why, then, not let me out of the front door? What would be the advantage of waking the porter? Ah, reverend sir, tell me, do you wish me dead? I wish what God wills. But swear that you will not strike me as I go down. Cowardly fool! What do you intend doing with me? I ask you, what can I do? I have tried to make you a happy man, and you have turned out a murderer. Oh, monsieur, said Caderousse, make one attempt. Try me once more. I will, said the Count. Listen, you know if I may be relied on. Yes, said Caderousse, if you arrive safely at home, what have I to fear except from you? If you reach your home safely, leave Paris, leave France, and wherever you may be, so long as you conduct yourself well. I will send you a small annuity, for if you return home safely, then—then, then, asked Caderousse, shuddering, 
Then I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you too. As true as I am a Christian, stammered Caderousse, you will make me die of fright. Now be gone, said the Count, pointing to the window. Caderousse, scarcely yet relying on this promise, put his legs out of the window and stood on the ladder. Now go down, said the abbe, folding his arms. Understanding he had nothing more to fear from him, Caderousse began to go down. Then the Count brought the taper to the window, that it might be seen in the Champs-Élysées that a man was getting out of the window while another held a light. "'What are you doing, reverend sir? Suppose a watchman should pass?' And he blew out the light. He then descended, but it was only when he felt his foot touch the ground that he was satisfied of his safety. Monte Cristo returned to his bedroom, and glancing rapidly from the garden to the street, he saw first Caderousse, who, after walking to the end of the garden, fixed his ladder against the wall at a different part from where he came in. The Count, then looking over into the street, saw the man who appeared to be waiting run in the same direction, and place himself against the angle of the wall where Caderousse would come over. Caderousse climbed the ladder slowly, and looked over the coping to see if the street was quiet. No one could be seen or heard. The clock of the Avalide struck one. Then Caderousse sat astride the coping, and drawing up his ladder passed it over the wall. Then he began to descend, or rather to slide down by the two stanchions, which he did with an ease which proved how accustomed he was to the exercise. But once started, he could not stop. In vain did he see a man start from the shadow when he was halfway down. In vain did he see an arm raised as he touched the ground. Before he could defend himself, that arm struck him so violently in the back, he let go of the ladder, crying, Help! A second blow struck him almost immediately in the side, and he fell, calling, Help! Murder! Then, as he rolled on the ground, his adversary seized him by the hair and struck him a third blow in the chest. This time Caderousse endeavoured to call again, but he could only utter a groan, and he shuddered as the blood flowed from his three wounds. The assassin, finding that he no longer cried out, lifted his head up by the hair. His eyes were closed and his mouth distorted. The murderer, supposing him dead, let fall his head and disappeared. Then Caderousse, feeling that he was leaving him, raised himself on his elbow and, with a dying voice, cried with great effort, Murder! I am dying! Help, reverend sir, help! This mournful appeal pierced the darkness. The door of the back staircase opened, then the side gate of the garden, and Ali and his master were on the spot with lights. End of chapter 82 Recorded in Nottingham, England, on the 17th of July, 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, Chapter 83, The Hand of God Caderousse continued to call piteously, Help, reverend sir, help! What is the matter? asked Monte Cristo. Help! cried Caderousse. I am murdered! We are here. Take courage. Ah, it's all over. You are come too late. You are come to see me die. What blows? What blood? He fainted. Ali and his master conveyed the wounded man into a room. Monte Cristo motioned to Ali to undress him, and he then examined his dreadful wounds. My God, he exclaimed, thy vengeance is sometimes delayed, but only that it may fall the more effectually. Ali looked at his master for further instructions. Bring here immediately the king's attorney, Monsieur de Villefort, who lives in the Faubourg Saint Honor. As you pass the lodge, wake the porter and send him for a surgeon. Ali obeyed, leaving the abbe alone with Caderousse, who had not yet revived. When the wretched man again opened his eyes, the count looked at him with a mournful expression of pity, and his lips moved as if in prayer. A surgeon, reverend sir, a surgeon, said Caderousse. I have sent for one, replied the abbe. I know he cannot save my life, but he may strengthen me to give my evidence. Against whom? Against my murderer. Did you recognize him? Yes, it was Benedetto. The young Corsican? Himself. Your comrade? Yes, 
after giving me the plan of this house, doubtless hoping I should kill the Count, and he thus become his heir, or that the Count would kill me, and I should be out of his way, he waylaid me, and has murdered me. I have also sent for the procurer. He will not come in time. I feel my life fast ebbing. Wait a moment, said Monte Cristo. He left the room, and returned in five minutes with the file. The dying man's eyes were all the time riveted on the door, through which he hoped Sikora would arrive. Hasten, reverend sir, hasten. I shall faint again. Monte Cristo approached and dropped on his purple lips three or four drops of the contents of the file. Caderousse drew a deep breath. Oh, said he, that is life to me. More, more. Two drops more would kill you, replied the abbe. Oh, send for someone to whom I can denounce the wretch. Shall I write your deposition? You can sign it. Yes, yes, said Caderousse, and his eyes glistened at the thought of this posthumous revenge. Monte Cristo wrote, I die, murdered by the Corsican Benedetto, my comrade, and the galleys at Toulouse, number 59. Quick, quick, said Caderousse, or I shall be unable to sign it. Monte Cristo gave the pen to Caderousse, who collected all his strength, signed it, and fell back on his bed, saying, You will relate all the rest, reverend sir. You will say he calls himself André Cavalcanti. He lodges at the Hotel de Prince. Oh, I am dying! He again fainted. The abbé made him smell the contents of the file, and he again opened his eyes. His desire for revenge had not forsaken him. Ah, you will tell all I have said, will you not, reverend sir? Yes, and much more. What more will you say? I will say he had doubtless given you the plan of this house, in the hope the Count would kill you. I will say likewise he had apprised the Count, by a note, of your intention, and, the Count being absent, I read the note and sat up to await you. And he will be guillotined, will he not? said Caderousse. Promise me that, and I will die with that hope. I will say, continued the Count, that he followed and watched you the whole time, and when he saw you leave the house, ran to the angle of the wall to conceal himself. Did you see all that? Remember my words. If you return home safely, I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you also. And you did not warn me, cried Caderousse, raising himself on his elbows. You knew I should be killed on leaving this house, and did not warn me. No, for I saw God's justice placed in the hands of Benedetto, and should have thought it sacrilege to oppose the designs of Providence. God's justice! Speak not of it, reverend sir. If God were just, you know how many would be punished who now escape. Patience, said the abbe, in a tone which made the dying man shudder. Have patience. Caderousse looked at him with amazement. Besides, said the abbe, God is merciful to all, as he has been to you. He is first a father, then a judge. Do you then believe in God? said Caderousse. Had I been so unhappy as not to believe in him until now, said Monte Cristo, I must believe on seeing you. Caderousse raised his clenched hands towards heaven. Listen, said the abbe, extending his hand over the wounded man, as if to command him to believe. This is what the God in whom, on your deathbed, you refuse to believe, has done for you. He gave you health, strength, regular employment, even friends. A life, in fact, which a man might enjoy with a calm conscience. Instead of improving these gifts, rarely granted so abundantly, this has been your course. You have given yourself up to sloth and drunkenness, and in a fit of intoxication have ruined your best friend. Help! cried Caderousse. I require a surgeon, not a priest. Perhaps I am not mortally wounded. I may not die. Perhaps they can yet save my life. Your wounds are so far mortal that, without the three drops I gave you, you would now be dead. Listen, then. Ah, murmured Caderousse, what a strange priest you are. You drive the dying to despair instead of consoling them. Listen, continued the abbe, when you had betrayed your friend, God began not to strike but to warn you. Poverty overtook you. You had already passed half your life in coveting that which you might have honorably acquired and already you contemplated crime under the excuse of want, when God worked a miracle on your behalf, 
sending you by my hands a fortune, brilliant indeed for you who had never possessed any. But this unexpected, unhoped for, unheard of fortune sufficed you no longer when you once possessed it. You wished to double it, and how? By a murder. You succeeded, and then God snatched it from you and brought you to justice. It was not I who wished to kill the Jew, said Caderousse. It was La Carconte. Yes, said Monte Cristo, and God, I cannot say injustice, for his justice would have slain you, but God in his mercy spared your life. Pardieu, to transport me for life, how merciful! You thought it a mercy then, miserable wretch. The coward who feared death rejoiced at perpetual disgrace, for like all galley slaves, you said, I may escape from prison, I cannot from the grave. And you said truly, the way was opened for you unexpectedly. An Englishman visited Toulon, who had vowed to rescue two men from infamy, and his choice fell on you and your companion. You received a second fortune, money and tranquility were restored to you, and you, who had been condemned to a felon's life, might live as other men. Then, wretched creature, then you tempted God a third time. I have not enough, you said, when you had more than you before possessed, and you committed a third crime, without reason, without excuse. God is wearied. He has punished you. Caderousse was fast sinking. Give me a drink, said he. I thirst. I burn. Monte Cristo gave him a glass of water. And yet that villain, Benedetto, will escape. No one, I tell you, will escape. Benedetto will be punished. Then you too will be punished, for you did not do your duty as a priest. You should have prevented Benedetto from killing me. I, said the Count, with a smile which petrified the dying man, when you had just broken your knife against the coat of mail which protected my breast, yet perhaps if I had found you humble and penitent, I might have prevented Benedetto from killing you. But I found you proud and bloodthirsty, and I left you in the hands of God. I do not believe there is a God, howled Caderousse. You do not believe it. You lie. You lie. Silence, said the abbe. You will force the last drop of blood from your veins. What? You do not believe in God when he is striking you dead? You will not believe in him who requires but a prayer, a word, a tear, and he will forgive? God, who might have directed the assassin's dagger so as to end your career in a moment, has given you this quarter of an hour for repentance. Reflect then, wretched man, and repent. No, said Caderousse, no, I will not repent. There is no God, there is no providence, all comes by chance. There is a providence, there is a God, said Monte Cristo, of whom you are a striking proof, as you lie in utter despair, denying him, while I stand before you, rich, happy, safe, and entreating that God in whom you endeavor not to believe, while in your heart you still believe in him. But who are you then? asked Caderousse, fixing his dying eyes on the Count. Look well at me, said Monte Cristo, putting the light near his face. Well, the Abbe, the Abbe Busoni. Monte Cristo took off the wig which disfigured him and let fall his black hair, which added so much to the beauty of his pallid features. Oh, said Caderousse, thunderstruck, but for that black hair, I should say you were the Englishman, Lord Wilmore. I am neither the Abbe Bosoni nor Lord Wilmore, said Monte Cristo. Think again, do you not recollect me? There was a magic effect on the Count's words, which once more revived the exhausted powers of the miserable man. Yes, indeed, said he, I think I have seen you and known you formerly. Yes, Caderousse, you have seen me. You knew me once. Who then are you, and why, if you knew me, do you let me die? Because nothing can save you. Your wounds are mortal. Had it been possible to save you, I should have considered it another proof of God's mercy, and I would again have endeavored to restore you, I swear, by my father's tomb. By your father's tomb, said Caderousse supported by a supernatural power, and half raising himself to see more distinctly the man who had just taken the oath which all men hold sacred. Who then are you? The Count had watched the approach of death. He knew this was the last struggle. He approached the dying man, 
and leaning over him with a calm and melancholy look he whispered i am i am and his almost closed lips uttered a name so low that the count himself appeared afraid to hear it caderousse who had raised himself on his knees and stretched out his arm tried to draw back then clasping his hands and raising them with a desperate effort oh my god my god said he pardon me for having denied thee thou dost exist thou art indeed man's father in heaven and his judge on earth my god my lord i have long despised thee pardon me my god receive me o my lord caderousse sighed deeply and fell back with a groan the blood no longer flowed from his wounds he was dead one said the count mysteriously his eyes fixed on the corpse disfigured by so awful a death ten minutes afterwards the surgeon and the procureur arrived the one accompanied by the porter the other by ali and were received by the abbe Bussoni, who was praying by the side of the corpse End of chapter 83This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California, March 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 84 Beauchamp. The daring attempt to rob the Count was the topic of conversation throughout Paris for the next fortnight. The dying man had signed a deposition declaring Benedetto to be the assassin. The police had orders to make the strictest search for the murderer. Caderousse knife, dark lantern, bunch of keys and clothing, excepting the waistcoat, which could not be found, were deposited at the registry. The corpse was conveyed to the morgue. The Count told everyone that this adventure had happened during his absence at Outhill, and that he only knew what was related by the Abbe Bossini, who that evening, by mere chance, had requested to pass the night in his house to examine some valuable books in his library. Bertuccio alone turned pale whenever Benedetto's name was mentioned in his presence, but there was no reason why anyone should notice his doing so. Villefort, being called on to prove the crime, was preparing his brief with the same ardour that he was accustomed to exercise when required to speak in criminal cases. But three weeks had already passed, and the most diligent search had been unsuccessful. The attempted robbery and the murder of the robber by his comrade were almost forgotten in anticipation of the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle Danglars to the Count Andrea Cavalcanti. It was expected that this wedding would shortly take place, as the young man was received at the banker's as the betrothed. Letters had been dispatched to Monsieur Cavalcante as the Count's father, who highly approved of the union, regretted his inability to leave Parma at that time, and promised a wedding gift of a hundred and fifty thousand livres. It was agreed that the three millions should be entrusted to Danglars to invest. Some persons had warned the young man of the circumstances of his future father-in-law, who had of late sustained repeated losses, but with sublime disinterestedness and confidence the young man refused to listen, or to express a single doubt to the baron. The baron adored Count Andrea Cavalcanti. Not so Mademoiselle Eugenie Danglars. With an instinctive hatred of matrimony, she suffered Andrea's attentions in order to get rid of Morcerf. But when Andrea urged his suit, she betrayed an entire dislike to him. The baron might possibly have perceived it, but attributing it to a caprice feigned ignorance. The delay demanded by Beauchamp had nearly expired. Morcerf appreciated the advice of Monte Cristo to let things die away of their own accord. No one had taken up the remark about the general, and no one had recognized in the officer who betrayed the castle of Yanina the noble count in the House of Peers. Albert, however, felt no less insulted. The few lines which had irritated him were certainly intended as an insult. Besides, the manner in which Beauchamp had ended the conference left a bitter recollection in his heart. He cherished the thought of the duel, hoping to conceal its true cause even from his seconds. Beauchamp had not been seen since the day he visited Albert, 
and those of whom the latter inquired always told him he was out on a journey which would detain him some days. Where he was, no one knew. One morning Albert was awakened by his valet de chambre, who announced Beauchamp. Albert rubbed his eyes, ordered his servant to introduce him into the small smoking-room on the ground floor, dressed himself quickly, and went down. He found Beauchamp pacing the room. On perceiving him, Beauchamp stopped. "'Your arrival here, without waiting my visit at your house to-day, looks well, sir,' said Albert. "'Tell me, may I shake hands with you, saying, Beauchamp, acknowledge you have injured me, and retain my friendship? Or must I simply propose to you a choice of arms?' Albert, said Beauchamp, with a look of sorrow which stupefied the young man, let us first sit down and talk. Rather, sir, before we sit down, I must demand your answer. Albert, said the journalist, these are questions which it is difficult to answer. I will facilitate it by repeating the question. Will you, or will you not, retract? More serif, it is not enough to answer yes or no to questions which concern the honor, the social interest, and the life of such a man as Lieutenant-General, the Count of Morcerf, peer of France. What must then be done? What I have done, Albert, I reasoned thus. Money, time, and fatigue are nothing compared with the reputation and interests of a whole family. Probabilities will not suffice. Only facts will justify a deadly combat with a friend. If I strike with the sword, or discharge the contents of a pistol at man whom for three years I have been on terms of intimacy. I must at least know why I do so. I must meet him with a heart at ease, and that quiet conscience which a man needs when his own arm must save his life. Well, said Morcerf impatiently, what does all this mean? It means that I have just returned from Yanina. From Yanina? Yes, impossible. Here is my passport. Examine the visa. Geneva, Milan, Venice, Triste, Gelvino, Yanina. Will you believe the government of a republic, a kingdom, and an empire? Albert cast his eyes on the passport, then raised them in astonishment to Beauchamp. You have been to Yanina? said he. Albert, had you been a stranger, a foreigner, a simple lord like that Englishman who came to demand satisfaction three or four months since, and whom I killed to get rid of, I should not have taken this trouble. But I thought this mark of consideration due to you. I took a week to go, another to return, four days of quarantine, and forty-eight hours to stay there. That makes three weeks. I returned last night, and here I am. What circumlocution! How long are you before you tell me what I most wish to know? Because in truth, Albert, you hesitate? Yes, I fear. You fear to acknowledge that your correspondent has deceived you? Oh, no self-love, Beauchamp! Acknowledge it, Beauchamp! Your courage cannot be doubted. Not so, murmured the journalist. On the contrary. Albert turned frightfully pale. He endeavored to speak, but the words died on his lips. My friend, said Beauchamp, in the most affectionate tone, I should gladly make an apology, but alas! But what? The paragraph was correct, my friend. What? That French officer? Yes. Fernand? Yes. The traitor who surrendered the castle of the man in whose service he was? Pardon me, my friend, that man was your father. Albert advanced furiously toward Beauchamp, but the latter restrained him more by a mild look than by his extended hand. My friend, he said, here is proof of it. Albert opened the paper. It was an attestation of four notable inhabitants of Yanina, proving that Colonel Fernand Mondego, in the service of Ali Tepolini, had surrendered the castle for two million crowns. The signatures were perfectly legal. Albert tottered and fell overpowered in a chair. It could no longer be doubted. The family name was fully given. After a moment's mournful silence, his heart overflowed, and he gave way to a flood of tears. Beauchamp, who had watched with sincere pity the young man's paroxysm of grief, approached him. "'Now, Albert,' he said, "'you understand me, do you not? I wish to see all, and to judge of everything for myself, hoping the explanation would be in your father's favour, and I might do him justice. But on the contrary, the particulars which are given prove that Fernand Mondego, 
raised by Ali Pasha to the rank of Governor-General, is no other than Count Fernand of Morcef. Then, recollecting the honour you had done me, in admitting me to your friendship, I hastened to you. Albert, still extended on the chair, covered his face with both hands, as if to prevent the light from reaching him. I hastened to you, continued Beauchamp, to tell you, Albert, that in this changing age the faults of a father cannot revert upon his children. Few have passed through this revolutionary period, in the midst of which we were born, without some stain or infamy or blood to soil the uniform of the soldier or the gown of the magistrate. Now I have these proofs, Albert, and I am in your confidence. No human power can force me to a duel which your own conscience would reproach you with as criminal. But I come to offer you what you can no longer demand of me. Do you wish these proofs, these attestations, which I alone possess, to be destroyed? Do you wish this frightful secret to remain with us? Confided to me, it shall never escape my lips. Say, Albert, my friend, do you wish it? Albert threw himself on Beauchamp's neck. Ah, noble fellow, cried he. Take these, said Beauchamp, presenting the papers to Albert. Albert seized them with a convulsive hand, tore them in pieces, and trembling lest the least vestige should escape, and one day appear to confront him, he approached the wax-light, always kept burning for cigars, and burned every fragment. Dear excellent friend, murmured Albert, still burning the papers. Let all be forgotten as a sorrowful dream, said Beauchamp. Let it vanish as the last sparks from the blackened paper, and disappear as the smoke from those silent ashes. Yes, yes, said Albert, and may there remain only the eternal friendship which I promise to my deliverer, which shall be transmitted to our children's children, and shall always remind me that I owe my life, and the honour of my name, to you. For had this been known, O oh, Beauchamp, I should have destroyed myself. Or, no, my poor mother, I could not have killed her by the same blow. I should have fled from my country. Dear Albert, said Beauchamp, but this sudden and factitious joy soon forsook the young man, and was succeeded by a still greater grief. Well, said Beauchamp, what still oppresses you, my friend? I am broken-hearted, said Albert. Listen, Beauchamp, I cannot thus in a moment relinquish the respect, the confidence and pride with which a father's untarnished name inspires a son. Oh, Beauchamp! Beauchamp, how shall I now approach mine? Shall I draw back my forehead from his embrace, or withhold my hand from his? I am the most wretched of men. Ah, my mother, my poor mother, said Albert, gazing through his tears at his mother's portrait, if you know this, how much you must suffer. Come, said Beauchamp, taking both his hands, take courage, my friend. But how came that first note to be inserted in your journal? Some unknown enemy, an invisible foe, has done this. The more you must fortify yourself, Albert, let no trace of emotion be visible on your countenance. Bear your grief as the cloud bears within it ruin and death, a fatal secret, known only when the storm bursts. Go, my friend, reserve your strength for the moment when the crash shall come. You think, then, all is not over yet? said Albert, horror-stricken. I think nothing, my friend, but all things are possible. By the way, what, said Albert, seeing that Beauchamp hesitated, are you going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? Why do you ask me now? Because the rupture or fulfillment of this engagement is connected with the person of whom we were speaking. How, said Albert, you think Monsieur Danglars? I only ask you how your engagement stands. Pray put no construction on my words that I do not mean they should convey and give them no undue weight. No, said Albert, the engagement is broken off. Well, said Beauchamp. Then, seeing the young man was about to relapse into melancholy, let us go out, Albert, said he, a ride in the wood, in the phaeton, or on horseback, will refresh you. We will then return to breakfast, and you shall attend to your affairs, and I to mine. Willingly, said Albert, but let us walk. I think a little exertion would do me good. The two friends walked out on the fortress. When they arrived at the Madeleine, Since we are out, said Beauchamp, let us call on Monsieur de Monte Cristo. He is admirably adapted to revive one's spirits, because he never interrogates, and in my opinion, those who ask no questions are the best comforters. Gladly, said Albert, I love him, let us call. End of chapter 84
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California, March 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumont. Chapter 85 The Journey. Monte Cristo uttered a joyful exclamation on seeing the young men together. Aha! said he, I hope all is over, explained and settled. Yes, said Beauchamp, the absurd reports have died away, and should they be renewed, I would be the first to oppose them, so let us speak no more of it. Albert will tell you, replied the Count, that I gave him the same advice. Look, added he, I am finishing the most execrable morning's work. "'What is it?' said Albert, arranging your papers, apparently. "'My papers? Thank God, no! My papers are all in capital order, because I have none. But Monsieur Cavalcantes. "'Monsieur Cavalcantes? asked Beauchamp. "'Yes. Do you not know that this is a young man whom the Count is introducing?' said Morcerf. "'Let us not misunderstand each other,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I introduce no one, and certainly not Monsieur Cavalcanti.' And who, said Albert, with a forced smile, is to marry Mademoiselle Danglars instead of me, which grieves me cruelly. What? Cavalcante is going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? asked Beauchamp. Certainly. Do you come from the end of the world? said Monte Cristo. You, a journalist, the husband of renown? It is the talk of all Paris. And you, Count, have you made this match? asked Beauchamp. I? Silence, purveyor of gossip, do not spread that report. I make a match? No, you do not know me. I have done all in my power to oppose it. Ah, I understand, said Beauchamp, on our friend Albert's account. On my account, said the young man, oh, no, indeed, the Count will do me the justice to assert that I have, on the contrary, always entreated him to break off my engagement, and happily it is ended. The Count pretends I have not him to thank, so be it. I will erect and alter Dio Ignoto. Listen, said Monte Cristo. I have had little to do with it, for I am at variance both with the father-in-law and the young man. There is only Mademoiselle Eugénie, who appears but little charmed with the thoughts of matrimony, and who, seeing how little I was disposed to persuade her to renounce her dear liberty, retains any affection for me. And do you say this wedding is at hand? Oh, yes, in spite of all I could say. I do not know the young man. He is said to be of good family and rich, but I never trusted vague assertions. I have warned M. Danglars of it till I am tired, but he is fascinated with his Lucanese. I have even informed him of a circumstance I consider very serious. The young man was either charmed by his nurse, stolen by gypsies, or lost by his tutor, I scarcely know which. But I do know his father lost sight of him for more than ten years. What he did during these ten years God only knows. Well, all that was useless. They have commissioned me to write to the Major to demand papers and here they are. I send them, but like Pilate, washing my hands. And what does Mademoiselle d'Armilly say to you for robbing her of her pupil? Oh, well, I don't know, but I understand that she is going to Italy. Madame Danglars asked me for letters of recommendation for the impresari. I gave her a few lines for the director of the Valle Theatre, who is under some obligation to me. But what is the matter, Albert? You look dull. Are you, after all, unconsciously in love with Mademoiselle Eugénie? I am not aware of it, said Albert, smiling sorrowfully. Beauchamp turned to look at some paintings. But, continued Monte Cristo, you are not in your usual spirits. I have a dreadful headache, said Albert. Well, my dear Viscount, I have an infallible remedy to propose to you. What is that? asked the young man. A change. Indeed, said Albert. Yes. And as I am just now excessively annoyed, I shall go from home. Shall we go together? You annoyed, Count, said Beauchamp, and by what? Ah, you think very lightly of it. I should like to see you with the brief preparing in your house. What brief? The one Monsieur de Villefort is preparing against my amiable assassin. Some brigand escaped from the gallows, apparently. True, said Beauchamp, I saw it in the paper. Who is this Caderousse? Some provincial, it appears. Monsieur de Villefort heard of him at Marseilles, and Monsieur Danglars recollects having seen him. Consequently, the procureur is very active in the affair, and the prefect of police very much interested. 
and thanks to that interest, for which I am very grateful, they send me all the robbers of Paris and the neighborhood, under pretense of their being Caderousse's murderers. So that in three months, if this continue, every robber and assassin in France will have the plan of my house at his finger's end. I am resolved to desert them, and go to some remote corner of the earth, and shall be happy if you will accompany, Vicount. Willingly. Then it is settled? Yes, but where? I have told you, where the air is pure, where every sound soothes, where one is sure to be humbled, however proud may be his nature. I love that humiliation, I who am master of the universe, as was Augustus. But where are you really going? To sea, Vicount. You know I am a sailor. I was rocked when an infant in the arms of old ocean, and on the bosom of the beautiful Amphitrite. I have sported with the green mantle of the one, and the azure robe of the other. I love the sea as a mistress, and pine if I do not often see her. Let us go, Count. To sea? Yes. You accept my proposal? I do. Well, Viscount, there will be in my courtyard this evening a good travelling britzka, with four post-horses, in which one may rest as in a bed. Monsieur Beauchamp, it holds four very well. Will you accompany us? Thank you. I have just returned from sea. What? You have been to sea? Yes, I have just made a little excursion to the Borromean Islands, Lake Maggiore. What of that? Come with us, said Albert. No, dear Morcerf. You know I only refuse when the thing is impossible. Besides, it is important, he added in a low tone, that I should remain in Paris just now to watch the paper. Ah, you are a good and excellent friend, said Albert. Yes, you are right. Watch, watch, Beauchamp, and try to discover the enemy who made this disclosure. Albert and Beauchamp parted, the last pressure of their hands expressing what their tongues could not before a stranger. Beauchamp is a worthy fellow, said Monte Cristo, when the journalist was gone. Is he not, Albert? Yes, and a sincere friend. I love him devotedly. But now we are alone, although it is immaterial to me. Where are we going? Into Normandy, if you like. Delightful. Shall we be quite retired, have no society, no neighbors? Our companions will be riding horses, dogs to hunt with, and a fishing boat. Exactly what I wish for. I will apprise my mother of my intention, and return to you. But shall you be allowed to go into Normandy? I may go where I please. Yes, I am aware you may go alone, since I once met you in Italy. But to accompany the mysterious Monte Cristo? You forget, Count, that I have often told you of the deep interest my mother takes in you. Woman is fickle, said Francis, one. Woman is like a wave of the sea, said Shakespeare. Both the great king and the great poet ought to have known woman's nature well. Woman's, yes. My mother is not woman, but a woman. As I am only a humble foreigner, you must pardon me if I do not understand all the subtle refinements of your language. What I mean to say is that my mother is not quick to give her confidence, but when she does, she never changes. Ah, yes, indeed, said Monte Cristo with a sigh. And do you think she is in the least interested in me? I repeat it, you must really be a very strange and superior man, for my mother is so absorbed by the interest you have excited, that when I am with her she speaks of no one else. And does she try to make you dislike me? On the contrary, she often says, Morcerf, I believe the Count has a noble nature. Try to gain his esteem. Indeed, said Monte Cristo, sighing. You see, then, said Albert, that instead of opposing, she will encourage me. Adieu, then, until five o'clock. Be punctual, and we shall arrive at twelve or one. At Treport? Yes, or in the neighborhood. But can we travel forty-eight leagues in eight hours? Easily, said Monte Cristo. You are certainly a prodigy. You will soon not only surpass the railway, which would not be very difficult in France, but even the telegraph. But, Viscount, since we cannot perform the journey in less than seven or eight hours, do not keep me waiting. Do not fear, I have little to prepare. Monte Cristo smiled as he nodded to Albert, then remained a moment absorbed in deep meditation. But passing his hand across his forehead, as if to dispel his reverie, he rang the bell twice, and Bertuccio entered. Bertuccio, he said, I intend going this evening to Normandy, instead of to-morrow or the next day. You will have sufficient time before five o'clock. Dispatch a messenger to apprise the grooms at the first station. Monsieur de Morcerf will accompany me. Bertuccio obeyed, and dispatched a courier to Pognot, to say the travelling carriage would arrive at six o'clock. From Pognot another express was sent to the next stage, and in six hours all the horses stationed on the road were ready. Before his departure, the Count went to Heidi's apartments, told her his intention, and resigned everything to her care. 
Albert was punctual. The journey soon became interesting from its rapidity, of which Morcerf had formed no previous idea. Truly, said Monte Cristo, with your post horses going at the rate of two leagues an hour, and that absurd law that one traveller shall not pass another without permission, so that an invalid or ill tempered traveller may detain those who are well and active, it is impossible to move. I escape this annoyance by travelling with my own postillion and horses, do I not, Ellie? The Count put his head out of the window, and whistled, and the horses appeared to fly. The carriage rolled with a thundering noise over the pavement, and every one turned to notice the dazzling meteor. Ali, smiling, repeated the sound, grasped the reins with a firm hand, and spurred his horses, whose beautiful manes floated in the breeze. This child of the desert was in his element, and with his black face and sparkling eyes appeared in the cloud of dust he raised, like the genius of the Simoon, and the god of the hurricane. "'I never knew till now the delight of speed,' said Morcerf, and the last cloud disappeared from his brow. "'But where the devil do you get such horses? Are they made to order?' "'Precisely,' said the Count. Six years since I bought a horse in Hungary remarkable for its swiftness. The thirty-two that we shall use to-night are its progeny. They are all entirely black, with the exception of a star upon the forehead.' "'That is perfectly admirable. But what do you do, Count, with all these horses?' "'You see, I travel with them.' but you are not always travelling. When I no longer require them, Bertuccio will sell them, and he expects to realise thirty or forty thousand francs by the sale. But no monarch in Europe will be wealthy enough to purchase them. Then he will sell them to some eastern vizier, who will empty his coffers to purchase them, and refill them by applying the bastinado to his subjects. Count, may I suggest one idea to you? Certainly. It is that, next to you, Bertuccio must be the richest gentleman in Europe. You are mistaken, Viscount. I believe he has not a franc in his possession. Then he must be a wonder. My dear Count, if you tell me many more marvellous things, I warn you I shall not believe them. I countenance nothing that is marvellous, Monsieur Albert. Tell me, why does a steward rob his master? Because, I suppose, it is his nature to do so, for the love of robbing. You are mistaken. It is because he has a wife and family, and ambitious desires for himself and them. Also, because he is not sure of always retaining his situation, and wishes to provide for the future. Now, Monsieur Bartuccio is alone in the world. He uses my property without accounting for the use he makes of it. He is sure never to leave my service. Why? Because I should never get a better. Probabilities are deceptive. But I deal in certainties. He is the best servant over whom one has the power of life and death. Do you possess that right over Bartuccio? Yes. There are words which close a conversation with an iron door. Such was the Count's yes. The whole journey was performed with equal rapidity. The thirty-two horses, dispersed over seven stages, brought them to their destination in eight hours. At midnight they arrived in the gate of a beautiful park. The porter was in attendance. He had been apprised by the groom of the last stage of the Count's approach. At half-past two in the morning, Morcerf was conducted to his apartments, where a bath and supper were prepared. The servant who had travelled at the back of the carriage waited on him. Baptistin, who rode in front, attended the Count. Albert bathed, took his supper, and went to bed. All night he was lulled by the melancholy noise of the surf. On rising he went to his window, which opened on a terrace, having the sea in front, and at the back a pretty park bounded by a small forest. In a creek lay a little sloop, with a narrow keel and high masts, bearing on its flag the Monte Cristo arms, which were a mountain on a sea azure, with a cross gules on the shield. Around the schooner lay a number of small fishing boats belonging to the fishermen of the neighboring village, like humble subjects awaiting orders from their queen. There, as in every spot where Monte Cristo stopped, if but for two days, luxury abounded and life went on with the utmost ease. Albert found in his ante-room two guns, with all the accoutrements for hunting, a lofty room on the ground floor containing all the ingenious instruments the English, eminent in piscatory pursuits, since they are patient and sluggish, have invented for fishing. The day passed in pursuing those exercises in which Monte Cristo excelled. They killed a dozen pheasants in the park, as many trout in the stream, dined in a summer-house overlooking the ocean, and took tea in the library. Toward the evening of the third day, Albert, 
completely exhausted with the exercise which invigorated Monte Cristo, was sleeping in an armchair near the window, while the Count was designing with his architect the plan of a conservatory in his house, when the sound of a horse at full speed on the high road made Albert look up. He was disagreeably surprised to see his own valet de chambre, who he had not brought, that he might not inconvenience Monte Cristo. "'Florentine here!' he cried, starting up. "'Is my mother ill?' And he hastened to the door. Monte Cristo watched and saw him approach the valet, who drew a small sealed parcel from his pocket, containing a newspaper and a letter. "'From whom is this?' he said eagerly. "'From Monsieur Beauchamp,' replied Florentine. "'Did he send you?' "'Yes, sir. He sent for me to his house, gave me money for my journey, procured a horse, and made me promise not to stop till I had reached you. I have come in fifteen hours.' Albert opened the letter with fear, uttered a shriek on reading the first line, and seized the paper. His sight was dimmed, his legs sank under him, and he would have fallen had not Florentine supported him. "'Poor young man,' said Monte Cristo in a low voice. It is true, then, that the sin of the father shall fall on the children to the third and fourth generation. Meanwhile, Albert had revived, and continuing to read, he threw back his head, saying, Florentine, is your horse fit to return immediately? It is a poor, lame post-horse. In what state was the house when you left? All was quiet, but on returning from Monsieur Beauchamp, I found Madame in tears. She had sent for me to know when you would return. I told her my orders from Monsieur Beauchamp. She first extended her arms to prevent me, but after a moment's reflection, "'Yes, go, Florentine,' she said, "'and may he come quickly.' "'Yes, my mother,' said Albert, "'I will return, and woe to the infamous wretch, but first of all I must get there.' He went back to the room where he had left Monte Cristo. Five minutes had sufficed to make a complete transformation in his appearance. His voice had become rough and hoarse, his face was furrowed with wrinkles, his eyes burned under the blue-veined lids, and he tottered like a drunken man. "'Count,' said he, "'I thank you for your hospitality, which I would gladly have enjoyed longer, but I must return to Paris.' "'What has happened?' "'A great misfortune, more important to me than life. Don't question me, I beg of you, but lend me a horse.' "'My stables are at your command, Viscount, but you will kill yourself by riding on horseback. Take a post-chaise or a carriage.' No, it would delay me, and I need the fatigue you warn me of. It will do me good. Albert reeled as if he had been shot, and fell on a chair near the door. Monte Cristo did not see this second manifestation of physical exhaustion. He was at the window, calling, Ali, a horse for Monsieur de Morcerf. Quick, he is in a hurry. These words restored Albert. He darted from the room, followed by the Count. Thank you, cried he, throwing himself on his horse. Return as soon as you can, Florentine. Must I use any password to procure a horse? Only dismount. Another will be immediately saddled. Albert hesitated a moment. You may think my departure strange and foolish, said the young man. You do not know how a paragraph in a newspaper may exasperate one. Read that, said he, when I am gone, that you may not be witness of my anger. While the Count picked up the paper, he put spurs to his horse, which leaped in astonishment at such an unusual stimulus, and shot away with the rapidity of an arrow. The Count watched him with a feeling of compassion, and when he had completely disappeared, read as follows. The French officer in the service of Ali Pasha of Yanina, alluded to three weeks since in the impartial, who not only surrendered the castle of Yanina, but sold his benefactor to the Turks, styled himself truly at that time Fernand, as our esteemed contemporary states but he has since added to his Christian name a title of nobility and a family name. He now calls himself the Count of Morcerf, and ranks among the peers. Thus the terrible secret, which Beauchamp has so generously destroyed, appeared again like an armed phantom, and another paper, deriving its information from some malicious source, had published two days after Albert's departure for Normandy the few lines which had rendered the unfortunate young man almost crazy. End of chapter 85
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California, March 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 86 The Trial. At eight o'clock in the morning, Albert had arrived at Beauchamp's door. The valet de chambre had received orders to usher him in at once. Beauchamp was in his bath. "'Here I am,' said Albert. "'Well, my poor friend,' replied Beauchamp, "'I expected you.' "'I need not say I think you are too faithful and too kind to have spoken of that painful circumstance. Your having sent for me is another proof of your affection. So, without losing time, tell me, have you the slightest idea whence this terrible blow proceeds?' I think I have some clue. But first, tell me all the particulars of this shameful plot. Beauchamp proceeded to relate to the young man, who was overwhelmed with shame and grief, the following facts. Two days previously, the article had appeared in another paper besides the impartial, and what was more serious, one that was well known as a government paper. Beauchamp was breakfasting when he read the paragraph. He sent immediately for a cabriolet, and hastened to the publisher's office. Although professing diametrically opposite principles from those of the editor of the other paper, Beauchamp, as it sometimes, we may say often, happens, was his intimate friend. The editor was reading, with apparent delight, a leading article in the same paper on beet sugar, probably a composition of his own. "'Ah, pardieu,' said Beauchamp, "'with the paper in your hand, my friend, I need not tell you the cause of my visit.' "'Are you interested in the sugar question?' asked the editor of the ministerial paper. "'No,' replied Beauchamp, "'I have not considered the question. A totally different subject interests me. What is it?' "'The article relative to Morcerf. "'Indeed, is it not a curious affair? "'So curious that I think you are running a great risk of a prosecution for defamation of character. "'Not at all. We have received with the information all the requisite proofs, and we are quite sure M. de Morcerf will not raise his voice against us. Besides, it is rendering a service to one's country to denounce these wretched criminals who are unworthy of the honour bestowed upon them.' Beauchamp was thunderstruck. "'Who, then, has so correctly informed you?' asked he, for my paper, which gave the first information of the subject, has been obliged to stop for want of proof.' and yet we are more interested than you in exposing Monsieur de Morcerf, as he is a peer of France, and we are of the opposition. Oh, that is very simple. We have not sought to scandalize. This news was brought to us. A man arrived yesterday from Yanina, bringing a formidable array of documents, and when we hesitated to publish the accusatory article, he told us it should be inserted in some other paper. Beauchamp understood that nothing remained but to submit and left the office to dispatch a courier to Morcerf. But he had been unable to send to Albert the following particulars, as the events had transpired after the messenger's departure. Namely, that the same day a great agitation was manifest in the House of Peers among the usually calm members of that dignified assembly. Everyone had arrived almost before the usual hour, and was conversing on the melancholy event which was to attract the attention of the public towards one of their most illustrious colleagues. Some were perusing the article, others making comments and recalling circumstances which substantiated the charges still more. The Count of Morcerf was no favourite with his colleagues. Like all upstarts, he had had recourse to a great deal of haughtiness to maintain his position. The true nobility laughed at him, the talented repelled him, and the honourable instinctively despised him. He was, in fact, in the unhappy position of the victim marked for sacrifice. The finger of God once pointed at him. Everyone was prepared to raise the hue and cry. The Count of Morcerf alone was ignorant of the news. He did not take in the paper containing the defamatory article, and he had passed the morning in writing letters and in trying a horse. He arrived at his usual hour, with a proud look and insolent demeanour. He alighted, passed through the corridors, and entered the house without observing the hesitation of the doorkeepers, or the coolness of his colleagues. Business had already been going on for half an hour when he entered. Everyone held the accusing paper, but, as usual, no one liked to take upon himself the responsibility of the attack. At length an honourable peer, Morcerf's acknowledged enemy, 
ascended the tribune with that solemnity which announced that the expected moment had arrived. There was an impressive silence. Morcerf alone knew not why such profound attention was given to an orator who was not always listened to with so much complacency. The Count did not notice the introduction, in which the speaker announced that his communication would be of that vital importance that it demanded the undivided attention of the house. But at the mention of Yanina and Colonel Fernand, he turned so frightfully pale that every member shuddered and fixed his eyes upon him. Moral wounds have this peculiarity. They may be hidden, but they never close. Always painful, always ready to bleed when touched, they remain fresh and open in the heart. The article having been read during the painful hush that followed, a universal shudder pervaded the assembly, and immediately the closest attention was given to the orator as he resumed his remarks. He stated his scruples, and the difficulty of the case. It was the honor of Monsieur de Morcerf, and that of the whole house he proposed to defend, by provoking a debate on personal questions, which are always such painful themes of discussion. He concluded by calling for an investigation, which might dispose of the calumnious report before it had time to spread, and restore Monsieur de Morcerf to the position he had long held in public opinion. Morcerf was so completely overwhelmed by this great and unexpected calamity that he could scarcely stammer a few words as he looked around on the assembly. This timidity, which might proceed from the astonishment of innocence as well as the shame of guilt, conciliated some in his favor. For men who are truly generous are always ready to compassionate when the misfortune of their enemy surpasses the limits of their hatred. The President put it to the vote and it was decided that the investigation should take place. The Count was asked what time he required to prepare his defense. Morcerf's courage had revived when he found himself alive after this horrible blow. My lords, he answered, it is not by time I could repel the attack made on me by enemies unknown to me, and doubtless hidden in obscurity. It is immediately, and by a thunderbolt, that I must repel the flash of lightning which, for a moment, startled me. Oh, that I could, instead of taking up this defense, shed my last drop of blood to prove to my noble colleagues that I am their equal in worth. These words made a favorable impression on behalf of the accused. I demand, then, that the examination shall take place as soon as possible, and I will furnish the house with all necessary information. What day do you fix? asked the President. Today I am at your service, replied the Count. The President rang the bell. Does the House approve that the examination should take place today? Yes, was the unanimous answer. A committee of twelve members was chosen to examine the proofs brought forward by Morcerf. The investigation would begin at eight o'clock that evening in the committee room, and if postponement were necessary, the proceedings would be resumed each evening at that same hour. Morcerf asked leave to retire. He had to collect the documents he had long been preparing against this storm which his sagacity had foreseen. Albert listened, trembling now with hope, then with anger, and then again with shame, for from Beauchamp's confidence he knew his father was guilty, and he asked himself how, since he was guilty, he could prove his innocence. Beauchamp hesitated to continue his narrative. What next? asked Albert. What next? What next? My friend, you impose a painful task on me. Must you know all? Absolutely, and rather from your lips than another's. Muster up all your courage, then, for never have you required it more. Albert passed his hand over his forehead, as if to try his strength, as a man who is preparing to defend his life proves his shield and bends his sword. He thought himself strong enough, for he mistook fever for energy. Go on, he said. The evening arrived. All Paris was in expectation. Many said your father had only to show himself to crush the charge against him. Many others said he would not appear, while some asserted that they had seen him start for Brussels, and others went to the police office to inquire if he had taken out a passport. I used all my influence with one of the committee, a young peer of my acquaintance, to get admission to one of the galleries. He called for me at seven o'clock, and before anyone had arrived asked one of the doorkeepers to place me in a box. I was concealed by a column, and might witness the whole of the terrible scene which was about to take place. At eight o'clock all were in their places, and Monsieur de Morcerf entered at the last stroke. 
He held some papers in his hand, his countenance was calm and his step firm, and he was dressed with great care in his military uniform, which was buttoned completely up to the chin. His presence produced a good effect. The committee was made up of liberals, several of whom came forward to shake hands with him. Albert felt his heart bursting at these particulars, but gratitude mingled with his sorrow. He would gladly have embraced those who had given his father this proof of esteem at a moment when his honor was so powerfully attacked. At this moment, one of the doorkeepers brought in a letter for the president. "'You are at liberty to speak, Monsieur de Morcerf,' said the president, as he unsealed the letter. "'And the Count began his defense, I assure you, Albert, in a most eloquent and skillful manner. He produced documents proving that the viziero Yanina had up until the last moment honored him with his entire confidence, since he had interested him with the negotiation of life and death with the Emperor. He produced the ring, his mark of authority, with which Ali Pasha generally sealed his letters, and which the latter had given him, that he might on his return at any hour of the day or night gain access to his presence, even in the harem. Unfortunately, the negotiation failed, and when he returned to defend his benefactor he was dead. But, said the Count, so great was Ali Pasha's confidence, that on his deathbed he resigned his favorite mistress and her daughter to my care. Albert started on hearing these words. The history of Heidi occurred to him, and he remembered what she had said of that message and the ring, and the manner in which she had been sold and made a slave. And what effect did this discourse produce? anxiously inquired Albert. I acknowledge it affected me, and indeed all the committee also, said Beauchamp. Meanwhile, the President carelessly opened the letter, which had been brought to him, but the first lines aroused his attention. He read them again and again, and fixing his eyes on Monsieur de Morcerf, Count, said he, you have said that the vizier of Yanina confided his wife and daughter to your care. Yes, sir, replied Morcerf, but in that, like all the rest, misfortune pursued me. On my return, Vesaliki and her daughter Heidi had disappeared. Did you know them? My intimacy with the Pasha and his unlimited confidence had gained me an introduction to them, and I had seen them above twenty times. Have you any idea what became of them? Yes, sir, I heard they had fallen victims to their sorrow, and perhaps to their poverty. I was not rich. My life was in constant danger. I could not seek them to my great regret. The President frowned imperceptibly. Gentlemen, said he, you have heard the Comte de Marcef's defense. Can you, sir, produce any witnesses to the truth of what you have asserted? Alas, no, monsieur, replied the Count. All those who surrounded the vizier, or who knew me at his court, are either dead or gone away I know not where. I believe that I alone, of all my countrymen, survived that dreadful war. I have only the letters of Ali Tepolini, which I have placed before you, the ring, a token of his good will, which is here, and lastly, the most convincing proof I can offer, after anonymous attack, and that is the absence of any witness against my veracity and the purity of my military life. A murmur of approbation ran through the assembly, and at this moment, Albert, had nothing more transpired, your father's cause had been gained. It only remained to put it to the vote when the President resumed. Gentlemen, and you, monsieur, you will not be displeased, I presume, to listen to one who calls himself a very important witness, and who has just presented himself. He is, doubtless, come to prove the perfect innocence of our colleague. Here is a letter I have just received on the subject. Shall it be read, or shall it be passed over, and shall we take no notice of this incident? Monsieur de Morcerf turned pale, and clenched his hands on the papers he held. The committee decided to hear the letter. The Count was thoughtful and silent. The President read, Mr. President, I can furnish the Committee of Inquiry into the conduct of the Lieutenant General, the Count of Morcef, in Epreus, and in Macedonia, with important particulars. The President paused, and the Count turned pale. The President looked at his auditors. Proceed was heard on all sides. The President resumed, I was on the spot at the death of Ali Pasha. I was present during his last moments. I know what has become of Vasiliki and Heidi. I am at the command of the committee, and even claim the honor of being heard. 
I shall be in the lobby when this note is delivered to you. "'And who is this witness, or rather this enemy?' asked the Count, in a tone in which there was a visible alteration. "'We shall know, sir,' replied the President. "'Is the committee willing to hear this witness?' "'Yes, yes,' they all said at once. The doorkeeper was called. "'Is there any one in the lobby?' said the President. "'Yes, sir. Who is it?' "'A woman, accompanied by a servant.' Everyone looked at his neighbor. "'Bring her in,' said the President. Five minutes after, the doorkeeper again appeared. All eyes were fixed on the door, and I, said Beauchamp, shared the general expectation and anxiety. Behind the doorkeeper walked a woman enveloped in a large veil, which completely concealed her. It was evident, from her figure and the perfumes she had about her, that she was young and fastidious in her tastes. But that was all. The President requested her to throw aside her veil, and it was then seen that she was dressed in the Grecian costume, and was remarkably beautiful. Ah, said Albert, it was she. Who? Heidi. Who told you that? Alas, I guess it. But go on, Beauchamp, you see I am calm and strong, and yet we must be drawing near the disclosure. Monsieur de Morcerf, continued Beauchamp, looked at this woman with surprise and terror. Her lips were about to pass his sentence of life or death. To the committee the adventure was so extraordinary and curious, that the interest they had felt for the Count's safety became now quite a secondary matter. The President himself advanced to place a seat for the young lady, but she declined availing herself of it. As for the Count, he had fallen on his chair. It was evident that his legs refused to support him. "'Madam,' said the President, "'you have engaged to furnish the committee with some important particulars respecting the affair at Yanina, and you have stated that you were an eye-witness of the event.' I was, indeed, said the stranger, with a tone of sweet melancholy, and the sonorous voice peculiar to the East. But allow me to say that you must have been very young then. I was four years old, but as these events deeply concerned me, not a single detail has escaped my memory. In what manner could these events concern you, and who are you that they should have made so deep an impression on you? On them depended my father's life, replied she. I am Heidi, the daughter of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vesaliki, his beloved wife. The blush of mingled pride and modesty which suddenly suffused the cheeks of the young woman, the brilliancy of her eye, and her highly important communication, produced an indescribable effect on the assembly. As for the Count, he could not have been more overwhelmed if a thunderbolt had fallen at his feet, and opened an immense gulf before him. Madam, replied the President, bowing with profound respect, allow me to ask one question. It shall be the last. Can you prove the authenticity of what you have now stated? I can, sir, said Heidi, drawing from under her veil a satin satchel highly perfumed, for here is the register of my birth, signed by my father and his principal officers, and that of my baptism, my father having consented to me being brought up in my mother's faith. This latter has been sealed by the Grand Primate of Macedonia and Epirus. And lastly, and perhaps most important, the record of the sale of my person and that of my mother to the Armenian merchant El Kobir, by the French officer, who, in his infamous bargain with the port, had reserved as his part of the booty the wife and daughter of his benefactor, whom he sold for the sum of four hundred thousand francs. A greenish pallor spread over the Count's cheeks, and his eyes became bloodshot at these terrible imputations, which were listened to by the assembly with ominous silence. Heidi, still calm, but with a calmness more dreadful than the anger of another would have been, handed to the President the record of her sale, written in Arabic. It had been supposed some of the papers might be in the Arabian, Romaic, or Turkish language, and the interpreter of the house was in attendance. One of the noble peers, who was familiar with the Arabic language, having studied it during the famous Egyptian campaign, followed with his eye as the translator read aloud, I, El Kobir, a slave merchant and purveyor of the harem of His Highness, acknowledge having received for transmission to the sublime emperor from the French lord the Count of Monte Cristo, an emerald valued at eight hundred thousand francs, as the ransom of a young Christian slave of eleven years of age, named Heidi, the acknowledged daughter of the late Lord Ali Tapolini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vasiliki, his favorite, she having been sold to me seven years previously with her mother, 
who had died on arriving at Constantinople, by a French colonel in the service of the vizier Ali Tepelini, named Fernand Mondego. The above-mentioned purchase was made on His Highness' account, whose mandate I had, for the sum of four hundred thousand francs, given at Constantinople, by authority of His Highness, in the year 1247 of the Higira, signed El Kobir, that this record should have all due authority, it shall bear the imperial seal, which the vendor is bound to have affixed to it. Near the merchant's signature there was indeed the seal of the sublime emperor. A dreadful silence followed the reading of this document. The count could only stare, and his gaze, fixed as if unconsciously on Heidi, seemed one of fire and blood. Madam, said the president, may reference be made to the Count of Monte Cristo, who is now, I believe, in Paris? Sir, replied Heidi, the Count of Monte Cristo, my foster father, has been in Normandy the last three days. Who, then, has counseled you to take this step, one for which the court is deeply indebted to you, and which is perfectly natural, considering your birth and your misfortunes? Sir, replied Haiti, I have been led to take this step from a feeling of respect and grief. Although a Christian, may God forgive me, I have always sought to revenge my illustrious father. Since I set my foot in France, and knew the traitor lived in Paris, I have watched carefully. I live retired in the house of my noble protector, but I do it from choice. I love retirement and silence, because I can live with my thoughts and recollections of past days. But the Count of Monte Cristo surrounds me with every paternal care, and I am ignorant of nothing which passes in the world. I learn all in the silence of my apartments. For instance, I see all the newspapers, every periodical, as well as every new piece of music, and by thus watching the course of the life of others, I learned what had transpired this morning in the House of Peers, and what was to take place this evening. Then I wrote. Then, remarked the President, the Count of Monte Cristo knows nothing of your present proceedings. He is quite unaware of them, and I have but one fear, which is that he should disapprove of what I have done. But it is a glorious day for me, continued the young girl, raising her ardent gaze to heaven, that on which I find at last an opportunity of avenging my father. The Count had not uttered one word the whole of this time. His colleagues looked at him, and doubtless pitied his prospects, blighted under the perfumed breath of a woman. His misery was depicted in sinister lines on his countenance. Monsieur de Morcerf, said the President, do you recognize this lady as the daughter of Ali Tepelini, Pasha of Yanina? No, said Morcerf, attempting to rise. It is a base plot contrived by my enemies. Heidi, whose eyes had been fixed on the door, as if expecting someone, turned hastily, and seeing the Count standing, shrieked, "'You do not know me?' said she. "'Well, fortunately, I recognize you. You are Fernand Mondego, the French officer who led the troops of my noble father. It is you who surrendered the castle of Yanina. It is you who, sent by him to Constantinople to treat with the Emperor for the life or death of your benefactor, brought back a false mandate granting full pardon.' It is you who, with that mandate, obtained the Pasha's ring, which gave you authority over Selim, the firekeeper. It is you who stabbed Selim. It is you who sold us, my mother and me, to the merchant, El Kobir. Assassin, 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 you have still on your brow your master's blood. Look, gentlemen all. These words had been pronounced with such enthusiasm and evident truth that every eye was fixed on the Count's forehead, and he himself passed his hand across it as if he felt Ali's blood still lingering there. "'You positively recognize Monsieur de Morcerf as the officer, Fernand Mondego?' "'Indeed I do!' cried Haiti. "'Oh, my mother, it was you who said you were free. You had a beloved father. You were destined to be almost a queen. Look well at that man. It is he who raised your father's head on the point of a spear. It is he who sold us. It is he who forsook us. Look well at his right hand, on which he has a large wound.' If you forget his features, you would know him by that hand, into which fell one by one the gold pieces of the merchant El Kobir. I know him. Ah, let him say now if he does not recognize me. Each word fell like a dagger on Marcerf, and deprived him of a portion of his energy. As she uttered the last, he hid his mutilated hand hastily in his bosom, and fell back on his seat overwhelmed by wretchedness and despair. 
This scene completely changed the opinion of the assembly respecting the accused Count. Count of Morcerf, said the President, do not allow yourself to be cast down. Answer. The justice of the court is supreme and impartial as that of God. It will not suffer you to be trampled on by your enemies without giving you an opportunity of defending yourself. Shall further inquiries be made? Shall two members of the house be sent to Yanina? Speak. Morcerf did not reply. Then all of the members looked at each other with terror. They knew the Count's energetic and violent temper. It must be, indeed, a dreadful blow which would deprive him of courage to defend himself. They expected that his stupefied silence would be followed by a fiery outburst. Well, asked the President, what is your decision? I have no reply to make, said the Count in a low tone. Has the daughter of Elie Tepelini spoken the truth, said the President? Is she then the terrible witness to whose charge you dare not plead not guilty? Have you really committed the crimes of which you were accused? The Count looked around him with an expression which might have softened tigers, but which could not disarm his judges. Then he raised his eyes toward the ceiling, but withdrew them immediately, as if he feared the roof would open and reveal to his distressed view that second tribunal called Heaven, and that other judge named God. Then, with a hasty movement, he tore open his coat, which seemed to stifle him, and flew from the room like a madman. His footstep was heard one moment in the corridor then the rattling of his carriage wheels as he was driven rapidly away. Gentlemen, said the President, when silence was restored, is the Count of Morcerf convicted of felony, treason, and conduct unbecoming a member of this house? Yes, replied all the members of the Committee of Inquiry, with a unanimous voice. Heidi had remained until the close of the meeting. She heard the Count's sentence pronounced, without betraying an expression of joy or pity, then drawing her veil over her face, she bowed majestically to the councillors, and left with that dignified step which Virgil attributes to his goddesses. End of chapter 86